A Legitimate Date Written by Rose Fresquez Narrated by Rachel Berkwin A Legitimate Date A Friends to Lovers Contemporary Sweet Romance The Billionaire's Reunion Volume 1 Chapter 1 The mid-morning sun was climbing overhead, blanketing everything outside, when Logan Stone pressed the buzzer to the old brick building. The plastic lemonade cup cooled his fingers, condensation dampening his palm. He moved the lemonade to his left hand, his gaze roaming the facility and the cars in the lot, probably volunteer cars, not counting the black Escalade where his driver was waiting or those in the staff lot alongside the building, including his friend's familiar orange Fiat. Children's happy squeals rang from beyond the teacher's lot, and the elementary kids throwing balls across the field as they chased each other warmed his heart. Despite last month's spring showers leaving most areas in San Francisco lush, dust stirred in the school's field over patchy golden grass. Green grass was the least of the school's priorities. Being in a poorer neighborhood with minimal funding, Finley Elementary had a long list of needs on their tight budget. Although not a teacher, Logan knew the school through his friend, Serafina Bianchi, the kindergarten teacher. Serafina was why he had his driver run every yellow light to get to the dingy lemonade stand on his way to the school. He could have used this hour to check and respond to the endless texts and calls vibrating, his phone in his coat pocket. But he needed to see Sarah before his next engagement. The front door pulsated, followed by a hoarse, feminine voice. Come in, Mr. Stone! He opened the heavy metal door. He'd had cameras installed to tighten security after a kid from the school was kidnapped by her stepdad last year. As he approached the wooden front desk, the smell of sharpened pencils, disinfectant, food, and old building greeted him all at once. The middle-aged woman behind the counter beamed and patted her gray-streaked golden hair. So good to see you, Mr. Stone. Hi there, Patty, he nodded. Patty, although in her late fifties, had the energy of a twenty-year-old. She stood, then pointed to the bouquet of yellow roses that wafted a soft fragrance. I've been getting lots of compliments about my flowers. Thank you. Don't mention it. He dipped his head, He'd never learn how to handle praise. Worthless, failure, loser. His uncle's words still echoed whenever someone expressed gratitude. At times, Logan remained caught between doing the right thing for all the right reasons, like his adoptive parents taught him, and doing the right thing because he wanted to prove his uncle wrong. His body jerked at the unwelcome memories he continued to fight to erase from his mind. Patty turned to one of the metal file cabinets behind her desk and retrieved a card she handed over. From all of us, the staff, thank you for the gourmet dinners this week. She rambled on about yesterday's lunch being her favorite. Chinese for a school lunch is mighty fine. He didn't know what Emma, his assistant, ordered, but he liked to mess with Patty during the few times they'd interacted. So he pulled a long face. You'll be disappointed with tomorrow's lunch. As long as it's not a salad, I can take it. He tilted his head to the side. Who said it's not a salad? Mr. Stone, she crossed her arms over her floral button-down blouse, shaking her head. You wouldn't do that to a teacher on a Friday, would you now? He chuckled. He'd asked his assistant to order from the best restaurants in the area and have different meals delivered to the teachers each day for Teacher Appreciation Week. Teachers were run ragged, handling kids with behavior issues, special needs, and trauma from their broken homes. He'd once been one of those kids who gave teachers a run for their paycheck. I'm sure there will be compensation if you eat salad tomorrow. He folded the card and stuffed it in his jacket pocket, then patted the edge where it stuck up. Patty rubbed her hands together. If I put up with a salad tomorrow, does that mean you owe me chocolates next week? You're in the wrong job for bargaining. He lifted the plastic cup and the ice jingled. I gotta get this to Sarah before the ice melts. Patty waved him off. She should be in the cafeteria. He knew Serafina's school schedule and where to find her any time of the day. 11.20 was when she walked her students to the cafeteria. She'd then leave teachers' aides and parent volunteers to man lunch duty while she returned to her desk to eat and grade papers. He strolled to the right hallway, waving to the teachers he passed. He'd been here enough to know many teachers by name, and those he didn't know still looked familiar. Those who knew him thanked him for the teacher appreciation lunches. He followed the noise to the room on the building's east side and stepped through the cafeteria's open double doors. With the bright fluorescent lights almost blinding him, he winced as he scanned kids with dark brown and blonde hair, 
a variety of skin tones, a cacophony of voices. Aha! There were some familiar faces. Serafina's students occupied a table toward the front. Kids' voices hummed like bees. Things clattered as they hit the laminate floor, and wrappers and food flew up in the air. Total chaos blended into something cheerfully overwhelming. Two teachers kept their mouths and shouted to silence the kids. Good thing the entire school didn't eat lunch at the same time. If he were in charge, he wouldn't survive for five minutes. He was used to dealing with adults, employees, investors, and interactions through his billion-dollar financial company. Four years ago, his big brother Eric, who started Stone Enterprises, stepped down and shocked Logan by asking him to take over the company. Prior to becoming CEO, Logan had been the CFO while managing his own international clothing and textile company. He was also an investor in travel and tourism in countries with a high tourism industry. His presence abroad helped him expand the financial company outside America. The noise drew him back. Where was Serafina? He frowned, surveying the table and the kids in line waiting for their lunches. Mr. Stone! shouted a toothless six-year-old he'd seen in Serafina's class. Logan waved at him, and several heads bobbed, churning and shouting, Mr. Stone is here! His heart melted at the kids' excitement. He waved, fighting the urge to cross the laminate floor and high-five the kids one by one. He'd learned from his past mistakes that doing so would only make the teachers' jobs harder as they fought to make the kids focus. Jalela, a dark-skinned kindergarten TA, smiled from behind the line. She then mouthed, She's in the classroom! Or at least he assumed that's what she meant when she pointed over his head. He waved to say his thanks before turning and taking the long hallway. Kids' artwork and educational posters brightened up the walls. To the immediate right was the kindergarten class. The door was open. With her back to the door, Serafina crouched on a small desk in the center of many empty desks, her gaze intent on a boy with droopy shoulders at the desk across from her. She'd caught her naturally wavy dark brown hair into a messy ponytail that dangled and bounced against her yellow with white polka dots dress. Careful not to distract them, Logan ducked under the dangling artwork strung above and across the room as he walked to her desk. Graded papers with scribbled handwriting and pencil were stacked in three separate piles. In the space between the papers and the closed laptop, he put the lemonade. Freshly squeezed strawberry lemonade from the questionable lemonade stand was her favorite beverage. Oddly, he had tasted it before and had to admit it was second only to the lemonade she made. She always knew where authentic and flavorful food was, often finding and dragging him to the unusual food joints where she preferred to eat. She was right most of the time, but he struggled to eat in the unusual restaurants since one owner snatched his photo and used it to get visibility for his cafe. Now and then, he still yielded and ate wherever his friend wanted. After all, she moved to San Francisco on his account. Most days he suspected Sarah would do anything for him, but sometimes she lost it and made him wonder if he was capable of getting their friendship back to normal. Today was one of those days. He needed to clarify she wasn't mad at him over a gift he thought was the perfect present for her 32nd birthday. A birthday she didn't care to remember, but this Saturday wasn't just her birthday. It was also the day she stumbled into his life. Steam rose from the diffuser on the other end of her desk, the aromatic vapor carrying refreshing scents. Essential oils she believed relaxed kids and set a good mood for the classroom that stimulated their learning. Utilizing the minutes he had, he pulled the card from his pocket and snatched it out of the envelope. Unfolding a thank you card with all the teacher's signatures, he'd have to pass it on to his assistant, since she did all the work. Still a smile lifted his cheeks. Below her signature, Serafina had drawn an arrow pointing to the sticker of a monkey and added the words, Getting you one of these soon. How typical of Sarah. Let's go say hello to Mr. Stone. At her voice, he tore his gaze away from the card and set it on the table. She moved with liquid grace, bringing the boy beside her. Little Eason had tear streaks on his tan face. Logan walked toward them and crouched to the boy's level when he was within reach. How are you doing today, Eason? He put out his hand for a high five. Eason's mild autism could explain why he preferred wearing turtlenecks, even on 80-degree days. The boy barely tapped his palm. When he tipped his little face, a black circle around his eye had Logan's mind spinning in all the wrong places. What happened? Eason is going to join his friends for lunch. Serafina cut him off, obviously not wanting to delve into the subject. Hmm. When Logan stood to look at her for cues, she winked. I'll take him to the cafeteria and be right back. 
He nodded, putting the matter to rest for the time being. She had good reasons to keep certain matters of her job confidential, but his upbringing in his first ten years made him jump to conclusions whenever he saw a bruise on a child. She returned with her genuine smile in place, and her flawless porcelain skin held a familiar vibrancy that always warmed him. She looked different. Hmm, was it the lipstick? Deciding not to stare at her face too long, he let his gaze roam to the white sash emphasizing her slender waist and the curves that swayed beneath the fluttery dress she'd probably made. Her retro fashions were not the usual styles he saw with his dates, but she was different in so many more ways than just fashion. What time did you land? Phew. She didn't appear upset like she'd sounded in her nasty text message three days ago. With her open arms, he closed the gap between them, and she curled her arms around his neck, hugging him. Her cheeks pressed warm against him as he held her, and her soft fragrance of rose petals warmed his senses, the scent comforting and familiar. Two hours ago, he kissed the top of her head and stepped out of their embrace. He then sat on one of the desks in the front row closer to her desk. The moment the company jet deposited him at the airport, Serafina was the one person on his mind. I take it you're not mad at me after all? She'd better not be. With a mere two months left before their annual family reunion, he'd need help since he was in charge of planning this year, a task he intended to delegate to her. She tilted her chin to the side. Her yellow enamel hoop earrings danced against her cheeks when she shook her head. Just because I'm almost falling for the puppy doesn't get you off the hook. She brushed something from his coat collar and slapped his chest, then touched one of his shirt buttons. We need to sew this button on better, before it falls off. He raised a hand to stop her as she walked toward her table. Leave it to Serafina to carry a sewing kit in her purse. She'd probably end up pricking his chest while trying to fix the button with him still wearing the shirt. If one button falls off, it's not a big deal. He shrugged and steered their conversation back to the adorable beagle he'd been tempted to keep for himself. What do you think? I'm not sure I have the energy to chase a puppy around, but he's precious. Her tenderness as she talked about the cuddly beagle made his chest swell and he sat taller. You're welcome, and I forgive you for that unorthodox text. She crossed her desk and reached for her sunrise-colored lemonade, pink at the bottom and sun-kissed tan at the top. My apologies for the text. She hoisted her lemonade cup. I'll consider this a peace offering. That was a bribe for what he was about to ask her. Okay, so he'd get her the lemonade even if he didn't need anything from her. But today was probably not the best day to ask for any favors. For now, he was glad that she wasn't upset. The entire world could be mad at him, and he wouldn't care, as long as he was at peace with Sarah. Just say I'm good at giving gifts. Don't get ahead of yourself, Logan Stone. She stacked the papers with one hand, then shoved them to the side. I had to hire a pet sitter last night, and that imp chewed my favorite sandals. He cocked a brow. The puppy or the sitter? Having taken a sip of her drink, she nearly spit it out as she goffed. The puppy, you goof! I'll pay for the sitter. He hadn't thought that far ahead yet. That's okay. Now if you said you'd replace my sandals, I might have listened. Her honey brown eyes held a fondness as she rolled them the way she usually did to ward him off on any financial assistance he offered. The only good thing is that I haven't had time to think about Chula. Chula, her retriever poodle, passed away last month. She talked about Chula whenever they spoke or saw each other, almost daily when he was in town. Getting a new pet wouldn't erase Chula's memories. Logan missed the dog as much as she did, but having a puppy should keep them both distracted from Chula's absence. Many dogs and puppies need good homes, after all. I'm glad your puppy is keeping you busy, then. He crossed his ankles, his feet resting on the cement floor. What did you name him? She shoved the straw through the lid and further in her drink, ice clanking as she stirred. This is not going to be all me. We have to name him together. Fair enough. Now, that you're not crucifying me for giving you a puppy, how did we do on Tuesday? She sipped her lemonade, closing her eyes when she swallowed, clearly enjoying the refreshment before she sat it down next to her. You know, dodgeball. Her eyes lit up as she gave him a play-by-play -play analysis of the meat. She hurled her hand, emphasizing how she eliminated one of the best players on the opposing team. Great job! He lifted his hand, and she high-fived him. Then he fist-bumped, pleased she'd learned the game's critical strategies. We almost had it! He blinked. Wait, almost? Didn't you win? Nah, turns out your replacement hadn't played dodgeball since his teen years. His shoulders stiffened. 
You gotta be kidding me. Didn't Emma know what these leagues meant to him and Serafina? He'd left for Italy on short notice and had no time to recruit a replacement. He shouldn't have trusted his assistant for such a task. A frown squeezed his forehead. His absence cost their team the semifinals. He was one of the two most dedicated players on the team. I take it there was no celebration dinner? Serafina winced. Unfortunately. She then held up a finger. On the bright side, we made it to the semifinals by default. Turns out a player on another team punched an opponent. So they're out and we're in as their replacement. We're still in the game. Although he felt bad for the man who'd been punched, he breathed in relief. We have another chance to play and finish the season strong. We have next week to revive our dignity. She rested her hands on her lap. But we also have to kick up practice. He scratched his beard, staring at the ABC and colorful nature posters. How many free evenings could he schedule for their practice this upcoming week? He'd have to check with Emma in case he had unexpected plans in his schedule. That aside, Serafina took a sip before setting the almost empty cup on the table. I want to hear everything about Italy. He'd spent the entire time in meetings with team leaders and finalizing the takeover in Rome, with a company that had approached them to buy them out. That and buying a house in Tuscany. Same as last time? Her trimmed eyebrows arched as she pinned him with brown eyes that held hues of his comforting childhood memories. Seriously? With her Italian roots from her dad, she'd renewed her interest in Italy after his death last year. Like I said, we're establishing another office in Rome. Making it two, excluding their bank locations throughout Europe. Early next year, our Milan and Turin offices will be operating. You should come with me next time. Her face scrunched up. I'll stick to the virtual tour for now. Her regrets over not connecting with her dad before he died could explain both her love and hesitation for Italy. Logan stretched out his legs. How'd your date go? She never texted him to let him know, like she did after her disastrous dates lately. She shrugged, then fumbled with her fingernails, scratching off the black polish on her pinky, a nervous habit. He didn't meet anything on my criteria. No? You were right. Serafina rarely conceded such a statement so he cupped a hand to his ear and blinked with feigned innocence. What did you say? She lifted her chin to meet his gaze and gave a gentle roll of her eyes. He left before we even ordered. No man in their right mind would walk away from her and not want a second or third date, unless she scared her recent date with unrealistic expectations. For one, she was still looking for a man like her ex. Logan stared her straight in the eye, knowing she'd done what he'd warned her against. Don't tell me you gave him the questionnaire you used on your last two dates. She gritted her teeth, picked up her cup, then sucked up the remaining liquid. The ice cubes had melted, but she sipped the drink, emptying the cup before giving him sad puppy-like eyes. Do I look like a mom to you? Huh? This could go south fast. Scratching his beard, he flicked his gaze down to his dress shoes, buying time to get the right answer. When he looked at her, he noticed her lips. They looked fuller than usual. Is this why you started using lipstick? She grunted. You don't hear me complaining about your... She made air quotes with her fingers. Beard? What's wrong with my beard? Now self-conscious, he patted his cheeks and his impeccably groomed beard prickled his flesh. Never mind. She brushed him off with a wave. I have another date tomorrow. I really need this one to work. Whoa. He put his hand up. The dating app she joined a month ago wasn't how he would advise her to go about a rebound. He started and lost a big argument when she'd presented the idea. Still, he hadn't expected her to take things so seriously. We're celebrating Roberto's promotion tomorrow. We still can after my date, she shrugged. Invite Danica to come in my place. Of course, Serafina had no idea how Danica despised their friends. He'd invited her once when they'd gone bowling to celebrate one of their friends having a baby. Their celebratory dances and her concluding they were immature and didn't suit Logan's status. Her narrowed eyes and targeted words still stung. Don't you have enough rich friends? While he had a close circle of friends, he also had an inner circle, and an intimate circle he shared his deepest secrets with, if he needed to. After her comments, he decided to start separating his dating life from his time with his friends. He worked hard and played hard to relieve his stress. What was wrong with being a kid at heart? I'm meeting her for lunch today. 
an unexpected engagement he'd agreed to last night when she'd called him. I doubt she'll want to come to our get-together. But seriously, why'd you book a date for a night our group had plans? Serafina squeezed her brows together. I'm almost 33. My internal clock is ticking, and I don't even have a boyfriend. Her sad expression tightened his chest. She'd be engaged or married by now if that jerk hadn't wasted her time for two years. He and Serafina had been each other's plus ones whenever they weren't seeing anyone. But even when they had significant others, they played dodgeball in the spring and volleyball in the summer. Technically, he spent most of his free time with her, and it didn't sit well when she beat herself up over minor things. A year older than she was, he tried to use that as consolation. I'm not married either. And he was far from it. She smirked, bracing her hands on the table as she swung her feet. Have you proposed to Danica and she turned you down? What was with her accusatory tone? He shifted. We've been together for less than a year. And they only saw each other once or twice a month, which was probably why they dated that long. Serafina's lifted brows indicated she wasn't content with his response. So he wagged a finger at her. Marriage is not something you take lightly. Besides, he wasn't in a position to set himself up for failure. Your date sounds more interesting. And what was up with her sudden interest in makeup? It better not have anything to do with pleasing her dates. While well, doing your dating apps thing, if someone wants you to change anything about you, walk away. She put her hands together, lifting them as if praying. I hope I don't scare this one off. Lose the list. That was the starting point. She lacked confidence lately, yet she was smart, caring, and beautiful. Just be yourself. He's going to love you. She leaned toward him, poking him in the center of his chest. Clutching his wound dramatically, he groaned. What's that for? It's easy for you to talk about confidence when all the women throw themselves at you. He shrugged. Good thing she didn't know about his fear of commitment. Text me the man's name and I'll have my security advisor run him through the system. She nodded. It wasn't a negotiable matter since she'd gone out with a man who got arrested during their date. Logan stood and jerked his chin toward the door. Let's get you to the teacher's lounge. He tugged aside his jacket sleeve to view his Rolex. Noon already. Although her students went to recess after lunch, in 15 minutes they'd be filing in and she'd have to drop everything to tend to them. I've missed my peanut butter and jelly this week. He had never met an adult who loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches like she did. I'm sure your stomach is rejoicing. Your fancy meals have been the talk among the staff. She stood and tossed the empty cup in the trash can under her desk. Thanks for the lemonade. What? He raised his brows. No thanks for the fancy lunches? Not when they mean I don't get to eat what I like. She bent to snatch her purse from under the table, dug out something and handed it to him. Your lips are dry. You just can't help yourself, can you? She was the only person besides his mom who would be brutally honest with him. So he took the lip balm, swiped his mouth, then handed it back to her. I now smell like flowers. She beamed as she stuffed the lip balm in her bag. The lip balm was another one of her homemade products. While some people could take offense to her overly caring nature, he didn't mind it. Her selflessness reminded him of mom. His mom, Regina, had adopted him and nine other kids, uniting them into a family. The biological child, a bonus to their family, flipped them from an even 10 to 11. He'd better call her later. He'd missed her call during his flight. As they walked out of the classroom, he told Serafina to keep Saturday evening open. We have a teacher's appreciation to celebrate. Her birthday landed on Teacher Appreciation Week, so he told her friends that's why they were celebrating. He usually gave her birthday gifts days before or after her birthday, disguising them as teacher appreciation present. She nudged him with her elbow. We'll brainstorm dog names then. When he nodded, she walked him outside. She closed the door, stopped, and eyed her smartwatch. A frown creased her forehead. Weren't you supposed to meet Danica for lunch? Yep, looks like I'm going to be late. Time always flew when he was with Serafina. He could have waited until their Friday morning workouts at his house. But with her message, he'd worried she wouldn't keep her engagement tomorrow. Guess I should have said I'd meet her for dinner, not lunch. You better scram. See you in the morning. She lifted her hand to wait. Counting on it, he leaned in, kissed her soft cheek, and then started toward his Escalade. A few steps onto the parking lot, he churned, walking backward as he spoke. Don't forget to text me that guy's info. Don't give me that look. When he kept her in a serious stare, 
as if she wasn't taking her safety seriously. She squished her face, the corners of her eyes crinkling, as she waved him off. You better get going. Desolation stirred in his heart, the way he always felt whenever he parted from her. With a final wave, he made it back to the car, and his driver stepped out to open the passenger door for him. Two years ago, Kosal immigrated from Cambodia and started working for Logan. One year ago, Logan had given up reminding his driver that he was perfectly capable of opening the door for himself. When Logan walked into the swanky six-floor restaurant, he found Danica typing on her laptop. The pastels, plants, and flowery wallpaper between the big windows were unusual for a restaurant, giving the place a pleasant atmosphere. Danica, an American foreign correspondent, traveled to different countries every month, which worked out for them occasionally. However, the time she dropped into San Francisco on such short notice conflicted with his plans. They'd met in Hong Kong when she was interviewing him about Stone Enterprises' expansion plans for their China locations. After an entire week of interviews, they'd bonded over dinner, light humor, and a first date. Sorry I'm late. He walked to her side and leaned in to brush his lips on her cheek before claiming the ladder back chair across from her. Hey! She smiled, closing her laptop and setting it aside. Her strawberry blonde hair, always fashionably styled, draped over her black sheath dress. You look handsome. You always look stunning. Got to, she rolled her eyes. Snazzy duds are a job requirement when you're standing in front of the camera. He reached for her hand, clasping her soft fingers, and her affectionate gaze made his chest tighten. She was more serious about their relationship than he was ready to be. The server showed up with water, ice dancing in the glass goblet when she set one in front of Logan, then another glass in front of Danica. She asked if they were ready to order, but they needed some time to look at the menu. I'll have a Cabernet, please, Danica asked before the server left, then refocused on him. Smooth flight, I assume? What time did your plane land? A little over two hours ago. Golden brows arched over her blue eyes. Yet you were late for our lunch? By ten minutes. His fault. I stopped to see Sarah. I didn't plan to take so long but I had to wait while she tended to one of her students. Which, of course, didn't explain why he'd gone past his office and the restaurant to the elementary school out of his way instead of rushing to his date. She was mad at me when I left, and I wanted to fix things. Honesty was key to a healthy relationship. I'm also hoping she can help me plan our family reunion. Oh. Stiffening, Danica pulled her hands from his, then opened the leather booklet menu. Let's order something. I'm starving. She was clearly upset. Ugh. He hadn't told her about his family reunion. Oops. Still, it wasn't up for discussion. They were far from meeting the parents' phase. Serafina was family and had been to previous reunions. She knew what to expect, and the family knew to expect her. Bringing Danica would have his family pestering him to pop the big question. No thank you. The server returned with Danica's wine. The purple-red liquid danced in the glass when she took a sip. As soon as the server left, Logan shifted things. Time to indulge in small talk. A comfort zone. How was your trip? I leave for Japan at the end of next week, in less than ten days. Her posture relaxed and her gaze flicked from the menu to him. I have most of next week off. She started naming all the things they could do during her time off, and his mind wandered to his plans. He was striving to be a good CEO, but still fit in some fun along the way. Dodgeball semifinals, extra practice, and work. He touched her hand. I have a busy week ahead. Danica's eyes softened as she turned her hand beneath his. Why did her grip feel clingy? At least you have Saturday off. I could get us tickets to the opera. Her sister was an actress and had most of her performances at the opera house. The last two plays Danica took him to taught him one thing. It wasn't a place he preferred to frequent. Once or twice a year was enough. He'd go for her sake, though, but not this Saturday. If he canceled the escape room reservations, it may be another three months before they had an opening. Plus, he'd already asked Serafina to keep Saturday open. He freed himself from Danica's grip and folded his hands on the table. I'm taking Sarah to a teacher appreciation thing. I made plans before I knew you'd be in town all weekend. But even if he'd known, hanging out with his girlfriend several days in a row could start ruining their relationship. Escape rooms wouldn't be her thing, but if she wanted to spend time together, of course, you can come too. Her shoulders sagged. You want me to come as the third wheel? 
He felt warm in the dress coat. The accusatory tone rang just like Serafina's had earlier. What was with the women in his life? There will be other people. His friends she despised. Third wheel, where did that come from anyway? Could that be why Danica had been clingy lately? Hmm, come to think of it, last month she'd taken an entire week off and wanted to spend every evening with him. He'd even skipped dodgeball practice that week so he could take a vineyard tour. Out of place as a non-drinker, he ruined her time. Memories of his uncle's drinking had forever soured Logan on alcohol. However, he needed to accommodate Danica the best he could. Perhaps he could cancel Roberto's party tomorrow. We could do something tomorrow evening. Since Danica was rarely in town, she'd never built a connection with a local church community and preferred online services. Her reason made sense, Sundays being the only day she didn't go rushing out of her house. But he preferred interacting with people who were thrilled about God. In-person services and the personal connections always rejuvenated him, the other worshippers' enthusiasm inspiring his own. Or we could do something on Sunday after church. This would be a good week to come and check out my church. The same church you and Serafina go to? Danica mumbled under her breath as she refocused on the menu. It's always about Serafina. And they were back to this ridiculous discussion again. He eased out of his coat and tossed it on the back of his chair. Danica? He slid the menu from her hand and closed it, setting it aside. Then he edged her wine further to his left and softened his voice. It's not always about Serafina. Her brow shot up. Keeping his voice gentle, he continued. We had this conversation on our first date. Right off, I wanted to address the important things in my life. God, family, and friends. Danica let out an exhale. You couldn't meet with me four weeks ago because of a kids' concert. Good grief. He wanted to make this work. He wanted to fall madly in love with her and perhaps get to that point where he could proclaim his love for her the way she'd done for him twice. But like all girls he dated in the past, it came down to Serafina. I didn't know you'd be in town. I'd made a promise to the kids. Most of them didn't have an adult rooting for them, as they sang their hearts out. And he'd extended the invitation to her. But Danica didn't want to go to a kindergarten concert. I couldn't let the kids down. But you could let me down? She gave him a knowing look. You canceled the Giants opening the next week. Something to do with her. Her dog died. Chula had been his dog, too. You said it was okay if I stayed with her. She drew out a breath. What was I supposed to say? All right, I'll cancel dodgeball practice. He hadn't sent out an email to the team leader regarding extra practice days. We can do something next week, any evening. She narrowed her gaze. My point is that I feel like a third wheel in this relationship. Ugh. What was a guy supposed to say to that? He ground his teeth as his neck heated. His gaze flitted over the half-empty restaurant. This was one of the reasons he dreaded dating. His last relationship had ended after she'd given him an ultimatum. Serafina or her? He'd easily put an end to that relationship. Serafina and Logan went way back to when he was eight and she was almost seven. They'd been neighbors in Denver, both raised by negligent guardians. Her parents had acted like she didn't exist while his uncle drank himself to anger. Logan knew enough to flee to the nearest storm drain whenever his uncle was out of it. Oddly, the cement too became a special refuge for him and Serafina, until they'd both returned to their questionable homes. Sarah was his first friend before he was adopted, and no one was going to limit or question the time they spent together. Well? Danica seemed to be waiting for him to, what, give up a part of himself? He couldn't, and he'd warn her. Serafina and I... Danica already knew this, but she must need a reminder. She's my friend, and if you can't accept her, you're choosing her over me? The unexpected sharpness in her tone might have caught her by surprise, too. She blinked and fell silent. He was getting tired of repeating the same reasons each time Serafina's name came up in their conversation. I don't know what to say. Danica touched one of her diamond stud earrings. It's simple. There goes that again. He leaned back and rubbed his forehead. We've been going out for seven months. Ten! She snapped. He knew that, didn't he? Of course, he remembered their anniversary. Danica was a good person, smart and attractive, but he wasn't being fair to her or himself. While they hadn't invested much into their relationship, now might be a good time to walk away from this deal. 
I like you. Her mouth parted, her eyes widening, as if she was waiting for those special words, words that terrified him. You're beautiful, and... He gave her all the reasons she was an amazing girlfriend who deserved someone special, and he wasn't that man. I don't want to hold you back. Her hands flew to her flushed cheeks. Are you breaking up with me? It was for the best. It's not you at all. The lines were becoming too familiar. He used them in previous breakups. The last words emerged in a whisper, since he wasn't sure they were legitimate anymore. It's me. She fanned herself with her fingers. His heart ached for what he was doing, but wasting her time wouldn't help her in the end. He scooted closer and covered her other hand still on the table. I'm sorry. At least she wasn't crying. The server chose that moment to show up and take their orders. I'm not hungry. She pressed her lips together and took her computer, stuffing it in her bag. He had lost his appetite, but after sitting in the restaurant, he needed to order something to be fair to their server. I'll take any salad. He hadn't looked at the menu, but the big sign at the entrance advertised only farm fresh vegetables. As soon as the server left, Danica stood, reached for her wine, and downed it in one gulp before setting the glass down, flinging her purse on her shoulder and carrying her computer bag. Have a good life, Logan. He gave her a nod, his heart squeezing so tight, he imagined a fist wringing all the blood from it. His nerves tightened and his mind spun. What just happened? Relationships weren't for him. Yeah, as if that made everything better. He'd said it before, but for some reason, he always thought he could do it. Things always started out well. Then some switch went off in his brain, and he couldn't do it. It was worse when his dates threatened his friendship with Serafina. Not that Sarah was to blame for his terrible love life. He was mature enough to admit he'd use any childish excuse to end a relationship. Truth be told, he wasn't capable of getting to that level of commitment. His parents had the perfect marriage, but his first home, with an uncle who switched girlfriends like outfits, was still an unresolved puzzle. How was he going to get to the point in his life where he could be the right man and husband he sometimes dreamed of being? At least he wasn't going to be in a pressing relationship anymore. He could focus on being a better CEO and planning the reunion. That meant talking to Serafina. She'd agree to help, of course, unless her hunt for a spouse kept her busy. He didn't need that kind of busy in his life. He'd stay away from any woman who befriended and flirted with him. As long as he had his family, Serafina, and his buddies, pursuing a girlfriend was a no deal. No deal. Chapter 2 Sitting across from her date in a salad restaurant, Serafina Bianchi gnawed on her lower lip and willed it to stay in place so she could remain a silent listener to Oscar. She clasped her hands and fought the urge to unclasp them and reach out to wipe the white salad dressing residue from the corner of his mouth. She redirected her gaze to her plate still full of untouched leafy greens sprinkled with diced chicken. The salad was a wise dinner choice, but she didn't feel like salad tonight. She'd consented to Oscar's preference as opposed to the all-day breakfast king she'd suggested. This club only does health and wellness. The fork almost slid out of his hand as his gestures punctuated his enthusiastic speech about the health and wellness coach who helped him stay in shape. Who could blame him for being passionate about exercise? The muscular man had confessed to having a heart attack in his mid-twenties, so healthy living was an important aspect of his life. His dedication proved the man could be trusted to make commitments and stick with them, and it seemed to pay off in his physique. Fit, of average height, with green eyes, he had some of the things on her checklist. Plus, he appeared to be a gentleman in his dress shirt and pants. Shivering a bit in her polka dot halter top dress, she scanned the crowded restaurant with floor to ceiling windows, admitting a soothing natural glow. He forked some of his salad and lifted it to his mouth, chewed, then continued his physical fitness conversation, as if they were in a seminar and had broken into a discussion group. Oscar was good looking, but so was Logan, who would never occupy their conversations with fitness. I did this training class for 30 days. The white residue was going to curdle on Oscar's mouth. Couldn't he feel the remnants of food there? She grabbed his cloth napkin from across the table and handed it to him as she pointed to his mouth. You have something. Thanks. He snatched the napkin and wiped his mouth. Anyway, I had a blast. The good news is they're doing it again this summer. Maybe we could do it together. His eyes lit up. It would be a perfect bonding opportunity for a couple. Serafina stared at her salad again, anxious about the date. 
She'd skipped lunch and settled for the leftover muffin she'd snatched from Logan's penthouse after their morning workout. She dedicated Friday mornings to exercising with him and never found it a hardship, since he had a spectacular gym and array of breakfast prepared by his chef afterward. Her eyes met Oscar's. He seemed to be waiting for her response. Assuming it had to do with exercises, she gave a general response. Training is always nice. Did she want to spend her summer in a fitness camp? She had no intention of being a bodybuilder. She and Logan got enough workouts playing beach volleyball, her favorite sport, and his, dodgeball. But Oscar saw her and their relationship as having the potential to last through the summer. So she sat taller, proud to have almost made it through the date without touching her questionnaire. But this date was about finding a future husband, someone better or as good as her ex, Greg. Organized with no childhood trauma or dark history, a decent job, great with kids, and no desire to argue with her. She'd always known what to expect with Greg and had their future planned. Well, except for the breakup. She hadn't seen that coming. She cringed, the folk music grating her skin. It had nothing to do with the music, but thinking of their breakup always tampered with her mind. When she glanced back at her date, his steak salad was almost gone from his plate. Okay, just because she'd taken Logan's advice and hadn't pulled out her phone for a list didn't mean she couldn't ask a few questions, especially if Oscar might want a second date. Finding the right man was rare, and if the handsome man in front of her was the one, she could put up with physical training, couldn't she? She didn't need to lose weight, but exercise helped her stay in shape to keep up with energetic kindergartners. So, Oscar! With no urgency to eat, she pushed aside her salad. As far as relationships go, where do you see us in two years? Oscar stopped short of lifting a fork full of salad, set it down, and shrugged. Good question, he stared into space. Hadn't thought that far ahead, but it wouldn't hurt to be in a serious relationship sometime. She nodded, hoping he'd be as eager about marriage as she was. She would be 33 tomorrow, 35 in two years and she wanted to be a mom by then, or working toward becoming a parent. Nurturing a bunch of sweet kindergartners without parents left a longing in her, a desire to have a family of her own, the family she and Greg had talked about during their two years together. Now that he had cut her out of his life, she still wanted to pursue that dream. Hence, she joined the Simply Dating for Singles app. She tucked her feet back beneath her chair and crossed her ankles, leaning forward and needing to clarify. How would you define a serious relationship? dating, and stuff like that. He rested his hands on the table, his face turning serious. You look like a homemaker. You remind me of my mom. Thanks? She frowned. Exactly what did that mean? Was that the reason Greg broke up with her? Did her retro fashions and tastes make her look old? She gravitated toward retro and classics because of the simplicity and the emotional resilience they built up in her. Nostalgia inspired her to design clothes whenever she perused the retro online catalog. But now and then, Greg had grumbled about how vintage reminded him of his grandmother. She thought it was a compliment until her previous date commented that his mom had the same pair of earrings Serafina had worn, but she hadn't worn earrings today. Although nonchalant, Oscar's tone stirred a slight stab through her chest, leaving her self-conscious. She touched a tress of her hair at the back of her neck. She'd spent hours combing and styling her hair for this date. Oscar was grinning as he pulled out his phone. We can FaceTime my mom right now. She'll just love you. Were they 12 now? She put out her hand to stop him. Not today, but thank you. She didn't want to start a relationship with a meddling mother-in-law. Oscar could just admire his mom and be looking for someone like her. But what if his mom was reckless like Serafina's? No. If that were the case, he wouldn't be pulling out a phone to introduce his dates to a parent who was busy in a casino gambling away their house mortgage. Either way, it was a first date, and Serafina had to be clear about her expectations, too. I don't make it a habit to go to the gym, but I work out once a week with my friend. Tension released from her shoulders, emboldening her to confess her true self. I don't like going out on Sunday nights. She made the exception if she was hanging out with Logan or Vanessa at either of their homes. On Fridays, I still prefer to stay home and order a takeout. After a long week, she needed one night to take a bath and relax with candles, unless Logan and their circle of friends planned last-minute events. I'm hoping to get married, if possible, within a year, too, if planning takes a long time. Oscar chuckled. That's why Mom will love you. Serafina rested her hands on the table, determined to be as straightforward as possible. I'm sure I would like your mom. 
but I'm looking for a man who's not going to let their mom run the show. Oscar nodded, setting his phone to the side. I agree. He cleared his throat, picked up his fork from his plate, and poked at his salad. But don't you think this is heavy stuff for a first date? True. With a renewed appetite, she slid her salad back in front of her. That's why I want to make our expectations clear, so we don't waste each other's time. She stabbed a fork in the white meat and lifted it to her mouth. She chewed the lukewarm meat. It tasted like her date. He was another flake. She needed to update her profile and add expectations so she could get first dates with people who had similar goals. They both ate in silence as people chatted while upbeat music played, different from the earlier folk song played. Her phone vibrated, so she retrieved it from her purse on the empty chair next to her. Easy to guess why Logan texted. They did this to rescue each other from horrible and unwanted dates, and lately, she'd been the one needing rescuing. Logan had had a steady girlfriend for the last 10 months. Checking her phone was rude, but since they weren't talking anyway, she managed a glance. Logan, need a rescue for an exit plan? She held back a smile and shoved the phone back into her handbag. Oscar was now drinking water, then he brought out his phone, moving his thumb on the screen. Sorry, I need to respond to this work text. Serafina waved him off. The salad was actually tasty. Rich basil and peppery flavors accentuated the grilled white meat. Her phone vibrated, so she checked it again. Logan. I'm in the neighborhood. I could be there in ten. He must have left Roberto's party early. She typed a quick response. If she ignored him, he'd end up showing up and acting as if he was the rightful boyfriend. Serafina. All good. See you tomorrow. At the teacher appreciation party he had planned for her. They both knew he did it to celebrate the day they'd met, possibly her birthday too, but she played along. With her mom and now deceased dad having turned her birthdays into a betting, drinking, and fighting fest, Serafina had learned to dread her birthdays and escape the house. When the server brought their bill, Oscar reached for his wallet, but Serafina put out her hand to stop him. This one's on me. She retrieved her card from her wallet and handed it to the server. Oscar's lips parted, so she spoke before he protested. You'll pay next time. Even though there'd never be a next time. I might show up at that camp one of those days, you know? When the server left with her card, Oscar's eyes searched hers. He opened and closed his mouth before parting it again. Let's have another date. She'd already embarrassed herself by uttering her expectations. I'll be a terrible workout companion, but I admire the way you stick to your goal. I'm sure you'll be taking down your profile soon. So many girls online, like me, will find you attractive. If you're wrong, I have your number. He lifted his brow. I'll reach out when I'm serious about getting married. Maybe she needed to take things slow. Ugh. This dating was becoming an emotional strain. Her job was stressful enough with her fears of not knowing what family she'd have to turn into social services or how to grasp the source of kids' behavior problems. If only she could solve the dating mystery soon and move on with a routine life. When Serafina returned to her apartment building on San Francisco's outskirts, the air smelled of exhaust. Smoke emanated from the people exchanging swigs from a bottle and cigarettes or whatever it was that stirred in the air as they hovered around the big planters on the sidewalk. She didn't mind the homeless camping out at her dark blue graffiti-clad building, but their consumption of the skunk-like cigarette fumes irritated her. The dim front light shone on Gloggle, one of Logan's buddies. At least that was what the homeless man and Logan called each other. She waved to him, and he waved back before she walked into the three-story building. She held off on getting her puppy from the dog sitter on the first floor. Needing some time to compose herself, she took the stairs. Her pumps clicked as she climbed the metal steps to the apartment she'd chosen on the top floor in hopes it wasn't as easily tampered with. She needed to change before giving her full attention to her new companion. She'd been furious when a puppy was delivered to her door last weekend. Two days before, she told Logan she was never getting another dog. After all, Chula was irreplaceable. Then, like a traitor, he'd bought the cutest dog, delivered in a kennel with a huge blue bow. Her heart squeezed at the sight of the sweet brown thing leaving her torn between sending the dog back and betraying Chula. After signing for the delivery, she texted Logan, her fingers stomping out her annoyance. She couldn't even remember what she typed, but it must have been bad to have him so worried. Few things infuriated her, so Logan overreacted whenever she indicated she was upset. On the third floor, her friend and neighbor, Vanessa, was closing her door but churned when she heard Serafina's footsteps. How was your date? 
Vanessa's brown skin glowed under the hallway light, dressed in a royal blue scoop neck dress that hit slightly below the knee. She looked stunning and ready for a fun night. I'm still single, if that's what you mean. Serafina tried to keep the discouragement out of her tone as she approached her door across from Vanessa's and punched in the code to unlock her apartment. It was almost embarrassing to talk about her horrible dates now. When she pushed open the door, she held onto the handle and spun back to her friend. You look fabulous, by the way. I hope you two have a great time. Glad you've had better luck than I have. Vanessa waved her off and crossed towards Serafina's door. I have ten minutes before Pax gets here. She walked past Serafina, letting herself in. I want to hear about your date. Serafina drew out a breath, closed the door, and turned on the light. I remind him of his mom. She eased out of her turquoise pumps, leaving them on the floor instead of the entryway shoe bench. She then tossed her matching purse on the kitchen counter. He's not ready to think about marriage. Vanessa arched her brow, then sat on the wooden counter height stool. Pax and I have been on two dates, but marriage hasn't come up in our conversations. Deflated, Serafina slumped onto the stool next to Vanessa. Besides Logan, Vanessa was her first friend when she moved to San Francisco three and a half years ago. They'd met the week Serafina moved in when Vanessa brought a mean brisket to her apartment. Serafina had asked her to stay so they could enjoy it together. Meeting Vanessa's awaiting gaze, Serafina hugged her bare arms across her middle, her bright yellow belt cutting into her arms. I should have taken Logan's advice and not quizzed my date. Then she could assume it wasn't her fault for lacking dates, even if Oscar met five out of ten things on her criteria. She might have ignored her list and gone on another date with him. Vanessa tugged at Serafina's ponytail, then she twisted a clump of curls around her fingers as she stared at the photos on Serafina's orange refrigerator. Most of her and her friends, two of the photos had Vanessa in them, but every photo had Logan in it. I know what you need. Vanessa smiled, nodding to the refrigerator. Vanessa was a food truck cook, not by choice, but Serafina enjoyed bouncing off ideas and celebrating little victories about school, or venting and praying if she needed a friend in Logan's absence. Curious, Serafina twisted on her stool and narrowed her eyes. And what exactly do you think I need? Vanessa slapped the laminate counter. A dating coach. Serafina chuckled. <laughs> You're a chef and a dating coach now? I'm not a chef. You're just honoring your mom, I know. Vanessa's curly dark hair danced above her shoulders when she shook her head. I'd be a terrible coach, but I'm not suggesting you go for a professional one either. She wagged a finger, then pointed to the fridge. Logan will be perfect. Logan? Serafina almost choked when she swallowed. Logan had the opposite approach to relationships than hers. What kind of dating advice can he give me? Vanessa crisscrossed one leg over the other. If Logan walks into a room full of women, do you think he'd have a problem finding a dance partner? Which made him the worst coach. He wouldn't understand what Serafina had to endure to get a date. She traced a finger around a big red polka dot on her skirt before moving to another of the many multicolored dots like Logan moved from one girl to the next. He has a flock of female admirers. They throw themselves at him before he has the chance to think of his next move. That's my point, Vanessa sat taller, too confident, as if she'd gone through dating sessions before. Logan oozes confidence. I doubt any single woman would turn him down if he wanted her. All his ex-girlfriends were blonde and popular, confident women with class. He's picky about who he dates, too. That's what I mean. Vanessa gave Serafina's arm a gentle elbow bump. He goes for the right women without putting in the work it takes us to get a single date. What was that supposed to mean? If anyone was sweating at finding dates, it was Serafina. Vanessa was heading out to her third date with an engineer who frequented her food truck and bought lunches daily. Her friend must have noticed Serafina's confusion because Vanessa grasped Serafina's hand. Logan knows what men want in women. Vanessa was right, Logan had plenty of experience in the art of dating, whereas Serafina only had one serious boyfriend. But Logan was also flighty and noncommittal. Women always clung to him and wanted to marry him, but he ended relationships the moment his dates got serious. Needy was what he called girls like her, who were looking for lasting relationships. What girl wouldn't want to marry a handsome, caring man like him? He ran a successful business that helped provide securities, bankings, and money management in one of the biggest cities in America. Well, what girl except for Serafina? She'd rather be his friend than see him as a prospect. That would sabotage their long-term friendship. 
She scratched her fingernail polish, almost buying into the idea. I suppose it couldn't hurt to ask him what it takes to be a perfect date. She swiveled side to side on her stool. I'll consider it and jot down a questionnaire for him. Vanessa snorted. Right, that will work. Seriously, girl, you two are friends. He'll not take you seriously when you hand him a list of questions. Vanessa raised a finger to emphasize her point. My aunt had to go through a step-by-step process. She used a dating coach and went on practice dates. Was that a thing? Serafina rubbed at her now throbbing temples. If it was a thing, it wasn't something she wanted to do. Vanessa's phone beeped and she pulled it out from her handbag, grinning. Pax is here. If you don't ask Logan by next week, I'll ask him for you. Serafina gasped, her hands flailing at Vanessa, but she ducked. Her eyes twinkled and her lips twitched in a smile. Vanessa might be enjoying this, but it would be more humiliating if she asked on Serafina's behalf. No doubt he'd think she was playing pranks since she made fun of him for being flighty. We're seeing Logan tomorrow at your teacher's appreciation party. Vanessa made air quotes, always one to question why he threw an exceptional teacher appreciation party for Serafina. Ask him then. We have to name the puppy. What a terrible excuse not to bring it up. They'd have time to talk about all sorts of things, not just brainstorm names for the pup. We'll chat soon. Vanessa patted Serafina's bare shoulder, then slid from the stool and smoothed down her shimmery blue dress before letting herself out, and left Serafina staring at the dirty dishes in her sink. She'd kept piling them up in hopes to get to it whenever she felt the urge to clean. Good thing she didn't need dinner. Dishes could wait until tomorrow. By the time she played with the puppy, then called Logan to share her date, she'd be ready for bed. She turned her gaze to a much more pleasant sight, the living room adjoining the kitchen, had soothing art that made her feel at home. Three of the four vintage prints Logan had won at an auction. A color palette, multi-panel canvas, and the desert print with a sunset. The third print was just an abstract of colorful shapes she'd bought when she bought her furniture. She moved to the living room and sat on the orange sofa, letting her simple decor revive her. She dragged Logan to a vintage store when she needed to shop for her empty apartment. The apartment he helped her choose. Well, technically... She'd chosen it while he fussed about her safety in the questionable neighborhood. He wanted to pay for a nicer apartment, but she wanted something she could pay for herself. After taking over his brother's financial company in San Francisco, Logan had asked her to relocate from Denver. It hadn't taken conniving on his side, since he was the closest to family she had, far closer to her than her mom, which was sad in a way, but that was just the reality. He'd even brainstormed with her the potential schools, schools that needed a special ed teacher and had students with disabilities. But Finley Elementary had been in desperate need of any kind of teachers. Considering the school's minimal salary offering, not many teachers wanted to work with kids dealing with behavior issues and special needs. But making a difference to kids with disabilities and from broken homes was the reason she switched from her passion for fashion to pursue teaching. A few nights in homeless shelters, she'd encountered kids like her, children who needed to be in school, so they could have a chance to make career choices. That wasn't something you could do if you didn't go to school. She may never have kids of her own, but she wanted to be the role model her parents failed to be. She wanted to do things differently, the opposite of her upbringing, which gave her further reason to be specific when choosing a future husband. Logan may not be her type, but he was a big part of her life, and he might know what she needed to do to find a legitimate date. It sounded as easy as one plus one equals a plus one but asking for coaching sessions from her friend was unnerving. She'd better pray for clarity. Chapter 3 Wow, heart still pumping fast, Logan high-fived Serafina on Saturday evening. The escape room was fascinating, and although it had mishaps, having a group of eight helped with the logistics while they tracked the fixer, a shadowy foreign agent threatening to blow up London. With the clock ticking and then locked into the room, They'd solve the logic puzzle in time to prevent an imminent catastrophe. Great work, agents! The worker who'd escorted them to their game room and locked them in now opened the door. You not only survived, but also saved the city from a bombing. You broke the code in 48 minutes. That's pretty close to a record for the red wire room. Roberto slapped both of Logan's hands, then jostled Serafina under his arm. Teamwork at its finest, sir. Our group works better than any old MI6 agents. MI5, the escape room employee corrected. This was domestic terrorism. Maybe it should be MI8, since there were eight of us. Logan winked, then rubbed his hands together. This calls for food. 
Meet me at the Breakfast King, everyone. The all-day breakfast diner was one of Serafina's favorite places to eat, so he had his assistant reserve a private room. He'd also requested they decorate with a retro theme. Hence the banners and streamers when they entered the room 20 minutes later and enjoyed a leisurely meal. Once the gentle clatter of utensils slowed, chatter rose from the brightly lit room, offset by laughter. The smell of bacon, syrup, and sausages hung in the air while the servers cleared the dishes from the two tables they'd connected to fit their group. Seated at the end of the table, Logan beckoned one of the servers from the opposite end of the table. The young man stopped short of reaching for the dishes. He walked around and bent down to Logan's level. Let's go ahead and have cake. Logan pointed across the room where green, gold, and tan balloons arched over the table with the tiered ice cream cake. Also, can you make nine of your meaty skillets to go? I can do that, sir. The man stood and left the other two servers to clear the rest of the plates. Although Logan desired to pay for housing for the homeless men and women outside of Serafina's complex, most of them preferred to roam free on the streets. Giving them money was like sending them back to buy more drugs, given their addictions. But he could give them food from time to time. The only thing he liked about Serafina's neighborhood and hanging out in her questionable restaurants was that they saw him as Logan Stone. They didn't see him as the CEO of a billion-dollar company or a successful investor in several countries. Another reason to treasure his asset of friends, friends he and Serafina had grown close to since meeting them through church and connecting through their co-ed volleyball team. On his right, Serafina was apologizing to Roberto for not making it to his party. Seriously, you can't keep apologizing. Roberto spoke in his thick Latino accent. If it's of any comfort, my wife is over the moon that she can listen to her audiobooks and make calls with a smart speaker. Logan's assistant had helped him shop for the device Roberto wanted. Logan then signed the card with both his and Serafina's names, just like she did whenever he was busy and forgot the birthdays for Jonah, the doorman, or Heather, Logan's chef. By the time he remembered, he was being thanked by his employees for a birthday basket Serafina got them and added his name to. He felt her fingers underneath the table when she entwined them with his and squeezed. Her way of saying thank you. He squeezed hers back. So, Logan! Vanessa called from across the table, her brown skin radiant under the fluorescent light, her smile wide enough to send his guard up. How was your Italian vacation? It wasn't a vacation. Just work. What I wouldn't do to take that kind of trip? She tilted her head to the side, resting her hand on her cheek and clearly dreaming of Italy. I was telling Sarah she should come next time. Maybe you can tag along. Perhaps Vanessa could convince her to go. She breathed in, nodding. Hmm, Italy. He hadn't vacationed in Italy and didn't want to answer questions about vacation spots and whatnot. So he forced a smile. Why didn't you bring your date tonight? Vanessa's eyes widened, her mouth parting. Serafina told you? Serafina told him pretty much everything on her mind, and in her life unless she forgot to. When she called to talk about another bad date gone wrong, she ended up sidetracking about Vanessa's dating life. Things are not serious. I haven't told anybody but Serafina. A heel cut against his jeans on his left shin under the table. Ouch! He jumped and elbowed Serafina in the ribs. What was that for? She winced. Good. At least she was just as hurt. It was confidential. She spoke through gritted teeth. Her soft hair teased his cheek when she leaned closer, and the fried food scent drowned, replaced by her sweet fragrance. This is the last time I'm sharing any secrets with you. Hmm, missing out on girl drama. He screwed up his face and pinched and rubbed his fingers together as if crushing something small. I'll be so crushed. She punched him on the shoulder. Good thing her tap was light because his short sleeve button down wouldn't protect him from a wallop if she chose otherwise. Will you stop harassing me? He rubbed his shoulder. It's your fault for disclosing her secret romance. You two are so cute. They both turned to Vanessa. She crossed her arms on the table to brace herself, glancing between them. What else did Serafina tell you? What? What could Vanessa want to know? The hairs on the back of his neck bristled, if her deceptively sweet smile was any indication. He eyed Serafina, who was always easy to read, then he raised his brows. What are you two plotting? Her gaze wavered and she fanned herself, then nodded to the banner on the opposite wall. With Teacher of the Year in bold primary colors, the cutesy print like something her kids would have made. This party is epic. She was stalling, even if she meant what she said. The servers returned with cake and further stalled off Serafina and Vanessa's unspoken plotting. Eating ice cream cake after breakfast didn't seem right. 
but they were celebrating with friends as they congratulated Serafina for almost making it through another year. To him, she was the best teacher and deserved the Teacher of the Year award. But no one paid attention to Finley Elementary to know the kids in her class had one of the most loving and kindest teachers in the world, someone with their best interests at heart. Shortly after, they said goodbye to their friends in the parking lot as they handed Serafina cards and loaded the Escalade with food for the homeless. When they settled into the rear seats, Serafina spoke to Logan's driver, Kosal. I can't believe you stayed in the car while we had a party. I'm good, but thank you, Serafina. I pleaded with him. Logan did often, but the man preferred to stay in the car to guard the entrance. The only times he entered the room were in crowded buildings when he assumed he needed to watch Logan's back closely. Logan's brother Eric had never had threats on his life for Logan to worry about his own safety. Kosal was an immigrant from Cambodia, and Logan's security team hired him two years ago, as his driver slash bodyguard if needed. As Kosal started driving, Logan spread his arms across the back of their seats and faced her. So, what was all that with you and Vanessa? You girls had some serious secret language going on in the restaurant. She's just being Vanessa. Serafina turned away from him to peer at the city lights. You're so kind to take me to Breakfast King, even if it's not your kind of place. Okay, he could take a hint and leave matters alone. Sooner or later, she'd end up blurting whatever it was. Serafina could no more keep a secret from him than she could give up caring about kids. Logan shifted his knee on the vinyl flooring as he stroked the bouncy puppy. The fluorescent kitchen light highlighted the white spots on the dog's brown fur, soft beneath his fingers. The energetic beagle leaped for his hand, and he chuckled when the dog gnawed his finger with its cute mouth. In a few weeks, the dog would have teeth, and the biting wouldn't be cute anymore. Are you even listening? Serafina's voice rose from where she stood by the counter, and he spun, taking his finger out of the dog's mouth and replacing it with one of the toys strewn on the floor. Something about the homeless? He hadn't blocked her out, but her complaints had no resolution. I mean, it's great that you give them food and all. She carried the bowl, the same color as her orange fridge, and set it down for the dog but they'll never find another place if they have gourmet meals brought to them. If we feed them, they'll be our friends, and they'll watch our cars, so thieves or vandals or whatnot won't break into them. He stood, rubbing his hands together to get rid of any dog hair. Her safety concerned him because she stayed in a rough neighborhood. Having homeless men and women smoking marijuana and doing other drugs in front of her building didn't help its already sketchy appearance. If I remember, I begged you to stay in a different neighborhood. This place is fine. She returned to the counter, the dog bag crunched when she folded and tightened it with a grip clip. Then she shoved it next to the clutter on her counter. The glass bottles and all sorts of items likely for her soap crafts. I just didn't expect it to be a permanent campout for the homeless. She would have said something if the homeless had posed any threats, but that hadn't been the case, just in case he offered another alternative. I could hire security for the building if that helps. She squished her face, then crossed to the sink, turned on the water, and washed her hands. It's the smoke that bugs me. Cigarette smoke always assaulted Logan with memories of his first home. Today of all days, he'd rather not think or talk about cigarette scents. He washed his hands when she proceeded to the fridge and wiped her hands with the kitchen towel on the handle. Steam rising from the diffuser wafted a therapeutic scent of lemon and peppermint and offered a good distraction from all things cigarettes. Would you like some water? She swung open the vintage refrigerator, seeming to have sensed his disinterest in the topic. That'll be great. The plastic bottle slipped out of her hand and thudded to the floor. The beagle rushed for it, not on the bottle, then kicked it with his paws when the bottle rolled toward the dining table. What a feisty little thing. Serafina followed the pup and crouched to pick up the water bottle and set it on the counter, not far from the two gift bags. Logan's hands itched to touch the pooch, and he squatted in front of it and rubbed behind the pup's ears. Isn't he the cutest little thing? Serafina twisted the cap off the water bottle. I thought Iris was the cutest thing. He loved all of his siblings, but his baby sister was a different kind of sweet, annoying whenever she got under his skin, but it was all because she cared. Besides my sister. As if uninterested in the cuddles, the puppy ran to the fridge and jumped for the dish towel. No, stop! Serafina wagged her finger and strode for the fridge to yank the towel, easing it out of the dog's mouth. We should call him Tugger. Logan washed his hands again, stifling a laugh as water dripped from his hands before he grabbed the folded towel next to the sink. If you want the dog to be bullied by other dogs, then yeah. He kicked one of the bone-shaped chew toys from the floor and toward the dog. The pup ran and clawed his teeth into the toy. 
Serafina tossed the dish towel into the sink. He keeps stealing the towels and tugging on them when I try to take them away. The dog chewed on the toy for an extended time, and Logan kept his gaze on it, his mind brainstorming names related to chewing. Sarah, he turned to her as she reached for her water from the counter. Look, chewing is his favorite thing to do. I have to keep my shoes out of reach. Towels? Chewy. The name popped into Logan's mind and flowed off his tongue. What do you think of that name? She nodded, then brought her water bottle to her mouth and took a sip. Her brown eyes twinkled beneath the fluorescent light. After Chewbacca. She smiled with fondness, and he let his mind wander back to years ago when he'd reunited with her. She was 14 when his parents tracked her down, and her parents had no problem letting her spend a week with his family in Pleasant View. After an entire day of talking and catching up, they spent the next day binge-watching six of the Star Wars movies. Looks like we have a name for you. Serafina bent down and picked up the dog. It licked her bare arm. Logan, grab my phone from the counter. We have to get our annual selfie, this time with a new member. He was used to some of her rituals and the annual selfies they took on this day ever since they reunited as teens. He glanced from the fridge to the counter, then the living room. Where's the best lighting around here? Before the fridge is great. She struggled to keep the wiggling puppy in her hands as they moved to the fridge. Having the height advantage, Logan always took their selfies. With his left hand, he tapped the camera app and then lifted the phone in front of them. The light was too bright for a quality photo, but the memory was what counted. Chewie's head is not going to show. He lowered himself a bit. Here. She shifted moving closer, her warm cheek squeezing against his as she cuddled the dog higher on her chest. Her hair wafted a scent that teased his nostrils, the same mint and lemon from the diffuser. On three. He counted to three as he and Serafina grinned, Chewie barking, clearly intrigued by his reflection on the phone. Logan pressed the red button four times, knowing Serafina needed options. Let's do a silly one she said, and he shook his head as he tried for his silliest face by widening his eyes and smiling crookedly. He pressed one photo and the dog nipped at his arm. The phone slid from his hand and bounced on the vinyl floor. No, Chewy! But her scold rang with laughter, likely confusing the poor pup. Logan scooped up the phone, then patted Chewy's forehead. I think we gotta establish some rules for you, little guy. Speaking of rules, she set the dog down, you should come with me to Chewie's training class next Saturday morning, if you're not golfing. He shrugged. It's not like I'll be in charge of the dog. You know I suck at nurturing things. He'd never match her standards of nurturing. The vibrant vines dangling from the top of her fridge were living examples that anything thrived in her care. At least his staff cared for the few plants in his penthouse. But sure, as far as I know, I'm not playing golf until two. Her elbow brushed against him as she scrolled through her photos, her fingers swiping on the screen as she deleted some. Then she tipped the screen his way. We got two good ones. He gave the phone a cursory glance, not caring how the photos turned out, since only the memories mattered. Either of those is fine. His gaze drifted to the time on the screen. 8.08. Not late since it was Saturday, and he had nothing to hurry home to after dedicating his evening to celebrating with her. He reached for one of the two small bags on the counter. I forgot to give you this when I dropped by your school the other day. Her smile broad, she joined him and snagged the bag. You already put on a massive party for me. The counter cooled his arms as he rested on the dark laminate. A souvenir, from Italy. You found a rock for my collection? She pulled it from the brown paper bag, tilting her head backward. She smoothed her finger over the coral-like piece, lifted it closer to the light, and studied it. This doesn't look like the ones you buy in the store. She squinted, assessing the holes and churning the stone around as she rubbed the bumpy edges. It's so different. It even smells briny. I picked it out at the beach. Oh, Logan. She peered up into his face in awe before setting the rock on the counter. She then slid her hand to his back and curled her arm around his waist, her hair brushing against his cheek when she leaned her head on his shoulder. You did that for me? Warmth radiated through him and his chest rose. Only Serafina could be so happy with something as simple as a rock. You made it clear when I got you a store-bought rock from Singapore. I was only half joking. Whatever. Her smile was worth walking through fire for. A stroll on a beach wouldn't kill him, though his assistant had acted like time away from work might kill his business deal. It hadn't. These parties are getting bigger each year. She moved her hand from his waist and her head from his shoulder, then created space between them before staring at him with her warm brown eyes, almost as big as your family reunions. 
I could make it bigger if you want. He was tempted now that he could afford it, but she'd fuss. This should be the last time we celebrate my birthday. Sadness dimmed her eyes. Regardless of the bad memories her birthday stirred, she was worth celebrating. It would be a distraction from her dwelling on why she didn't want to be celebrated. Afraid not. He walked to the other side of the counter, almost tripping over the dog who'd curled up drowsily on the floor. Logan pushed the other gift bag with the cards aside. Even if he usually reminded their friends not to bring presents, they still gave Serafina gift cards for teacher appreciation. You know it's not just your birthday we celebrate. She shrugged, nodded, and whispered, I know. It helps me remember who I was before I was adopted into a family. If I hadn't been your neighbor, bittersweet childhood memories of their time together were the highlights of his early years. He drew out a breath. Today is the day. You came into my life. She cut him off, leaning on the counter and resting her chin on her hand. Stumbled into my life is more like it. His voice was hoarse as he fought the tightness in his chest. She smiled, stood, and reached for the untouched water bottle. She twisted the cap off and slid it toward him. Her gaze drifted to the living room, her eyes glazing. It was a cloudy afternoon. He remembered that day as if it was just yesterday. You were wearing a fluffy blue dress with a big bow on the waist. She snatched a pencil from the holder and checked it at him. You never told me you remembered what I was wearing. Perhaps because he'd been an eight-year-old, who had nothing exciting until she showed up. You scared me to death. How could I not remember what you looked like? Me? Scare you? She stretched across the counter and jabbed a finger at his chest. I didn't expect anyone to be in that sewer pipe. You jumped out and scared me to death. Logan had been carrying a cup of coffee to his drunken uncle when he tripped over one of uncle's shoes he'd left on the floor. The cup fell and shattered and coffee spilled, burning Logan's feet. The moment his uncle started screaming all sorts of profanities as his rocker creaked, Logan made a fast escape through the kitchen window and sprinted for his hideout. He'd learned to put up with verbal abuse, but the few times uncle got physical had Logan escaping if he could. Most times uncle went to sleep and woke up having forgotten the previous events. You screamed like a baby. I had to cover your mouth so you didn't give away my hiding spot. When he told her why he was hiding and felt the tension evaporate from her shoulders, he took his hands from her mouth. Then they both ducked into the storm drain, and she told him why she was on the run. Her parents had been drinking and started fighting in front of her school friends. As strange as it is, her eyes glistened, those two years you were my neighbor are my best childhood memories. His chest constricted, and he touched her hand, squeezing it. At least he'd move on and made better memories after his adoption. That's the only reason I put up with the teacher appreciation party. She screwed up her face. This day reminds me you're my best friend. Her genuine words tightened his chest. With his throat constricting, he just stared at the photos framed on the refrigerator. Good thing she was better than he was at having photo keepsakes. She was his best friend too, the person besides his mom who understood him best. They both had friends, but his special childhood bond with her would always connect them. We need to find a new special place. The storm drain wasn't a place for sweet memories. It won't be the same. She picked up the rock and studied it longer. Thanks for my rock. For everything. If he left now, would she be bombarded by memories of her birthday, her parents, and her regrets of her dad dying before she reconciled with him? He scratched his chin, contemplating an activity that didn't involve another outing. I thought today would be a good day for one of your classic movies if you're up. You mean it? Her head jerked up and her brown eyes lit up. He'd given in to watching her movies now and then, but not often. Of course, it's your day. Our day. She beamed, then spoke faster. I've been wanting to rewatch Breakfast at Tiffany's. He couldn't remember the titles of the classics they'd watched before. As long as it's not black and white. You suggested it, not me. She walked out of the kitchen and toward the dining table, then returned to open the fridge and handed him his favorite dark chocolate. I don't want to forget that. Thanks. He ripped open the bar and broke a small corner. Although he knew her response, he offered the piece to her. She scrunched up her face again, shaking her head. Enjoy your chocolate. I'm going to change and I'll be right back. All right, I'll get Chewy settled in. Logan set the remaining chocolate on the counter, then glanced at the dog already in dreamland. Perhaps he would close his eyes like Chewy the minute the movie started. After helping Chewy get situated on his doggy bed in the living room, where they would see him from the seating area, Logan washed his hands in the sink. Too thrilled by the silly rock, Serafina hadn't pulled the box of candy from the bag, 
so he removed the tissue paper and the candy and carried it to the triangular blue coffee table before dimming the lamp. Her house was a mix of color with no decor scheme or coordination, bright and fun and chaotic, like a kindergarten classroom. It suited her. He stooped to pick up her sandals and carried them to the shoe bench by the door. He swapped his shoes for the house slippers Serafina bought him. It didn't matter what temperature it was. His feet were always cold, so she kept slippers around for him. When he returned to the seating area, he folded the tooth row strewn on the floor. No wonder the dog chewed her towels and shoes. All her organizational skills went into her classroom and planning her life, rather than her house. He returned and sat on the couch, the only chair in her living room. While he had a chance with the remote, he turned on the TV, the slim modern apparatus, the sole thing from this century, as it balanced over a chunky avocado green stand. His brother wasn't racing today, but Logan loved watching the NASCAR race replays for his brother's races. The monotonous sound of sirens whooshed from outside, as if there were police cars right at her complex, which wouldn't be unusual. The thin windows couldn't block out any of the noise. Did you find the movie? He spun at the sound of her voice. Nope, still looking. Not exactly. Gone was her blue and pink floral dress, and now replaced by long, loose gray pajama pants and a navy t-shirt with the word elevation a souvenir from a band at the concert they'd attended last summer. Would you like some popcorn? She stopped behind the couch. He was stuffed. I forgot my water on the counter. He pressed the button for another channel. No popcorn for me. She left and returned with two waters, set them on the table, and sank onto the cushion next to him. He handed her the remote. Are you sure you want to watch a classic? Her knee brushed against him when she lifted her feet off the ground and crossed them on the couch. He'd gotten her a movie subscription for Christmas, but he had no idea what channel had the classics. At this point, I don't think I can change my mind. He snagged the candy and set it on her lap. You got Pop Rocks? She was now sidetracked with candy, another childhood memory. The box crunched as she ripped it open, trying not to grin. He asked her for the classic channel and she told him the number to press on the remote. After scrolling through a handful of movies, he found Breakfast at Tiffany's and clicked the play button. Isn't this the movie we watched at the park last summer? The Golden Gate Park streamed random movies once a week in the summertime, and she asked him to go with her to watch the classic movie. Yeah, that's why I wanted to watch it again. The opening credits rolled in, but while soft music overplayed the scene, Therafina was more into the candy she raved about. Put out your hand. He wasn't hungry, but even though it was pure sugar with no flavor, he put out his hand. This day was about her birthday and their childhood memories. He'd stolen the exact candy from a booth at the school Christmas event. When he'd shared with her and bragged about how he'd acquired it, she'd insisted he go and confess. It had been the most humiliating thing he'd ever done, and ended any larceny leanings. Erasing the memory now, he put the candy in his mouth and it popped before melting onto his tongue. Logan winced, pouring the rest into her palm. It tastes worse than I remember. You didn't bring it last year. I didn't expect any today. How could he have forgotten? I must be getting old if I forgot. That's why you should ask Danica to marry you soon. We broke up. The credits ended and the first scene started. Logan kept his gaze on the TV while sensing her judgmental stare. Then she punched his shoulder. What do you mean you broke up? Movie starting. He pushed her back, still focusing on the screen. He could see her frown from the corner of his eyes. Why do you always think it's my fault? Of course, this was mostly his doing. But why'd she automatically assume he was always at fault? If he told her the ultimatums from relationships mostly made him back out, She'd see to it that she wasn't in his way of having a girlfriend. A moment of silence passed before he braved a glance her way. Good, she'd refocused on the TV. She curled a strand of her hair from her loose ponytail, evidently still processing what he'd shared. Don't look at me. I'm not judging you. She spoke without looking at him, yet a slight accusation churned her tone tart. I don't get you sometimes. He didn't understand himself either. He refocused on the movie and grasped the story as a recollection of watching it last time resurfaced. Had Serafina chosen the movie with him in mind? He was no different from Holly Golightly, who was figuring out who she was supposed to be. The girl also reminded him of Serafina. His friend was working too hard to find happiness in pursuit of the perfect husband. Thankfully, she didn't talk about going on another date. Perhaps she'd put the matter to rest. Logan knew who he was. Unsure of romance, he was sure of God's love for him, and he could count on his friends to back him up any time. Halfway through the movie, Serafina yawned and tossed her feet on the rug, then sat straight. I don't remember the movie being this long. 
She fought another yawn and outstretched her arms. I wouldn't be hurt if we don't finish it. Please say yes. He reached for the remote, hoping to put an end to the movie he was now partially interested in. We have to finish it. She scooted further, reaching for the pillow on the other side of the armrest and setting it on his lap. It was all familiar. She'd done it a few times when she couldn't finish a movie. I don't see why I get punished watching a movie I'm not into while you sleep. I'm not sleeping. She spoke through a yawn as she tucked her feet up on the sofa, the weight of her head dipping on his lap when she rested it on the pillow. Minutes later, her shallow breath grew slower and slower. He wasn't sure if he was watching the movie or Serafina when her chest rose and fell. With her head against his stomach, he peeked at her face. Long lashes fanned her eyes. She was so innocent and sweet, his heart constricted. If it were up to him, he'd see to it that she never had to worry about a single thing in her life. But it was always a battle to protect her from making terrible decisions. Like online dating or staying in a questionable neighborhood where police were often handcuffing someone from her complex. When the movie ended, he hated waking her. He held her head beneath the pillow and eased off the couch to stand. Chewie's and Serafina's breathing muffled the silence. He shut off the TV, then walked to the spare bedroom where she kept the full-size spare blankets and did her sewing. She designated the room for him, but he'd only stayed a few times for emergencies. Once when her dad had died, Logan stayed for a week. Then when she'd been sick and when her dog died. With church tomorrow morning, he needed a good rest. After draping a full-size blanket over her, he kept the lamp on in case she woke and needed to see to transition into her bedroom. On his way out, he changed into his shoes, turned off the kitchen lights, and closed the door, the locks clicking into place. The landlord hadn't given Logan a hard time when he offered to pay for advanced locks and add peepholes to the complex doors. Serafina's safety was always what he was concerned about. She didn't care or worry about herself, but whether she knew it or not, he'd keep watching out for her. Chapter 4 Sunday afternoon, Serafina pulled out her clothes from the closet and stacked them on her retro green dresser. A green top and a tan patterned skirt for tomorrow made it to the top of the pile as she lined up her clothes for the work week. Selecting her clothes made the rest of her week easier when she had to deal with grading papers and now the extra evening dodgeball practices. Logan, with his competitiveness, had added two practices this week to the two they already had scheduled. Chewie was nibbling at a dog-shaped toy in the corner of her bedroom. Chewie. Her cheeks lifted into a smile. Logan couldn't have thought of a more perfect name. But he was Logan, always creative, kind, and thoughtful. No wonder she felt comfortable falling asleep on his lap whenever she got tired during their movie times. Behind the serious face he had on Forbes magazine and the internet and media platforms was a soft-hearted soul and the child in him. Chewie had tugged her blanket, waking her up that morning, and warmth burst through her heart. Logan had brought one of the blankets from the spare room to cover her before he left. She blew out a breath, her gaze drifting to the outfits, then to the two handbags beyond the framed photos of her parents. Her gaze lingered on the photo, the way it did whenever she stood there. They may not have been the best parents, but they loved her in their way. An ache pierced her chest as she fought the urge to reach for the frame. That would only stir in unwelcome regrets she'd endured since Dad died shortly after she'd moved to San Francisco. She'd been worn out from her parents' calls, constantly asking for money, only to flush it down into gambling, as they had her entire life. We'll get rich someday. They'd say, and it had cost them two homes. Then they'd accumulated more debts. Even after declaring bankruptcy, they still convinced some of their friends to loan them money. Her parents lived their lives with her on the outside, which in a way helped her learn to fend for herself. She worked odd jobs since 13. In high school, she'd taken courses at the community college and had applied the credits to Metro University to pursue her teaching degree. Even while she worked for college funds, her parents always asked for money from her. Then once she graduated and got a job, she cut them out of her life. When Logan asked her to move to San Francisco, it had been an easy decision. He was the closest family she had. Of course, she never expected her dad to die that year. Without God and without Logan, she'd still be beating herself up for not being in dad's life. Her phone rang and she darted for it on the yellow sateen duvet cover of her untucked bed. When she saw her mom's contact flashing there, as if she'd read Serafina's thoughts, her fingers hesitated over swiping to answer. The usual dread embraced her. She stared at the screen, then carried the phone to the window, waging an inner battle. 
According to the text she received on Saturday morning, Mom had missed her accountability meeting. If Serafina answered, she'd yell, and that wouldn't help in their new reconciliation. Her palms were sweating as she ignored the phone. Rays of afternoon light shot over graffiti departments not much different from her complex. Two police officers had someone pinned against a car, and a policewoman cuffed the scraggly man's arms and guided him into the back of the police cruiser. Trash littered the sidewalk as pedestrians passed the police, minding their business as if it were a normal way of life on her end of town. It was normal for some, and she'd lived in rougher places when they'd become homeless. But staying in this neighborhood infuriated her to some extent. Life might have been different had mom and dad never gambled. Dad had been a manager and mom a cashier at the casino where they'd met. A bitter chuckle escaped. People who should know everything about financial planning had instead taken the wrong financial route when the casino shut down. The phone had stopped ringing, then it rang again. Mom would keep calling if Serafina didn't answer. Puffing out of breath, she eyed her phone and slid her thumb to take the call. Hi, Mom. Serafina's clipped tone must have given her away. Don't worry. Mom's hoarse voice rasped from years of smoking. I'm not asking for money today. What a relief. Serafina held the words in, but she closed her eyes, remembering how she and Logan had prayed before he came up with a plan for her to forgive and help her mom. You missed your meeting. That's why I called. Logan wasn't happy about it either. I wasn't feeling well. When she and Logan linked mom up for Gamblers Anonymous, they'd also signed her up for an accountability class for addicts. They had given their numbers to the counselors to keep them posted whenever mom didn't show for that. A year had passed since mom started the sessions, but whenever she called asking for money, Serafina feared mom was resorting to drinking or gambling. Serafina wanted to ask why mom hadn't called to let the counselor know about her illness, but maybe mom had a good reason to skip her meeting. Tension eased from her shoulders, and she tinkered with the chain on the blind. Are you okay? I'm happy. Yet sadness lingered in her heavy tone, even as she spoke about the hobbies she was part of in the new housing community. That man, Logan. I'm so glad he's your friend. Don't tell me he gave you money. He already paid mom's rent in a far better community than Serafina's. I'm not going to squander it. So he gave you money. Trust me, it came with rules. I'm terrified to buy anything. Mom's breathing was louder through the phone. He notified all the casinos to let him know if I step within reach of any of them. But he shouldn't have worried. I'm so afraid of landing back on the streets if I should disappoint Logan. If only Mom meant it, and if only Mom had ever feared disappointing Serafina. She swallowed hard, stomping down on the bitter thought as she slumped against the wall and let her head fall back against the window. As for getting back on the streets, Logan would never let that happen. Serafina, too. But she could barely keep up with her own bills, let alone pay for mom's housing. She still managed to deposit some money to Mom's King Supers card monthly and hoped the only thing mom bought at the grocery store was food. I don't deserve your trust, but I'm trying, okay? Trying. All right. Serafina still had no idea what to say to her mom. They were so distant, even though they'd agreed to stay in touch once a month ever since they reconciled. What are you up to? Trying. Serafina could also try. I take walks every morning, and I started spinning classes. Mom gave a wispy laugh, sounding almost girlish despite her raspy voice. I've got a new part-time job as a janitor at the nursing home. It doesn't pay much, but it's a start. It's good you're starting somewhere. Serafina meant it. Before I forget, be sure to thank Logan for me. He said he will be sending me money every month. He wants me to buy some new clothes as long as I send the receipts to his accountant. Why hadn't Logan said anything? When did you talk to him? This morning. If only she could refuse his help, but she couldn't afford to meet all of Mom's needs. Again, as long as Mom didn't get tempted to give into her addictions again. Serafina? Mom's voice tugged at her. Serafina closed her eyes, rocking her head against the glass behind her. Hmm? I love you, baby. Although Serafina didn't feel ready to say those words, she said them anyway before she hung up. It couldn't hurt. After all, it was her mom. She should love her, shouldn't she? Maybe she did. All she knew, though, was this fear deep inside, screaming everything with mom was about to spiral out of control again. She'd go visit her after school got out, 
Perhaps she could then connect better while they stayed in the same house. As she set her phone on the dresser, the doorbell rang, and she left her bedroom. Chewy was already prancing ahead, no doubt ready for another walk, even though Serafina had walked him as soon as she returned home from church. Grateful for Logan's insistence to install the peephole, she pressed an eye to it. Besides Vanessa, the wrong food deliveries, or her maintenance requests, nobody knocked on Serafina's door. Logan let himself in at any time. Beyond the door, Vanessa rocked from side to side as if listening to music. Her full knee-length black skirt swayed, stark beneath her vivid blue top. Serafina picked up Chewy, held him in the crook of her left arm, then opened the door. You want to go grab some ice cream? Vanessa waved the pink paper in her hand, likely a gift certificate. I have to pack lunch and make some lip balms and body sprays for the the end-of-the-year teacher gifts. She glanced at the loaf of bread and the jar of jelly on the counter, hating to turn down her friend, but after 3 p.m. on Sunday, she'd set her mind back into school mode. Vanessa patted the dog squirming in Serafina's armpit. Come on! How long does it take to pack a PB&J? Serafina winced. It's Sunday evening. Rarely did she even go out with Logan. That was the one afternoon she and Logan agreed not to get together. Logan, too, always started stressing about the week, the moment they walked out of church. He called his family on Sunday since he was home. Do you know how expensive soft swirl is? I introduced you there, remember? I know, but I'd forgotten about the coupon. She lifted the slip again, showcasing the words, buy one, get one free. I can't have two ice creams by myself. You should text Pax. Soft Swirl is a good place to take your date. Vanessa rolled her eyes. Okay, Pax and I are still... She shrugged. In the get-to-know-you phase? The last thing I want is to appear desperate. Serafina was desperate. She couldn't deny it. She stared at the dog, then hefted it to her chest. I'd hate to leave Chewy home alone. I already checked with Mary. Your dog sitter can watch him for... Vanessa made air quotes. Free. I promise to cook her dinner tomorrow. You'd already assume I'd go with you? How presumptuous. No, but I figured if I had things arranged, I could convince you to come out on a Sunday evening. Vanessa patted the dog again. You guys finally decided on a name? Serafina smiled. Chewy suits him. It was Logan's idea. Logan. Vanessa wiggled her brows. Did you ask him about the coaching? I thought about it and decided not to go that route. His breakup with Danica confirmed Logan wasn't the right man to coach her. Vanessa frowned, then pushed the door, letting herself in, and Serafina followed, closing the door. Have you given up on dating? Serafina set Chewy down, and he scurried for the toys strewn on the floor. I'll just update my profile, letting men know I am only looking for a serious Christian relationship, and hope I get the right man this time. You leave me no choice. Vanessa crossed her arms. I'll call Logan whenever we get back tonight. He broke up with his girlfriend. They probably didn't have chemistry. Vanessa shrugged it off like a dating expert. Which makes him the best candidate. Now that he's single, he'll be dating again. And he won't have a girl telling him he can't help you. Let's just go for ice cream and get this over with. Joining the singles class at church would be the best option. But it was jarring. How could she walk into a class where a bunch of single men knew she was there checking them out and vice versa? Worse when no one found her attractive. She'd then either move to another church or stay and live in humiliation. I'll go change. She looked down at her house shorts and t-shirt. She was single and searching. Who knew if she'd run into her future spouse at the ice cream shop? She'd better look presentable. I'll drive us. Vanessa scooted toward the door. Meet me outside in the parking lot. Several minutes later, they drove toward Soft Swirl. The small brick building had a long line snaking through the door, so Vanessa dropped Serafina off to hold them a spot in line while she parked. The air smelled briny, the Kelpie sea scent mixing with different body odors when Serafina joined the line. At least a refreshing evening breeze whisked over her shoulders, and her off-shoulder white dress with a wide elastic band around her waist suited an ice cream outing. Too bad she didn't have saddle shoes for the perfect 1950s soda shop ensemble. She wiggled a bit as the wire in her strapless bra pinched over her left breast. She glanced around to make sure no one was watching before she shifted her purse to her right hand so she could adjust the bra through the cotton sateen material. People chattered as they stopped in line behind her, 
At the entrance, a couple walked out with ice cream cones. Then a family followed with bowls, and others held milkshake cups with the soft swirl logo. Her mouth watered. She discovered the shop when one of the parents had given her a gift card. She had to pay extra to get an ice cream cone, but it had been worth every swirl. With people occupying all the outdoor benches under the red umbrellas, Serafina peered through the shop glass window, scoping out a possible spot where they could eat their ice cream. With it so packed, they might be eating their ice cream while standing. Serafina? Is that you? At the familiar male voice, her heart jolted, and she whipped her gaze from the window and to... Oh no. Greg? Time stood still. Serafina tightened her grip on her handbag. Her palms grew moist. She tried to open and close her mouth. Sun-kissed hair, green eyes, and oh so very muscular and handsome. Her gaze moved to the butter pecan ice cream he held in the clear bowl. I see. I, you still like butter pecan? I can't seem to stay away from this place. She'd brought him when she learned it had the best ice cream. I'm glad you like it. She'd have to thank Vanessa for dragging her here today. Maybe God wanted her to come here for this moment. You two know each other? Serafina blinked, waking from the trance, and took in her surroundings and the redhead standing beside Greg. Perky with stylish short hair. Honey? A fondness dipped into Greg's voice when he turned to his companion. This is Serafina. He then put his hand on the woman's lower back. Serafina's gaze dragged from the woman's rosebud lips to her snug tie neck top, too tight for her petite frame, and her extremely short jeans showcasing her thighs. Serafina had never felt so insignificant, especially when the woman introduced herself to stake her claim. I'm Isla, Greg's girlfriend. Serafina blinked, then stared at Greg for confirmation. He shrugged his left shoulder. The woman slid an arm around Greg's waist to confirm her statement. Serafina patted her hair, suddenly hot. Why hadn't she kept her hair down? Okay, a ponytail was probably better than leaving it down so it wouldn't betray her wild curls. Please, Lord, let me disappear. The line was moving and she wanted to use an excuse to move along, but the people behind her sidestepped and followed the line, leaving her to fend for herself. What happened to Greg's excuse when he ended their relationship in February? I need a break from dating. I want to focus on advancing my career. He'd said that, verbatim. That and all sorts of reasons she couldn't remember. It sure didn't look like he even attempted to advance his career. He'd probably been seeing Isla before he broke up with Serafina. A sharp pain pierced through her chest and she faked a smile, feeling out of place. You're here by yourself? Greg asked as if taunting her. Um, Serafina, there's been a change of plans. She'd never been so happy to hear Vanessa's voice. Vanessa slipped into place beside her, then grabbed her hand and tugged her out of the loose line. Wait! Vanessa frowned from Serafina to Greg, as if just noticing his presence. Vanessa waved to Greg and his companion. What a small world! I wouldn't have guessed of all places you'd be here. Best ice cream in. Would love to stay and play catch up! Vanessa cut Greg off. But my boyfriend and Serafina's new boyfriend had last minute changes for munchies. Double dates are hard to coordinate. Without giving Greg the time to respond, Vanessa started walking, tugging Serafina along. It was nice running into you. Isla's words bounced off their backs, followed by Greg uttering his goodbye. Doubt and dread danced in Serafina's mind. Now Greg would think she'd been seeing someone else behind his back. Double dates? She spoke for Vanessa's ear alone as she fought the urge to turn and see if Greg was staring at her. Maybe he was having regrets about leaving her, now that they'd run into each other. You're welcome, by the way. Vanessa let go of her hand as they turned to the sidewalk. Serafina switched her purse to the other hand. She'd keep mum until they made it to Vanessa's grand caravan. Her friend preferred driving a minivan with extra space when she supplied her food truck. The dents on the car made it a perfect fit for their apartment parking lot. Investing in a nice car wouldn't be wise when you parked it at their complex. The less attractive the car, the fewer chances of it being broken into. Seriously? Serafina slumped against the seat while fastening her seatbelt. Vanessa started the car and faced Serafina with an upraised brow. Seriously yourself? Are you seriously still interested in Greg? No? Then why had she blocked out everyone around her, including his girlfriend, the moment she saw him? She crossed her arms. I don't know. Okay, girl. Vanessa pulled out her phone and her fingers scrolled on the screen. I'm dropping you off to Logan's right now. You need to move on. After this episode, 
Either you ask Logan to be your coach or I will do it, but it happens tonight. How could Serafina argue? After the way she crumbled in front of her ex, she did need to move on. Forget all the reasons Logan shouldn't be her dating coach. She rubbed between her eyes. Did you see his girlfriend? With no sense of style. He's so handsome. It hurt. He put on a few pounds. You can do better than Greg. Vanessa tucked her phone into the dashboard holder. It displayed Logan's address. She'd been to Logan's house whenever Serafina invited her to tag along. The minivan would be out of place in the cove, but Logan wouldn't care. He had a reserved parking space for Serafina next to the five cars in his garage. Maybe she needed to look more beautiful. Different. She barely registered the activity of cars they drove past, nor the sky as the sun started to fade. Not when her mind whirled with insecurity. I still can't believe how fast he found my replacement. We need a strategy for your dating life. Vanessa kept her focus intent on the road, showing no interest in talking about Greg. Serafina's dating strategy included making changes to her appearance. How would I look with short hair? What are you going to tell Logan? Too bad Serafina had plenty of questions too. What am I going to do? Stick to our original plan. Plans to have ice cream. Ice cream never sounded better. To drown in her self-loathing. But Vanessa was driving towards skyscrapers, far from soft swirl. Something trickled down the back of Serafina's throat. Regret? She swallowed it. Your coupon expires today. Ice cream is the least of my problems right now. I can't believe you've already forgotten our destination. Oh, right. Serafina touched her forehead. It felt warm. Was she going to be sick? Logan's house. She'd have to force him to be honest about what changes she needed to make to her appearance. To make things easier for you, I'll wait in the car while... Vanessa cut through her thoughts as luxury residential buildings came into view. This part of the bay was like the land of wealth, a gem in San Francisco. Serafina still struggled to see Logan any different from the scrawny boy she'd met years ago. The friend she loved and respected for his loyalty and kindness. You can drop me off. You have work tomorrow. Her problem shouldn't be dumped on Vanessa. What if Logan's not home? She'd wait until he returned. I'll call an Uber. But Logan would be home. He didn't go anywhere on Sunday evenings, unless it was an emergency. Chapter 5 Serafina took the private elevator to the 56th floor. When she stepped out onto a walnut-paneled lobby, her heart started racing. Seriously, was she going to ask Logan to be her dating coach? No. She closed her eyes, inhaling the scent wafting from a fresh bouquet on the glass table. Opening her eyes, she walked toward the glass wall and took in the gorgeous, unobstructed views, the water and sky tinted with shades of pink, gray, and orange. She couldn't interfere with his Sunday evening. It wouldn't be fair. She turned around, staring at the door. What would she tell Jonah if she went back downstairs so soon? The doorman knew Logan was home, so she couldn't return within minutes either. Before she could talk herself out of it, her sandals patted the tile when she crossed to the door and opened the box, lifting her hand into the small screen. The door clicked and pushed open, closing behind her. Technology was scary at times, yet convenient on days like today when she was double-minded. The house smelled so clean, as opposed to the smoky scents invading her complex, regardless of how many essential oils she infused through her diffuser. Three abstract paintings of modern art lined each side of the long hallway, probably created by Logan's sister-in-law. Natural light from the living room windows brightened the hallway. Serafina set her bag on the hard wood and slab marble floor, then crouched to slide out of her sandals. She didn't intend on staying long, so she didn't bother to put her shoes in the closet. Standing straight below the high ceiling, she stared at her reflection in the double wall mirrors across from the front door. Modern instrumental music played softly in the background. Logan was home. Unlike on weekdays when his house was active with employees bustling about, Sundays were extremely quiet while he gave his workers the day off. Even the driver and chef who stayed at his house had Sundays off. Logan must be reading or responding to emails, catching up before he started the work week. She scowled at her reflection as she untied her hair, then pulled it above her neck. Short hair might not be a bad idea. Logan's laughter broke through the music and she stepped away from the mirror. 
as long as she didn't startle him by announcing her presence, though he'd startled her more times than she could remember when he showed up unannounced. When she made a left churn, she basked in the warmth the way she felt whenever she came to his house. With floor-to-ceiling windows in the living room that adjoined the kitchen and dining areas, the place seemed to float as a world of its own above jaw-dropping panoramic views of the bay and Golden Gate Bridge. Cream and khaki-colored sofas somehow blended into the smoggy clouds, while earthy tones for the walls with blue accents tied into the ground and the sea below. She didn't need a tour of San Francisco while his penthouse had 360-degree views of the city. Little wonder his house was one of the highest-priced properties in the city. But it was close to his work, and the five-bedroom and six bathrooms came in handy when half his family visited at the same time. She ran a hand along the sofas and faced the sliding glass doors to his home office, where three desks each offered a laptop and a chair. Beyond the tables, the walnut bookshelf carried the business and finance books Logan read from time to time. His voice drifted her way when she passed a bookshelf. His back to her, he was pacing at the expansive marble slab island. With that boyish grin, he must be talking to his mom. Broad shoulders stretched out a white t-shirt that emphasized his lean muscles. His rumpled hair was shiny, slightly damp, as if he just showered before he called his mom. Try to think about it, darling. His mom's voice sounded through the smart speaker on the island, next to the bouquet of colorful flowers. Mother. He tossed his head back and ran a hand through his brown hair. I'll surprise you. You'll see. Serafina stood by the frameless cabinets across from him, the last of the daylight slipping through the walls of windows, natural evening light casting a radiant glow to the immaculate kitchen. She wiped imaginary dust from the white marble slab, not even an ounce of dust. Only the diffuser she'd bought Logan cluttered the long counter. He only used it when she visited, filled it with water and essential oils, and turned it on. She approached the counter and stared up at a mirror above the cupboards. The house was fully furnished when he moved in, which explained all the mirrors he didn't ask to be installed. She likely used his mirrors more than he did, especially tonight as she contemplated a complete redo of her appearance. Reaching for the hair tie, she fumbled to take it off again. Goodness! She jumped, dropping her hands and churning at Logan's panicked screech. I tried not to spook you. So much for standing nearby, so he didn't assume someone had broken into his house. I thought you don't leave your house on Sundays. Who's that? His mom's voice sounded through the speaker. Having paled, Logan waved a shaky hand toward the speaker. It's just Sarah. You didn't tell me she was there. She wasn't here earlier. Apparently scaring me is her favorite thing to do. I don't believe you. A smile lifted Serafina's cheeks, and she approached the island by the speaker, sidestepping one of the bar stools. Hi, Regina. Hello, sweetheart. Regina's motherly tone warmed her. I've had a hard time keeping Kyle out of your toffee. Oh, that's good. I made and shipped it with him in mind. Well, he loves it, and I loved the clusters you sent last month. Serafina braced her elbows on the island, leaning closer to the speakers. I got the handwritten thank you cards you sent both times. You didn't have to take the time to do that. It was so sweet. But I know how busy you are. She could listen to Regina's kind voice for hours, basking in the love the woman offered to all in her care or sphere. Serafina's mom, although nice, had been whipped by life's obstacles and barely knew how to offer love anymore. But I better hang up, Regina laughed. I'm sorry for hogging Logan, dear. I didn't know you were in the house. Logan and I were... Mother wants to know if you'll stay the entire week at the reunion. If I don't stay all week, Serafina eyed Logan and waited while a half grin spread across her face. Who'll laugh at Logan when he burns down the kitchen? Logan's eyebrows shot up. She winked and ducked her head back to the speaker. I'll be looking forward to seeing you at the reunion, Regina. I'll let you and Logan continue now. I didn't mean to interrupt. You mean scaring me half to death, Logan said before moving and resting his hands on the counter. 
Deciding the mirror was a good place to hang out, Serafina returned to her spot. She loved listening to the tender way he spoke to his mom. His genuine laugh was sweet and carried a childhood innocence. A childhood he'd have lost had Regina and Kyle not worked hard to revive it when they adopted him. Do we need to install mirrors in your house? She turned too fast, heat burning her cheeks when Logan ambled toward her. The corners of his eyes crinkled with a knowing smile. I'm under the impression you showed up for something else, rather than the mirrors. He was on to her before she even worked out her approach to ask him. She let out a sharp exhale and gripped her hands on the counter. Can't I come and visit my friend whenever I want to? He thrust his hands into his shorts pockets. The subtle scent of his conditioner smelled crisp. Sarah, I have to bribe you to get you out of your house on Sunday evenings. She glanced at the oven across from the island and squinted to see the digital numbers in green displaying 626. She couldn't come up with a response fast enough. Logan rubbed the trim beard on his chiseled jaw. You could have called or texted. True. When those deep brown eyes pierced into hers, she blurted, I ran into Greg today. Okay. Logan's forehead crinkled with a frown, his jaw clenching. He came to your house? With that protectiveness in his tone, he might just call his security team to hunt Greg down for trespassing. No. There was a reason she never went out on Sunday evenings. Running into her ex was going to ruin her week. Vanessa talked me into going for ice cream. I wanted a party cake cone. Greg had a redhead. She spun around to face the mirror. She's a model with short hair. She held her hair on top of her head and yanked out the hair tie. Maybe she was old school. Do I look like a mom? Logan drew out a long groan. He'd heard her self-pity far too many times lately. Sarah. Sarah. Through the mirror, she watched him move to stand behind her, his chin hovering over her head as he pinned her with those brown eyes. His fingers rubbed up and down her arms, and while it shouldn't have awoken every bit of her skin, goosebumps blossomed on her body. Given he'd just showered not long ago, his hands were warm, but for an entirely different reason, an unfamiliar rush of warmth coursed through her as he stared at her reflection as if thinking of a response as if assessing the unusual awareness now crackling in the air. She dismissed whatever it was and directed her gaze to her reflection. It was Greg's fault that her mind was spinning in uncharted territory. You are a nurturer, Logan said. A kindergarten teacher, which shouldn't be a surprise when you have motherly instincts. He was brutally honest with her at times, so of course today would be no different. But I don't want to be a mother. No, she wanted to be a mom, with a family of her own. I mean, do I look old? He frowned. You shouldn't worry about what others think about your looks. You are you, beautiful. Your identity should be in God. Have you forgotten this morning's service already? Hmm. Oh, yeah. The pastor spoke about identity. Identity in Christ. But when he'd spoken, she hadn't encountered Greg or his girlfriend. She'd been fine with her identity then. Now? Now she wished she was different. Logan was right, though, so she nodded her understanding. She could lean on her identity in God, although deep down, she doubted she was attractive. But she didn't need to be, right? She was supposed to reflect Christ, not her physical appearance. She bit her lip. Not sure how she could go about that. Through the mirror, she noticed Logan watching her again, reflectively as his frown unfolded from his forehead. She shivered and might have scared him with her reaction. Come on. He tipped his chin toward the kitchen island, moving his warm hand away from her shoulders. Have you eaten yet? I'm fine. She had frozen dinner bowls in the freezer, saved for Sunday nights but Vanessa had shown up before she'd eaten. How's Chewy? He put his hand to the touchless cabinets above the counter, and they automatically slid open, sensing his arm. He's at the sitter. Serafina pulled out one of the bowl-shaped bar stools 
and flopped onto the seat as she told him about Vanessa's arrangement for the dog before their ice cream shop visit, and then the sudden change of plans. Logan set two cereal containers on the island, Wheaties and chocolate checks, and her mouth watered. She pushed back the stool to get the bowls while he snagged the spoons from a drawer. So you were telling me why Vanessa dropped you off? He walked to the built-in side-by-side refrigerator, swung it open, then grabbed a glass milk jug. Do you think I'd look good with red hair? She poured the chocolate checks. He shook Wheaties into his bowl before she handed back the milk. You're a natural brunette. Why? She bobbed her spoon in the cereal. How about short hair? You can do whatever you want with your hair. He slid onto the bar stool next to her, then reached for his spoon and pointed it toward her. Just do it for you, for the right reasons. Remember, you are a daughter of the king. Anyone who makes you feel you're not a princess, well, you're better off without him, if he's making you doubt anything about yourself. Talking about Greg wasn't why she'd come, so she initiated a prayer for their cereal and switched the subject the moment he added his amen. Mom called. She spooned her cereal and brought it to her mouth. The chocolate and milk all but melted in her mouth. I forgot to tell you that she called me, too. She bobbed some checks, getting them properly saturated with milk. I'm concerned about the monthly allowance you promised her. If she's got money around, well, I don't want her to get tempted and pick up her gambling or drinking habits again. Logan nodded, his expression now serious. I made sure she believed I had people keeping tabs on her. He could hire investigators on her mom, but he wouldn't unless it was necessary. No doubt mom believed him, though. He nudged her arm with his elbow. I could tell she longs to see you. I sense such sadness in her voice every time she mentioned you, Sarah. Serafina blew out air. She'd sensed it, too, but she needed to be done with school before she could mentally connect with her mom. I plan to visit her as soon as the school year ends. I can have the jet bring her to see you next weekend. She shook her head, her mind a whirl with scenarios on what she and mom would talk about for an entire weekend stuck together in her house. Hold off on that, please, but thank you. Overcome with gratitude, she turned to look at him. Thank you for taking care of her. So, you and Vanessa, why did she give up on ice cream and drop you off here? He spooned his cereal and scooped it into his mouth. No surprise, he changed the topic. He'd never learned how to accept praise without squirming. And speaking of squirming, if Serafina didn't tell him now, Vanessa seemed serious about doing it for her. Serafina lifted a spoonful to her mouth, chewing before scooping another and another, chewing with a mouthful as anxiety built up in her belly. Slow down. His house shoe tapped her leg when he kicked her. Vanessa and I have been talking about getting back into dating. She spoke with a mouthful, no need to be ladylike with him, and he had good hearing. Isn't that what you've been doing for these last months? The spoon clinked in his bowl when he scooped more cereal. She swallowed, then braved raising her gaze to his. Like real dating? Needing to do something besides eating, she fiddled with her nails. Too bad the nail polish she had applied that morning wouldn't make it to Monday. She peeked at him. Great. A scowl pinched his forehead the way it did whenever he got into deep thinking. Define real dating. Why was he making this more complicated than it already was? She groaned and spooned up some milk, which was now brown due to the chocolate checks. If you haven't noticed, I've reached my prime and I'm still single after a handful of dates. A handful was putting it gently. She'd lost count of how many she'd been on and it was probably for the best that she couldn't remember. What you need is to take a break. Nope. She wasn't giving up without trying. This was a serious matter. She shoved the cereal bowl further away in case her hands started moving all over when she blurted out what she needed Logan to do. Brings me to why I came here. She scowled at the flowers as she tinkered with her fingernails. I need you to be my dating coach. Wet residue splattered her shoulder when Logan coughed before covering his mouth. Mercy. She'd made him choke. She slapped him on top of his back. 
Are you okay? Are you out of your mind? The hand covering his mouth muffled his voice. When he uncovered his mouth, he gaped at her with wide eyes. Maybe I didn't hear you right. You heard me. He shook his head, seeming to have lost his appetite as he slid the bowl closer toward the center. I'm not sure I did. Now that the big topic was out there, she felt lighter and bold enough to clarify her request. You date all the beautiful models, and you name it. I want to look nice. How could she put it into words? I mean, teach me how not to be awkward. I want to know what men want in women, you know? Logan appeared to be deep in thought as the V furrowed between his brows. He scratched his bearded chin, then cast a glance back at her. I'll teach you on one condition. Seriously? The battle was going to be over that easily? She sat taller. Anything. You help me plan a reunion, and I'm in. A reunion for like 60 people? It wasn't just their family members, but friends and exchange students who'd become family. The siblings took turns coordinating the reunion, and although they could afford the siblings took turns coordinating the reunion, and although they could afford catered food, one of the requirements was for the organizer to cook one dinner and dessert during the week-long gathering. Sometimes a hundred or more. Depends on people's schedules each year. Maybe a hundred or more plus one. If you walk me through dating, I might have a serious boyfriend by midsummer and bring my very own plus one. Grinning, she stuck out her hand. Deal. Logan reached for her offered hand and gave her his strong handshake. He shook hands often with business members, so a good handshake was pretty much a professional requirement. Deal, he said as they unclasped their joined hands. Let me get my dating stuff done with. He slapped the marble island. What men need, number one. He lifted a finger close to her face. Confidence. His eyes twinkled. Number two. Another finger joined the first one. Confidence. Grinning now, he took a deep breath. Number three. He wiggled three fingers at her, as if she were one of her students playing a counting game. Confidence. Very simple. Not for her. He stood obviously pleased with himself. No way, bozo. She jabbed a fist against his shoulder. Planning a reunion is going to take me several hours. Weeks. And I still have to make gift bags for the kids' graduation and teacher presents. I'll have Emma order the presents for the teacher and kids for you. But then she wouldn't feel like she gave them anything. It's so impersonal. He threw his head back, his brow pinched. Why are you making this so complicated? I expect you to walk me, step by step, through the rules of dating. He gritted his teeth, so she held up both hands, stopping his groan. I'm not making this up. Vanessa's aunt had a dating coach, by the way, and she had to go on real fake dates. That explains why Vanessa was acting all weird last night. This was her idea. It hadn't been Vanessa's idea for Serafina to start online dating, but maybe her friend was onto something here. It doesn't matter, but I need step-by-step -step coaching sessions. Whatever that meant. I can find real fake dates after you walk me through. There's no such thing as real fake dates. Logan crossed his arms. Real and fake can't go together. It's an oxymoron. He might need a little nudge. We start tomorrow. We have dodgeball. Ugh. They had dodgeball on Tuesday, too. Perhaps tonight she'd research trendy fashions and then shop online for some new clothes. Wednesday, my apartment. I need a closet makeover. You need a fashion expert, not me. He reached for his bowl, then walked around the island to take her bowl with the leftover now soggy cereal. I can have one sent your way. Just say when. He carried the bowls and set them in the sink. Text me what time works for you on Wednesday. She'd taken up a lot of his time. I gotta go. She needed to schedule an Uber, but she didn't want to let Logan know her intentions.
he'd end up insisting on giving her a ride. Sorry again to interfere. Didn't Vanessa drop you off? Yeah, but I'll be fine. She waved him off as she started walking toward the dining area and living room. You have early meetings. That meant he'd start his day less than eight hours from now. I'm taking you home. His footsteps scuffled on the tile. If I can't take you home tonight, then I'm not going to be your coach or whatever. Real mature for blackmail. Her voice bounced through the house. Before she made it through the expansive living room, Logan's voice sounded not far from her, and she churned. He grinned, lifting the car-shaped key fob for his BMW. Ready? He always meant business when he insisted on doing things for her. Could she find a man like him who had dreams and plans like hers? Chapter 6 Serafina's crazy proposal had left Logan restless and interfered with the six hours of sleep he normally got. He'd sensed an odd current between them when he looked at her through the mirror and her gaze had softened. Or was it all in his mind that she'd shivered as he put his hands on her bare shoulders? No, he was exhausted and caught off guard by her visit. Perhaps his mind had been foggy. Either way, what advice was he going to give her when he had a lousy love life? Serafina knew his dismal dating record, yet she'd asked him to be her coach. He didn't have time to dwell on being a coach and whatever that entailed when he had a busy week ahead. With the time difference at some of Stone Enterprise's locations and then his own companies abroad, he had back-to-back -back meetings on Monday. He started his day at 1.30 for a 3 a.m. virtual meeting with his international teams. The extra hour and a half allowed him to work out, pray, and read the Bible, then browse through the Wall Street Journal before he sat at his office for the meeting. Even getting up this early, he needed his regular morning routine to get his mind in gear. Three men, the president and assistant at Singapore offices, and a woman, Nina, the accountant, were seated around the mahogany table. They'd preferred a later meeting after their office closed to update Logan on the wealthy man who wanted to buy out a small bank in the remote community. And needing to be kept up to date on the day's proceedings, he'd agreed. Tinda is greedy, Logan said, knowing the man's usury intentions toward his borrowers. Money had never been the driving factor for Stone Enterprises. Logan's job was to make sure the company stood by its values, to help people in every country based on their abilities. He focused on Nina, arrange a meeting with the owners, and find out their vision for the company. As my team leaders, you need to take measures in advising the business owners. If it's money they need to stay in business, then Stone Enterprises will see to it that the small business doesn't shut down. If they are intent on selling, then double Tinta's offer to buy the bank. Whatever it takes, just make sure he doesn't take over the small community. While they made money, Stone Enterprises took on pro bono clients who needed trust funds. They also advised businesses with financial planning and management. When he hung up with the Singapore team, he swiveled to another desk facing the bookshelf. Having multiple computers in his home office was necessary when he had back-to-back -back virtual meetings. And after he'd been out of the country, focused on the Italy deal, he'd let things get backed up. He'd set the computers up last night, so now all he needed to do was click Enter Meeting to chat with their Tokyo team. Today's meeting should be easy with the financial manager and vice president, giving him an analysis of the financial year for the physical year. Otherwise, they just needed his approval to go ahead with opening the new bank. The third meeting in Moscow took longer as they discussed the challenges with the sudden drop in stocks that week. He could only assure them to keep doing what they did. The banking and financial industry was a roller coaster. Stocks could collapse, and they'd lose a lot. But when stocks went up, business was always booming. It was always a game of give and take. By the time he'd concluded the meeting, it was 6.40. Glad he'd only did meetings this early a few times a month, Logan closed the computers one at a time, stood and adjusted the collar of his white shirt. The rising sun cast a vivid orange glow, a pleasant sight, sprinkling over the city and sparkling off skyscrapers. 
He didn't have to text his driver to know Kosal was waiting in the garage. He could see the office glass from his apartment, but even if he could walk to work, he preferred to be driven so he could type and respond to emails and messages. He stepped out of the office, his mindset to work mode as notifications vibrated from his phone in his coat pocket, probably reminders of the meeting scheduled at the office. He followed the smell of savory food through the living room, and his dress shoes clicked on the marble tile as he crossed the 7,000-square-foot living space. When he entered the kitchen, Heather greeted him with a smile and lifted the lid from a pan on the stove, the savory smell tempting him to sit and devour her delicious breakfast. Just 15 years older than Logan, the woman was talented. He winced as he eyed three pots with clear lids, poached eggs and all the veggies he preferred to have with his breakfast. Everything is ready. She straightened her apron before pulling a plate from the cabinet. I can't sit and enjoy your scrumptious breakfast this morning. He switched his computer bag to his other hand, then snagged one of the bran muffins with peppers and spinach from the plate. He'd been hesitant to try vegetable muffins, but after one test, he'd been sold on her muffins and everything she cooked. A healthy breakfast was the most important meal of his day, but if he sat down, he'd be cutting it short for the 740 meeting. You're going to be hungry. I'll eat your breakfast for dinner. He whispered a prayer of thanks before he bit into it. Even with all the seating areas in the house, including the bar stools around the island and the 12-seat dining table, he couldn't sit down to enjoy a meal sometimes. Cabinets opened and closed when sensors went off as Heather pulled out more dishes. I'll make you a protein shake for the road. Logan swallowed and raised a hand to stop her. I'll have lunch early today, if he could afford a long break for a meal. He wished Heather a great day and headed out. Taking the elevator to the garage, he didn't need a chef, but after hiring one, he didn't want to cut her job by getting rid of her. Cooking for one person was wasting her talents, especially when he forgot to let her know when his meal plans changed. Sometimes he didn't even know his plans until an unexpected call changed his agenda. Now and then, that meant leaving the country if an urgent matter required his presence with business leaders and council members. His priority as CEO was being visible to his team, and he built his schedule around that. The 100 Stone Enterprises financial branches outside America had been his responsibility before he took over as CEO. Now with hundreds of locations throughout the country, the company had over 10,000 employees, and that alone had his mind spinning during the work week. Further reason he kept his work life separate from his private life, to include mindless activities. Although he had a heart for business, his passion to travel motivated him to invest in the clothing and textile industries and automotive production abroad. But he'd also bought some shares from his brother's company during the startup years in the U.S. As a board member of Stone Enterprises, Logan found nothing more pleasing than helping his brother's company succeed. Once Logan suggested expanding the company outside America, Eric delegated the branching out task to him. Having business connections abroad helped Logan know the requirements of running an international business. Several minutes later at the office, he went over the day's agenda with his executive assistants, then led a strategy meeting with his internal team at corporate. He also had a meeting to encourage his leadership team and give them positivity for the good work they'd done so far. Thanks to his brother's step-by-step -step training and mentorship, Logan felt bolder in his new position with each passing day. Over the next hours, he met virtually with some industry leaders and CEOs of other companies, followed by leadership calls with his sales force and in-person meetings with the chief executives. Then he returned to his office at 1140, grateful for the water on his desk. Although he had a mini fridge in his office stocked with beverages, Emma made sure a water bottle was always on his desk. He twisted off the cap and drank the artisan water, as he took in the San Francisco skyline through the floor-to-ceiling window from his 59th floor. The view never got old. He didn't spend every day in his office, but the times he did, the skyline was always a good distraction whenever he allowed himself to relax. His stomach growled, reminding him he needed lunch, but he had rounds to make to the various departments in the office first. While he was gone last week, the new hires started. 
Since he hadn't met them yet, he needed an opportunity to catch up with new members. When he sat behind the walnut desk, he inhaled the therapeutic scents of lemon and eucalyptus, steaming through the diffuser next to a framed photo of his family. Serafina ensured he had it to relieve stress, and unlike the rarely used diffuser at home, the one at work was always in use. Emma stayed on top of stocking the essential oils Serafina had recommended. He ate the same thing every day for lunch to save him time per using a menu. All he had to do was call Emma and have it delivered. Before making his rounds, though, he turned on the computer to check the names of the new hires. People always lit up when he greeted them by name. A knock rasped on the frosted glass door, and his gaze flicked to the entrance. Serafina pushed the half-open door before he could respond. Surprise! Her sweet voice made his heart thump as she brandished the white bag emanating garlic and all sorts of flavors he hadn't smelled in a while. Her cheerful smile further warmed his heart. She tucked a green button up top with a bow at the neck into a brown retro pattern skirt. She looked stunning with the high-waisted knee-length skirt, showcasing her long legs. Hey! He felt his lips curl. He pushed back his swivel leather chair and stood to move around the table. What's with the surprise visit? Serafina, as well as a couple of his friends and his family, were the only ones allowed to interfere with his meetings. Emma was aware, but as usual, Serafina's abrupt appearances were a welcome distraction. His stomach growled when she set the bag with the Thai Frino logo on his desk. His mouth was already watering. I figured you could use some lunch. He felt the pinch of his frown. How had she known that he was starving? He leaned in to press a kiss on her cheek. Don't you have papers to grade or something? You're welcome. She carried the bag to the dark table next to the white sofa and set her purse on one of its four chairs. I don't have much time. We better eat. While she opened the refrigerator and grabbed two water bottles, he joined her at the table. I'm starving. He touched his stomach, then pulled out two chairs beside each other. I figured as much. She perched herself next to him, having a view of the city. With your early meetings, eating is always the last thing on your mind. No one knew him better than Serafina. What did you bring? He asked. She wiggled a sturdy disposable bowl from the bag and set it in front of him. Pad Thai for you? Cashew stir for me. Greg had broken up with her at Thai Frino, and she'd seemed determined never to eat Thai food again. She'd even asked Logan not to order from their favorite Thai restaurant. I thought we don't eat Thai anymore. Rappers crunched when she ripped open the silverware and handed him a fork and knife. That was then. She opened the lid on her bowl. We're starting over. I'm ready for you to move on. He opened the lid from his food and steam rose, fueling the rich flavors of lemongrass and ginger. He breathed it in, savoring the moment. Good thing she hadn't applied lipstick since Thursday. Could be his comment stuck with her? Lipstick wasn't a problem, but her feelings she needed it to look beautiful bothered him. She pressed her lips together and skewered him with a look. I want you to know I'm serious about needing your help. Oh man, she was serious. Why don't you get a professional dating coach? I can pay. She stirred the fork in her noodles mixed with steak. I'd rather go on fake dates with my best friend than with strangers. His chest tightened at her genuineness. How could he not be her fake date? Let's pray. As she closed her eyes and prayed for their food, he struggled to focus, thoughts whirling on how to be the best fake boyfriend and knock her off her feet. If she understood how special she was, it would boost her confidence. Amen, she said, and he followed hers with his own, wincing over sidetracking during prayer. How did you get the time to pick up food and get it here? Her lunch break started at 11.30 and ended at 10 past noon when the kids returned from recess. She slid the napkins from the bag, handing him one. I called ahead and ordered... The restaurant is on my way over here. She eyed his plate, then stabbed her fork onto a shrimp and lifted it to her mouth. In case I run into traffic, I have backup lessons for my TA.
Joila can manage the class until I get there. Logan gazed at her plate. The meat looked appealing, so he forked a piece of beef and tested it. The delectable flavors were worth him skipping breakfast. It had been a long time since he'd eaten Asian food. His chef could cook anything, but he and Sarah used to have Asian food once a week after one of their dodgeball practices. You're good at finding all the savory food. He tried one of his shrimp. Food blogs. He swallowed, then asked, You still read food blogs? She stopped short of lifting the fork with red and green peppers. Not lately. I've been kind of busy in my little mess. Busy stressing about finding the perfect date. Surely God had someone special for her. She deserved it. Even if Logan were to be a contender, he was out of the criteria on her long list. Thank goodness all he would ever be was a friend, and they were compatible that way. No reason in ruining a good thing. A brief silence passed as they ate, eating off of each other's plates. The peanut sauce sure added extra flavor to the vegetables in the noodles. He sipped his water to wash down the food before he asked about her students. Oh my, Lily said the funniest thing today. Her shoulders were already shaking as she spoke through laughter. I was teaching about healthy eating and bodies, and I asked if the kids had any questions. Lily raised her hand and asked if she could look at the veins in my arms so she could see inside my body. Laughter bubbled in Logan's belly. It's been a good day. They are all so full of energy. One boy, Joshua, you know him. He's the one I worry about with asthma. Well, he came up to me with his mouth all bloody. Logan stiffened, but she waved a hand. Calm down. He lost a tooth, that's all. He was so thrilled that as soon as we got his mouth all rinsed out, he wanted to write a letter to the tooth fairy so he could know what gift he was swapping for his tooth. Logan laughed. Sounds like he's a little negotiator. He'll make a great employee for Stone Enterprises when he grows up. That he will. He wasn't about to give up that tooth until he knew he was getting a good deal. Listening to the kids' stories always cheered him up. However, he couldn't stop thinking about Eason, since Serafina hadn't said anything about the boy who'd had a black eye on Thursday. Surely Eason didn't say or do anything spontaneous. Logan asked about him, hinting for details if it was necessary. Her face fell and she twirled her fork through her noodles. He's so quiet and sad. I don't know how to cheer him up. Did you find out what happened to his eye? Kids trip all the time. He said he ran into a table. Maybe. But Eason's silence and sadness raised curiosity of all sorts. Food forgotten, Logan narrowed his gaze on her. You think it was an accident? She drew out a breath, shrugging. I came here to talk about this dating coach thing. He knew where to draw the line, so he refocused, shaking his head at the image of the boy in the hands of possible abusers. Let me guess. You want to tell me you were kidding about me being your coach? Not happening. I ordered new clothes. I was hoping you could come over and help me decide what to wear when I go on dates. You were always the one who wanted to go to fashion school. You're the one who should be giving advice. But I can send my designer to help you if you want. If she wanted to shop, he'd get an expert for her. He wouldn't mind paying all the expenses. I don't need an expert. If you need my opinion, he reached for his food. Your clothes are just fine. They make you, well, you. She pinned him with her dazzling eyes. This is me, trying new things. He was on board with her moving forward, if she wanted to for herself. What he wasn't sure he'd pull off was giving her the right advice. He knew how to take a woman on a date. He'd never had a problem with that. Even when he did it half-heartedly, his dates hadn't complained. We have dodgeball practice tonight. I doubt you'll make it to practice tonight. You started your day too early. He may need a nap, but that would be later. His fault for scheduling extra practice. They continued eating as she suggested things and approaches to their coaching sessions. You just worry about your part. I'm your teacher, remember? 
She sat upright and clasped her hands together. Okay, I won't tell you what to do anymore. She pushed to her feet and he stood, reaching for her bowl with remnants of peppers and noodles. But she snatched the bowls from him and dropped them in the bag. I'll take my trash with me. I don't want to leave any trace of Thai food in your office. She bent and, using a napkin, wiped the condensation that had dripped onto the table. Even if arguing with her was a waste of time, he'd never stop trying. You know the office will be cleaned in a few hours. Doesn't hurt to have it pre-cleaned for the cleaner. Funny how she always wanted to keep things tidy whenever she was in someone else's space, but at her place, she let her guard down. Or maybe by the time she got home, she was just too spent to keep organized. After walking her to her Fiat with plans to pick her up for dodgeball practice, he waved and watched her drive until her orange car turned a corner. Then he returned to his office, rejuvenated and exhilarated, to tackle the rest of the day. Oddly, he was looking forward to being Serafina's dating coach. He may not understand what she expected from a coach, but one thing was clear. By the end of the dating sessions, however many, Serafina would know the difference between a legitimate date and a fake date. Chapter 7 Serafina loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for reasons besides its tripling taste of cream, salt, and sweet. And they were perfect for lunches like today, when she ate at her desk to upgrade schoolwork or plan the next day's lessons, so she didn't take work home. She bit into her sandwich and chewed as she skimmed the reunion list she typed in her notes app. The scratch of pencil on paper whispered into the silence, as one of her students, Ezen, sat in his chair surrounded by empty seats. He was content drawing, but God only knew what troubled the little boy. He'd been blessed with talent, but her heart went out to him. He should be outside playing with other kids. After her students left the cafeteria, Jalela brought Eason back to the classroom, as the boy had requested. In just over three weeks, the school year would end, and the kids would move into first grade. But in the whole school year, she hadn't figured out Eason, as well as she had the rest of her students. He wasn't even interested in feeding the class goldfish, like all the other kids fought to take churns. Serafina handed him crayons and paper instead since he loved drawing more than listening to her rambling about counting and making sounds. What was his home life like? His parents never signed up for either of the conferences she had during the year. He'd also missed the two kindergarten programs she had that year, which always offered an opportunity to meet the kids' parents. Okay, so not all the kids' parents showed up at the conferences or programs. But something about Eason didn't sit right. Sadness seeped into his brown eyes, eyes seeming overly large, in his oh-so-pale face. She doubted he showered often. Cold or sunny, he always wore sweats and turtlenecks. According to the principal, Eason lived with his mom. Maybe she was as negligent as Serafina's parents had been, leaving her to fend for herself whenever something exciting came up, and they had to get to the casino right away. She drew out a breath, tearing her gaze away from the boy. She'd been tempted to stalk the bus and follow it to see where he got dropped off. Maybe she would dig deeper, before the end of the school year. She took another bite of her sandwich, then refocused on the number charts and kids' paintings on the back wall. Then the dangling alphabet letters and animal pictures strung on a cord across the classroom. All those nearly blocked the windows from her view, but natural light glided in. She glanced back to her list, moving her finger on the phone screen as she perused it. If memory served her right, she'd remembered everything from the stone reunions. She just hadn't started organizing this one yet. Instead, consumed with her dating life, she'd spent hours online shopping since Sunday. After that, she had to browse Pinterest for billionaire reunion ideas, in comparison to what she'd observed in the previous stone reunions. She'd met all of Logan's family and been to each reunion since they started hosting them five years ago. But being responsible for planning was intimidating for someone like her, who was far from wealthy. Each year was different, some bigger than others. They'd had photographers and musicians. Last year, they'd brought in a jazz band. What if they did karaoke this year? She'd have to ask Logan, 
After all, planning this event was his responsibility. She closed the notes app and clicked a fashion app. The shipment notification reminded her that two boxes arrived last night and were still in her bedroom. Her impulsive visit to Logan's office two days ago wasn't just to make sure he had lunch, but also to ensure he'd taken her seriously. She reached for her milk carton, her hand brushing against the diffuser, emanating steam of mint, lavender, and lemon essential oils. She sipped from the straw, then took another bite of her sandwich, savoring the scrumptious combination of peanut butter and jelly sandwich with milk. The time on the corner of her phone showed 12.08. The kids would be bustling into the classroom in seven minutes. She dabbed a napkin on her mouth, then tossed it with the sandwich bag into the trash can under her desk. Her phone vibrated with an incoming message from Logan. Excitement bloomed in her chest as she swiped to read it. Logan, still on for the fashion show tonight? Serafina, counting on it. Logan, be there after six. I'm bringing dinner. She was planning on ordering pizza. She didn't have time to cook a decent meal tonight. She should be offering dinner, but when he suggested dinner, he was usually craving a specific meal. Serafina, see you. His presence always filled the empty recesses of her heart. He was family, and loving him was easy, since she'd known him most of her life. She slid the phone into her purse under the desk, stood, and walked toward the door, stopping at Eason's desk. You still doing okay, sweetheart? He sat up, tossed the crayon aside, and dragged his paper from the desk. He probably didn't want her to see his artwork, but that was okay. Eason shook his head, then nodded before lifting the paper and handing it to her. She gave the colorful figures a cursory glance. It wouldn't be the first coloring he'd given her, so she asked, Is it for me? He nodded. The black spot on his eye had turned to a dark shade of green. Logan doubted Eason had bumped into a table. She lowered herself to squat in front of the boy. Thank you. One of the figures on the paper was a man with a beard. Another in the drawing was a young boy. That all made sense. But she couldn't understand the bottles floating in the air. In the hallway, feet shuffled and voices jabbered. Jalela whistled and clapped her hands, indicating the kids should line up. Torn between adding the details of the drawing and rushing to the door where kids were now shoving each other to get into the classroom, Serafina touched the boy's shoulder, his face hinting a ghost of a smile. That was better than the sad face. Jalila called some kids to step back. Serafina strode to the door, tucked Eason's artwork under her armpit, and clapped to get the kids' attention. Torches up! She did the Girl Scout sign, a symbol for peace in this situation. Torches up! Jalila repeated, and a few kids repeated the words, while others fought to shove past her. Go back. She ordered a couple of them, asking them to head to the end of the line. Her expectation before they entered the classroom was to have everyone silent, but a handful often ignored her instructions. Maybe other teachers could have all the kids obey. Serafina was not a great teacher in any way, and the kids' listening was hit and miss. Some days they were good at catching up on things they'd worked on throughout the year, and other days they just weren't cooperative. They were just kindergarteners, most of them from unstable homes, and some slow at grasping things. She always kept that in mind and had the afternoon planned for interactive lessons with games. Kids didn't notice they were learning while they sang songs or played, but they were learning. By this month, most kids had changed so much, but others with long-term behavior issues would make plenty of work for the first grade teacher to continue what Serafina had started. While school was fun for some kids, who sang and cherished Serafina's hugs, for others the afternoons were just like any other day. Eason and two others still wet their pants, and Serafina and Jalila changed them into spare clothes. There were always kids biting and fighting as they sought attention in the wrong way. At the end of the day, though, Serafina wouldn't find any other job as fulfilling as teaching kindergartners. The blow dryer whirled as Serafina held the machine blasting heat onto her hair. Chewy tickled her feet, curled between her legs. The poor pup must be terrified of the noise. But instead of making its way out of the bathroom, the dog clung to her. She ran a hand through her thick curls, still damp, but little Chewy might not make it through more noise. 
After unplugging the dryer and setting it in the wooden cabinet below the sink, she scooped up Chewy and the dog nestled in her arm. I'm sorry I scared you. Next time she washed and dried her hair, she'd close the door so the dog didn't follow her. She'd taken Chewy for a walk at the park when she'd gotten home an hour ago. Now, Chewy wiggled out of her arms. The dog ran for one of the toys littering her bedroom floor. Lately, she had toys in every room, except her project room. The bedroom Logan used on the rare nights he stayed the night. Otherwise, she used it as a sewing room. With the fluorescent light in her room bright, she kept her window closed and the blinds drawn. The outside world didn't need a display while she dressed and undressed during her upcoming fashion show. Although Logan thought she should ask Vanessa for fashion advice, Serafina didn't feel comfortable troubling her friend. She never felt she was troubling Logan, maybe because she was so comfortable with him. They argued at times, but then bounced right back like nothing ever happened. She probably couldn't survive an argument with anyone else. She glanced at the nightstand clock. Hmm, almost six. She crouched and opened the box, then pulled out a handful of dresses and spread them on her bed. She removed leggings, tops, and skirts from the other box. All things she browsed from the online catalog when she typed in modern fashions for women. She rummaged through her hair ties and bands from their holder on her dresser, in case Logan suggested she add anything to her hair. For now, she reached for one of the ties and gathered her hair into a ponytail. The doorbell rang and she peeked at her phone on the dresser. 556. It had to be Logan, but why did he ring the doorbell when he always let himself in? She scooped Chewy up and walked down the hallway to the door. Through the peephole, she eyed the man standing with the red food delivery bag. He was probably at the wrong door. It wouldn't be the first time someone showed up with the wrong delivery at her door. Still, she swung open the door. The man glanced at the paper on top of the box. Serafina Bianchi? Yeah? He unzipped the bag and slid out a square box suffused with savory scents. Pizza. The man's button-down shirt tucked into khaki pants wasn't typical for a pizza delivery guy. Not the kind she'd order. As he handed her the white box with the unfamiliar restaurant logo, it registered. Right, Logan was bringing dinner. He'd probably had Emma order gourmet pizza. Logan shouldn't be far behind. She excused herself to put Chewy in the kitchen, closed the doggy gate Logan installed in the kitchen entryway, then returned to get the pizza. The box was warm in her hands, but her wallet was in her handbag in the bedroom. Let me get your tip. All taken care of, miss. Serafina thanked the man and closed the door, then put the pizza and two plates on the table. She only used her yellow bistro table with its cute chrome soda shop style chairs when Logan came for dinner at her house. Vanessa preferred eating at the bar when she came. Chewy followed on her heels as Serafina shoved a jar of coconut oil, as well as shea butter and glass cylinder bottles and jars, aside so she could reach the paper towels on the counter. The scent of essential oils from the diffuser mixed with garlic and pesto from the pizza to block out the old building's mustiness. She yanked off a couple of paper towels and set them on the table. She almost tripped over Chewy when she returned to the fridge to pull out the ginger tea lemonade she'd made last night for Logan. It was one of the few things she made that Logan loved. She had to do something nice before putting him through the fashion show. Serafina didn't look like Logan's dates, but modernizing her style couldn't hurt, could it? A part of her twinge just a little. Just as she'd finished stirring the strawberry and mint garnish, the front door clicked and swung open and Logan entered. He'd rolled up the sleeves of his white-collared shirt, revealing his muscled forearms. His searing gaze pierced through her like he knew everything about her, more than she knew herself. She swallowed, her heart skipping a beat. They were friends. So why did she need to remind herself of that lately? Smells good in here. You're just in time. Her hesitant response had her blinking and shifting her gaze back to the table. Hey, buddy. Logan crouched to the dog that sprung for him but she'd not paid attention to Chewie's whereabouts. Strange things were happening if she thought her heart leaped for Logan. She always felt warmth at the sight of him, but she'd never had her heart leaping the way it had the day she met Greg at the art auction for kids with disabilities. 
an event Logan had invited her to before he'd been called out of town. After getting Chewie's dinner so he could eat while they ate, she sat on the padded chair to eat with Logan. He prayed for their food, then reached for his lemonade while she flipped open the box. Half the pizza had toppings for him, and the other half was cheese for her. Oh my gooey cheesy goodness, this looks so good. Thank you. Logan saluted her with his now half-empty glass, and his smile met his eyes. You got my lemonade. The fluorescent lights illuminated his tired eyes. How early had he started his day again? At least he'd be sitting for a while. I guess we're even. She pulled out a slice, not setting it on the plate, took a bite, and closed her eyes. Mmm, the garlic and mozzarella cheese were mouth-watering. She might have made a sound because Logan laughed. You've really missed your cheese pizza. He freed a slice of his spinach, artichoke, and tomato pizza, cheesy strings trailing it before he broke them off and took his first bite. Where did you get this pizza? His Adam's apple bobbled when he swallowed before speaking. Apparently, Emma reads food blogs too. Serafina's gaze darted to the bench by the door. He'd picked up a couple of her sandals and placed them on the shoe bench next to his dress shoes. Chewy, having plenty of toys to chew, had finally lost interest in munching on her shoes. Logan could fit her criteria, but he wasn't looking for long-term relationships. Plus, he liked arguing with her, and they were best friends. Period. Besides, technically, he still fell short of her criteria. Sarah! He waved his pizza slice in front of her. She blinked. What? Your day? Great. That was what she needed to ask him, too. I have a reunion list to show you. She pushed back the chair and walked to her bedroom. Chewy, like her much-needed escort, following. When she returned and sat, she tapped the notes app and slid the phone toward Logan. His jaw flexed as he chewed his pizza and scanned her phone. Impressive. You're on top of things more than I am. He had two companies to run. You'd be surprised how the need for dating lessons can motivate me. Remember, I'm not a coaching expert. He scrolled the phone with one hand while using his other hand to eat the pizza. You reconciled Bryce with his wife. If anything, getting his best friend back with Liberty had taken some expertise. It was mostly Iris's plan but I had to lie to Bryce. He winced. Anyway, that was different. He then goffed. Karaoke? She shrugged. She had doubts about it. That's why I put a question mark. I love it. He slid her phone back to her side. I can't wait to see Iris's reaction when she learns we'll have karaoke. Iris, although cheerful, was intimidated by being silly. Serafina had to laugh, too, imagining Iris, the family baby who'd always tried to act as grown-up as her siblings, letting herself play like a kid. Can you think of anything you want added to the list? I've got to go above and beyond Julia's event last year. That was why she added karaoke. She kicked his toes and felt the slippers she'd bought for him so he could feel at home here, given that his feet were always freezing. You and your competitiveness. What's wrong with that? I'll forward this to you, in case you want to start calling for vendors in your town. He was silent as he chewed his pizza, and she bit into hers too. The dog curled beside her feet, his little body warm. I'll call my sister to get us the list of vendors in town. He reached for his glass and finished his lemonade. What do you think of t-shirts for the reunion? He leaned back and rubbed his beard, the hair rasping beneath his fingers. T-shirts? I've always thought it would be cool to have t-shirts. I'll have Emma get with you to chat with the graphic designer for a logo. After school ended, Serafina would have the entire month of June to go through the reunion list. With or without dating lessons, she was honored he trusted her ability to plan his family's event. With his juice already gone, she slid her untouched drink toward him, but he argued about not taking her drink. In the end, they split it in half. Why she'd set up plates when they didn't need them was hard to understand. If you want to start your fashion show, I'll clear the table. 
Logan untucked his shirt and stretched, letting out a yawn. Oddly, he did chores at her house while everything was done for him at his. His gaze wandered to Ezen's drawing on the refrigerator. Logan squinted, studying the drawing. You don't usually display your kids' art on the fridge. She got plenty of kids' drawings. Most she threw away after snapping a photo, intending to print and store them in an album someday. She'd pinned it to the fridge, hoping to get a better understanding of Ezen's drawing. But she hadn't had time to look at it again. He drew that today. Logan's brows drew together as he studied the drawing. The heart with an X could mean there's no love. He then touched the drops on the boy's face. These are tears. Wait, the man? Serafina scooted closer, inhaling Logan's subtle eucalyptus scent. He lives with his mom. From the drawing, it's hard to tell if he desires to have a dad. These wavy things on the man's head, and the arrow could indicate. Logan whipped his head to her. Ezen drew this? Isn't it an incredible drawing for a kindergartner? Logan pointed to the bottles. What if his mom lives with a drunk man who hits Ezen? What do you mean? He's trying to tell you something about his home life. Don't forget the boy's black eye, his turtlenecks, and his refusal to interact with other kids. Logan could be right, but what if he was wrong? Last year, one of the teachers was wrong when he reported an issue of child abuse. Ezen said he fell. That's what his parents told him to say. Logan crossed his arms, leveling a serious gaze on her. Have you met his parents? No, but he lives with his... Isn't this the boy who wets his pants? Logan would have made a good lawyer, but he could be getting too carried away. It's easy for you to think like this because you were... I know, he snapped, his jaw clenching. You don't think I spent hours wishing I had an advocate? An adult who could have read the signs and figured out why I wore sweaters to hide the bruises on my arm? Why I didn't show up to school for days until my face wasn't swollen anymore? His uncle had assaulted a girlfriend in the parking lot, and Serafina's and Logan's lives had changed. Social services had come to get him from school the next day, and she hadn't seen him again until she was 14. She shivered. He'd been nine when she'd caught a big bruise on his back while he was taking off his sweater at the park. His t-shirt had accidentally rolled up, and she had asked what the bruise was. He shouted nothing and changed the subject by sprinting away and telling her the first one to the playground got the swing. She was only a kid then, and nothing had registered until later when she'd heard stories of abuse. Log, I know. She rubbed his shoulder. I'll talk to the principal about Ezen. In awareness training, they were taught, when in doubt, report. Can we start with the... He waved a hand in the air. I'll get the dog down and catch some NASCAR while I'm waiting. She didn't feel like trying on clothes after upsetting him. However, she needed to move things to normal. In her room, she put on the first dress, a flowy cream dress with a slit and v-neck. She hesitated. One hand pressed to the unusually long v-neck. Her bra was almost visible when she looked at her reflection. The online model was stunning in the dress. Maybe it needed the right shoes. She pulled out a pair from the shoe rack. Her heels clicked against the vinyl flooring as she walked back to the living room. Logan was lying on the couch, his gaze intent on the whizzing cars. She cleared her throat as she rounded the sofa to stand in front of him and blocked his view of the TV. He looked up, silent as he studied her too long. Um. She cleared her throat and fiddled with her hair, tucking wisps back into her ponytail. Are you going to say anything? You don't even look confident in that dress. It wasn't the answer she wanted, but she spun around. Of course she'd be uncomfortable in modern fashions she wasn't used to. She'd just have to get used to them. But first, she needed to know how she looked. She faced him, lifting her hands in question. Comments? It's too revealing. Makes you appear desperate. Okay, the slit and v-neck were too revealing. She tossed her head back and started walking to the hallway. You're way too direct. Isn't that why we're doing this? 
Ouch. She couldn't argue with that. Huffing, she tried on another dress. A green scoop neck with a ruffle. The tag pinched against her chest. When she presented herself to Logan, like the expert, he told her to turn around. He yawned, clearly bored. You're better off in your retro. He was tired too. He had such long days. She shouldn't be so inconsiderate. She hugged her arms around her chest, the ruffle tickling them as she ducked her head and spoke to the floor. I should let you go to bed. Not until after I see the rest of the show. When she returned to her bedroom, she tried on a gray top tucked into a red pencil skirt. Logan rolled his eyes. If you're going to an office Christmas party. She then wore a top and tights. That's good for a first date. Phew. They were getting somewhere. She tried on three more outfits, tights, and tops until Logan started frowning. How much did you spend? He knew she couldn't afford all that. I plan to take back whatever you don't approve of. Didn't realize you have a lot of hope in me. You do realize my designer makes my clothes and has them tailored. I don't even choose my own clothes. I'm not talking about your clothes. Seriously, how could he not get this? I don't care what you wear, but you choose women who wear the kind of clothes that get your attention. Let me get this clear. He slouched back on the couch and wagged a finger between them. None of this has anything to do with you trying to rebound? Maybe? As soon as the uncertain response slipped out of her mouth, she pivoted and stomped back to the bedroom. Maybe there was an internal battle that she wanted someone like Greg. Was that a rebound? What was a rebound anyway? She was running out of time, and she needed to get back on track with her life. Weakened by Logan's question, she pulled out one of the two last dresses she hadn't tried on yet. Why would she look good in anything? She felt deflated as she changed into a plum cocktail dress. Soft lace overlaid the top while an off-center ruffle flowed from the waist to the hem, making her want to hold on to it and twirl to watch the layers of skirt balloon out. She looked decent, actually. She felt it somehow, but did she look good? She pinned her hair in a smooth bun and tied it with a black velvet bow before stepping out. When she returned, Logan eyed her up and down, silent as he touched his double chin. His intense and unwavering gaze made her quiver. She rolled her eyes, sick of waiting for whatever quip was coming. What was the point? She turned to leave. Dating lesson number one. At his voice, she spun around and he stood. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. The key to dating is self-confidence. And even if you look stunning in that dress, your eyes are screaming doubt. Of course they were. She nearly stamped a foot. You're staring at me critically. He ambled toward her, then clasped her hand and led her down the hallway to her bedroom. I want to show you something. He positioned her before the full-length mirror, stepped behind her, and gripped her shoulders. These should be high, not down. He spoke with renewed strength, not the man who'd been yawning earlier. Now look in the mirror. She did as asked. What do you see? Her eyes wandered to his reflection, a chiseled jaw dusted with a beard. He was even more handsome with the beard she'd criticized last week to make him second-guess his looks. That hadn't deterred his confidence. How could it? Handsome and rich? No wonder he had always drawn women to him. What do you see? Hmm. I... you? Her response might have been confusing, since she had no idea what she said. No wonder he asked her again. What do you see in the mirror, Sarah? You. Her voice was a whisper. He tapped her shoulder, pointed to the mirror, then stepped away. Try again. What do you see? She looked at her reflection up and down. Her waist was slender, and the well-tailored dress made her curves visible, although nothing was revealed. The dress was comfortable, so yeah. I think I look good. Think? Thinking and knowing are two different things. He stepped behind her again. Being attractive starts by having a good attitude about yourself. When I look at you, I see a kind and fierce woman. As he spoke with such confidence, she could almost believe him. 
I see a woman who wants every child to feel safe and loved and to become who they are meant to be. She snuck a glance at him and their gazes held through the mirror. The light caught the yellow flecks in his brown eyes and something flickering in their depths made her heart do a slow roll. I see a woman who wanted to be a designer, but chose to be a teacher to make a difference in kids' lives. Unwelcome emotion bloomed in her chest, and her vision blurred at the sweetness of his words. It had been a long time since anyone said something that nice about her. Her stomach muscles quivered, and for the first time, she found herself squirming under his unwavering gaze. Silence stretched between them. Then he smiled against her ear. A shiver went down her spine. Did he feel it too? He squeezed her shoulders, stepped back, and leaned against the dresser. What more beauty can a man desire? She stood frozen, tinkering with the strings that held her hair. When you wear that dress, you'd better lose the bun. Makes you look like a stiff person when you're not. Okay. Whoa. She could barely recognize her voice. Her hands shook while she pulled off the ribbon from her hair. Good. His voice was hoarse, and she sensed him looking at her. Now, if you can repeat the words, I look beautiful, that would make this session worth our time. She blew out a breath and turned to him. I thought I was just trying on clothes tonight. He tipped his chin to the mirror. Just look in the mirror and say the words. He wouldn't give up and would probably threaten not to continue coaching her if she didn't do as asked. So she faced her reflection. I look beautiful? Repeat, this time with confidence. She studied her face, free of makeup, and although not far from getting wrinkle marks, she didn't have any bumps. Every so often, she had compliments about her hair. Maybe she wasn't that bad. I'm beautiful. She better be, because God made her. Can you do me a favor? Low and husky, his voice shivered over her. When she looked at him again, she struggled to hold his gaze and stared at his chest instead. Her gaze slipped to his stomach with lean muscles beneath his button down. She'd seen the ripples of his stomach muscles at volleyball, whenever he'd played without a shirt like all the guys on the team did at practice. She just never let her mind wander to what it would be like to have Logan as her boyfriend. Oh no, stop. Her mind was roaming in the wrong direction. Not now. Sarah? Yes, I get it. He let out a stifled chuckle. Clearly you didn't hear what I said. She squared her shoulders, determined to look at him as a friend, and she hoped she did if her wavering voice didn't give her away. What's that? Delete your profile. When we get through the sessions? He made quotes, his face dancing. We'll start a new profile, with a reliable dating company or app. Not that she had any pending date requests on the Simply Dating app. Her profile was starting to look pathetic. I'll use a better photo for my profile next time. He shrugged. Next session is the art of conversation. Friday after dodgeball at my house. It was the semifinals. Even though she dreaded going out on Fridays, she felt at home at Logan's house. Anywhere with Logan was home. Sounds good to me. Night, Sarah. He walked past her and opened the door. Night. He shut the door, no hug or goodbye kiss like usual. Maybe she wasn't the only one affected by this dating session. And what was that thrill of anticipation rushing through her about the next session? This couldn't be good. This was Logan, her best friend. She'd better have him out of her romantic thoughts and entanglements by Friday. Chapter 8 Logan felt as if he was dreaming since Serafina's so-called fashion show. He sensed a threat, a shift in their friendship, and he wasn't sure if he liked it or not. He'd never ogled her the way he had through her reflection in the mirror at his house when she presented the dating proposal and at her apartment when he tried to assure her what he knew to be true. Although he was right, his heart might have gotten more involved in the process when her shoulders tensed and her face blushed as she gazed at him. Blood had rushed through his veins, warmth that screamed danger. It wasn't just Serafina who soaked in his words about her beauty. Even though she hadn't applied lipstick, saying she was beautiful out loud made him notice her full lips, sweet and kissable lips. 
His entire body had quickened as his mind explored thoughts of her he'd never entertained. The moment she looked at him with tears in her eyes, the sight had trickled through every nerve. So he decided not to kiss her on the cheek or hug her goodnight, not trusting himself to withstand any skin contact with her. The sudden attraction should have led him to call off their Friday morning workout, but he'd had to keep their normal routine. He also needed to follow through with the coaching session for another chance, an evening when he wasn't exhausted, to make sure more than weariness stirred romantic feelings. After dodgeball practice, he offered to pick Serafina up for their date. If it's our date, she said, I'm going to pretend we've never met before. Your house is going to be the restaurant. He still insisted on sending Kosal to pick her up, as a friend and not a date. As a friend. Logan had to remind himself as he showered and rinsed his hair. He needed to clear his head of any unwelcome ideas of Serafina being someone else rather than his friend. For that reason, he had dressed casually in faded black jeans ripped at the knee and a gray t-shirt with the puff print words, Product of Grace, across the front. They were his comfortable clothes. He then slipped on his slippers. His feet were always cold, something he'd had as long as he could remember. The last thing he needed was to overdress and make Serafina suspicious. He'd pulled it off at dodgeball practice as he attempted to get her chatting since she'd been reserved. When the speaker on his bed rang, he leaped from the walk-in closet and paced for the bed to answer the call. Did I catch you at a bad time? Bryce Solace asked as soon as Logan answered. After Logan's adoption and move to Pleasant View, Bryce had been his first friend and spent plenty of time with Logan's family. It's perfect. The best distraction to keep his mind from spinning. What's up? Work's finally slowed down this evening, so I thought I'd call. Sometimes it gets crazy working on the logistics of running my business out of state. I'll bet. Try running branches all over the world. Yeah, you could probably teach me a thing or two. I can't say I don't sometimes miss the city's pace, but the kids keep me busy enough. Logan turned off the speaker, reached for his phone, then stepped out onto the balcony. The vivid colors were fading to gray as daylight vanished. He gripped the cool railing with his free hand. How are Liberty and the kids? If I talk about sleepless nights, I might scare you from having kids. Eric has eight of them. I love playing with my nephews and nieces whenever I go to Pleasant View. Doesn't mean you'd love the sleepless nights. Bryce laughed. Seriously, though, kids are a lot of work, but so worth it. At the tenderness carrying in Bryce's voice, Logan twisted his grip on the wrought iron rails, almost jealous of what his friend had. Dimples tends to them more than I do. Ha, told you she was a keeper. I never doubted she was a keeper. Bryce's voice dipped. I just didn't know how to keep her. If it hadn't been for that Christmas miracle. Logan beamed, grateful he'd worked with his sister to reconcile his friends' marriage. Do you have any regrets about leaving New York for Pleasant View? I miss the adrenaline New York offers, but I can't beat the trade of being with my wife and kids here. I'll never regret moving back to our hometown after Dimples and I reconciled. Speaking of my wife, she wants to know how we can help with the reunion. Liberty's voice broke through the kids' voice on the other end of the line. Would you like us to call any vendors? Logan scratched his beard. Sarah's helping me organize. Can we get back to you? Of course. A silence passed between them as Logan rested his arm on the railing. Still pulling off the friend zone? Had he accidentally mentioned Serafina's name in their conversation? Sarah and I will always be friends. Dimples doesn't think so. Logan pushed from the railing and paced. What do you mean? She thinks you two act like a couple. My wife notices things, like how you two finish each other's sentences, or how you see her wrapping her arms around herself and bring her a sweatshirt, or how she jumped to your defense when Wade accused you of eating the last cookie. His friend went on. Apparently, the list was endless of things Logan never paid attention to. Could he and Serafina be a couple? He shook his head to clear his mind as his gaze flickered to the city lights reflecting on the water below. You're supposed to help me set my mind straight. Oops. He stopped himself when he realized he was speaking his thoughts out loud. Huh, Bryce chuckled. I'm starting to think Dimples is right. Even if he and Serafina decided to progress their relationship, he wasn't her type. She was looking for a man who didn't remind her of her childhood and birthdays. Bryce had always told Logan everything. It was high time Logan sought counsel from a friend. Sarah asked me to be her dating coach. She's been having trouble on her dates lately. More like she's been creating trouble on her dates lately. She keeps scaring guys off before she lets them get to know her. So I agreed, in exchange for her helping me plan the reunion. I guess she got the crazy idea from a neighbor. He raked his fingers through his hair. Then he shared his jumbled feelings after her fashion show and what she expected from him as a coach. 
She's coming over for our first session. Bryce let out a slow chuckle as Logan continued. I'm not sure how we're going to handle our friendship if I mess things up. That'll get tricky when you go on fake dates, unless you bring Danica along. We broke up last week. Don't tell me. She gave you the Serafina ultimatum? Yep. That was just one reason, but Bryce knew Logan's flighty tendencies, though his friend never pointed that out. Would it be bad if you fell for your best friend? Bad. It would be a nightmare if he lost her friendship. I'd hate to mess things up. Trust me, every relationship is a leap of faith, a gamble. Someone once told me that. I think it was your brother. Bryce's long exhale thundered through the phone. You saw what Dimples and I went through. If it hadn't been for you and Iris stepping in. God intervened. What he or Iris had done couldn't have mattered if Bryce and Liberty weren't meant to be together. Let's take a quick assessment. What? Who do you spend most of your free time with? Sarah. Why? Logan pinched the bridge of his nose. When you travel overseas, who's the person you look forward to seeing when you come home? Right. He knew what Bryce was doing. Do I need to answer? Who's the one person you'd rather be trapped with on an island? Serafina. To all of the above. But Bryce already knew the answers. Let's not forget that she never misses any of your work events. She cooks your favorite meals and knows your favorite books and shows. She puts up with your quirks and loves your sports and worries about your stresses. She knows your history and has shared all the high and low points of your life. And she jumped on a plane and followed you halfway across the country when you asked her to. Want me to go on with all the reasons you already deeply love Serafina? Logan snorted. I've no doubt I love her. Didn't mean he was in love with her. You can't commit to anyone else because of her. Face it, man. It's a fact. It's just taking a while for your mind to catch up with your heart. That's the problem. If Bryce was right, Logan had no idea how he was going to pretend to date her. For the record, there's nothing wrong with falling in love with your best friend. Still puzzled by their conversation, he let out a nervous chuckle. Huh, I thought you were my best friend. No doubt, but I'm sure Serafina knows things about you that I don't. You're just piling up reasons, yet I have to keep my feelings under control. If you still enjoy each other's company after the ugly fights, there's no need in keeping things under control. All right, Dad. Logan sank into the patio chair, surprised by Bryce's heart-to-heart. -heart. He wasn't too helpful in clearing Logan's mind, while Bryce only ignited Logan's desire for Serafina. When he hung up and returned to the bedroom, he glanced at his phone. Hmm. 708. If Serafina had arrived, she would have peeked into his bedroom by now. What if she changed her mind? Did he want her to? Conflicted between wanting to see her and giving himself space from her, he left his bedroom and headed to the entryway. Each step was more hesitant than the one before, matching his uncertain thoughts. Serafina arrived. He greeted her at the door where he'd been pacing in the hallway, almost crumbling the single rose with his strong grip. Thankfully, the thorns had been trimmed off. The sight of her made him nearly dizzy with longing. Gospel music floated in the background, the kind of music he'd chosen to remind him she wasn't his date. This is for you. He handed her the flower he'd snagged from the bouquet assortment in the kitchen. At this point, your date doesn't know your favorite flower which also meant he shouldn't lean in to kiss her on the cheek like he normally did. But old habits were hard to break. His lips lingered more than necessary as the scent of her conditioner teased his nose, replacing the food scents from the kitchen. While he'd had the best intentions to keep things the way they'd always been, he didn't trust himself to pretend things were still normal. Thank you for my flower. She lifted it to her nose and inhaled deeply. Her dark eyes sparkled under the hallway light. Smells good. She then tossed her handbag on the floor, her ponytail brushing against her mustard yellow dress as she slid off her sandals. He picked up her sandals and handbag and put them in the hallway closet while she tinkered with her fingernails, likely peeling off parts of her fresh white polish. He gestured for her to lead the way. As they walked through the living room, he took in the graceful sway of her curves, the perky white polka dots dancing with her movement. The dress's sash emphasized her slender waist, while the sleeveless top with its keyhole back showed off her toned arms and poised shoulders. Did he have something to do with those shoulders being held high now? Or was it that she felt herself in polka dots? He sped ahead when she approached the table with their food, then he pulled out a chair for her. Her smile was soft when she met his gaze. Thank you. Have I told you how beautiful you are tonight? She touched her neck where the dress scooped, then her bare shoulders. I hope this is okay. He stifled a chuckle and pointed to himself. I should look more presentable. She waved him off. If you haven't noticed, I didn't go for my modern fashions today. Her dress wasn't old school like she assumed, but she looked beautiful in anything. 
All this food. She gestured to the display on the table. He sat at the table's opposite end, with a variety of food spreading out was necessary. Heather went all out. He unfolded the lid and napkin. Whatever we don't eat, Kosol and I will deliver it to the homeless when we drop you off. He didn't mind driving, but on late nights, he'd rather have his driver, who was also his bodyguard, along. Heather reappeared with a bottle of sparkling juice on a silver tray, two glasses, and a pitcher of strawberry lemonade. Serafina slapped her forehead. Heather, uh, I meant to say hello, but I guess I didn't have my mind straight when I came in. So good to see you, Serafina. Heather's cheeks rounded up and her twinkling eyes receded into crinkled folds as she poured sparkling juice into the two fluted glasses, then lemonade into the round glasses. I brought you a spray, Serafina pointed toward the living room. It's in my purse. I still have the hand cream you made me last time. Heather beamed under the ambient light. You'll have to teach me how to make it. Let's do that this summer. Serafina always had a way with his staff, with everyone, really. Before he prayed for their food, he addressed Serafina. Make it clear before you go on your first date that you have the same faith. He shook his head, thinking about his experience when he'd had his first serious date with someone who didn't believe in God at all. Things get complicated when you want to pray and they don't. She grimaced. I messed up on that one with Greg. She tinkered with her nails. This time, I disclosed it on my profile. Maybe that's why I didn't get any interest. If it were left to him, he'd make sure any man who went out with her was deserving of her. As soon as they prayed, she served herself a fruit-filled crepe and sliced into it. Logan scooped the spinach and fruit salad and they ate as they took in the spectacular view across the bay to Mount Diablo. This is fancy. Serafina dabbed a napkin on her lips, then peered at the large dining table several feet away, where a bouquet centerpiece dominated. I'm assuming one of my dates might be rich? You didn't specify your income bracket? Lots of things she hadn't specified in the dating coach manual. What should I expect on this date? She lifted her juice and sipped it. She loved having an agenda for a conversation. No wonder she'd scared some of her dates away. Always eat before you engage in a conversation. He winked. In case the date doesn't go well, you don't want to leave the restaurant hungry. Like she'd almost done with her last date, when she'd ignored her food until she decided her date was legitimate. When she finished her crepe and reached for a saucer of the eggs Benedict, he continued. If your date doesn't ask questions after five minutes, you can ask him something that has nothing to do with his career. Her head jerked up and her brows drew together. Why not? She dabbed a napkin on her mouth. That's how I know if someone is responsible. After finishing his salad, he selected one of the plates with the flaming yawn, slicing through it as his mind sliced through his previous dates. Four out of the last six girls he dated had known he had money, and their conversations always involved dream vacations they expected him to fulfill. Taking a vacation with a girlfriend never appealed to him, so he'd had to crush their fantasies. You don't want him to think you want him for his money. Oh. Doe-eyed brown eyes rounded as her full lips formed a kissable O. Had anyone ever been a more perfect picture of innocent shock? Makes sense. This wasn't going to work. He ground his teeth, glad they were sitting at opposite ends of the table, and he couldn't get tempted to lean over and test out those lips. But what kind of table would she be at with her dates? What kind of resistance would the other guy have? How was Logan going to let her go out with a legitimate date? Wrong thinking. What was he supposed to be saying? Right. The lists. Don't use any lists. They'll scare the guy. You want your date to fall into a natural conversation. But, she blew out a breath, I don't want to end up with anyone who has issues or childhood trauma. I guess I'll try to be patient. If she was still intent on using dating apps, he'd have his security advisor investigate the given apps. We'll still have to run background checks on all your dates, though. Her brow arched and her head tipped, her ponytail swinging to one side and bouncing against her bare shoulder. Like, they're your employees? No, but I don't want you going out with another criminal. Are you ever going to let me live that down? She snapped, her shoulders stiffening. Their fake date hadn't even started, and they were already having a disagreement. He stared at her across the table. I'm sorry, I'll pretend we're on a date now. She rolled her eyes, half smiling, and her shoulders relaxed. He forked his sliced piece of meat, 
lifted it to his mouth, and chewed as the music continued to murmur in the background. Today's fake date was about getting to know her, just basic questions he'd resort to in order to stay on track. What's something I'd guess about you? She squished her face, pointing a fork at him. You already know about me. He shook his head. There were things she didn't tell him, and he had no idea how to know at times. Remember, we're strangers. I'll go first. She sipped her water. What makes you unique? That was a difficult question. He wasn't much different from anyone else. I take gummy vitamins. He couldn't stand swallowing medicine. Serafina pointed her fork at him. You're the only one I know whose feet are always freezing, even on hot days. How do you know about my feet? She shrugged. I've known it forever, even before the first time I stayed at your parents' house and we fell asleep on the couch. How could he forget the night they'd binge-watched movies and both collapsed on the sofa? Your frozen feet were in my face and you woke me up. That explained why she bought him a new pair of slippers every Christmas. Her face turned serious. When your date asks you what makes you unique, be sure to mention that you're thoughtful, kind, and you love feeding the homeless. Laughter carried in her tone, especially the ones at my building, because you want them to protect me. His chest warmed. You're generous and protective? Her gaze pierced through him, among the many good things that make you unique. Logan's heart thrummed against his ribs. The way she was looking at him and the genuineness of her words had him drag his gaze away from her and to the half-eaten steak on his plate. He too had a list about her. You are unique because you are caring and considerate. She'd given up coffee the day she learned it triggered his memories of his uncle. You also love peanut butter and jelly? He'd better shift back to food rather than sentimentality. Not many adults like that kind of food. She smiled and dragged her gaze to the plate with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich sliced into triangles. I'd eat that if I hadn't eaten it for lunch. I told Heather to fix it, just in case. With a smile spreading across her face, she reached for the bowl with red cubes of jello. The wobbly substance danced on the spoon while she put it on her plate. You used to eat all my jello. This is me paying you back. He stood and also reached for the bowl, then scooped a cube to his plate. Not that he liked it anymore, but for the memories. During the two years they'd gone to school together, she always had a decent lunch compared to his usual popcorn. He had to make his own lunches, but popcorn had been the only meal in the house when his uncle didn't buy groceries. Besides beer, the man always had his popcorn. I owe you popcorn, too. She whispered, her gaze meeting his across the table. She'd always traded Jello and half her peanut butter and jelly for his popcorn. Counting on that next time we watch a movie. He didn't care what movie they watched. He'd watch a black and white any day with her, rather than a musical or thriller if it meant he'd watch it alone or with someone whose company he didn't enjoy. For the next few minutes, they forgot about fake dating and recalled their childhood. They talked about their elementary school during the two years they'd been neighbors. You were always popular, and Dee Dee always had a crush on you. A crush at nine? I was eight and I had a crush on Joey. He couldn't even remember most of those kids. His brain had been loaded with worry and dread to get home. Needing to fight off those memories, he focused on Serafina's conversation about her crushes. When was your first kiss? You don't want to hear mine. Twisting up her lips, she dabbed a napkin on her mouth. You go first. He tapped a finger on his chin, remembering that year in school as he was putting the equipment back in the closet. I could tell this girl had a crush on me. Three other girls had a crush on him too. He'd always basked in the intention the girls gave him. I put away the music stand and turned to leave when this girl, I think her name was Tori, or something like that. She walked into the closet and closed the door. Then she told me she liked me. He'd always been hesitant, even that young, to tell girls he liked them. His uncle's voice had always screamed in his head, louder back then. I leaned in and kissed her. He had no idea what he had been doing. Was it magical? Not exactly, but I kissed her a couple more times. Enough to thrill his hormones as a teenager. She wanted to go steady, and I didn't. It had cost one of his sisters a friend. Since then, my sister's friends were off limits. Huh. Serafina's lips thinned, and he asked about her first kiss experience. Her lips flattened further. Mine isn't as good as yours. I want to hear it. 
He folded his hands on the table. Her elbow touched the table as she rested her chin on her palm. It was a stupid truth or dare thing at 14. She scrunched her face and spoke with disgust. A house party friends had invited me to. This cute guy sitting next to me, well, this dare. Our lips had barely touched, and he stuck his whole tongue in my mouth. He didn't even really kiss me. He just stuck it in my mouth, then tried to do the lip-biting thing. But it just felt like he was trying to chew off my lip. She shivered. I pushed him away, but his spit was all around my mouth and down to my chin. The kids thought it was funny. Logan's body tensed, and he clasped his hands together to stay in control and not ask the name of this boy so he could hunt him down and teach him a lesson or two on how to respect a woman. Was it before we reunited or after? Of all the guys she could have had a first kiss with, it was a creep. Right before, I'd imagined the first kiss of my life to be this wonderful experience. She reached for the lemonade and took a sip, as if to clean her mouth of the distasteful kiss from years ago. I hated it so much. I remained a kiss virgin and decided I'd only kiss a man I was going to marry. And that was Greg? She nodded, her gaze falling to her hands. Greg was patient. After a year of dating, I finally kissed him when we started talking about marriage. I guess I should have waited for that ring first. Too bad he missed out. Logan kept the tone light. He sensed the weight of her sadness in her eyes, and it tore at his heart. I think I was a terrible kisser. That's why he left me for someone else. Against his will, his gaze dragged to her plump lips, curiosity dancing in his mind about what they would taste like. I'm sure you're... His throat caught, and his voice dipped surprisingly low. A good kisser. How would you know? I just know. His mind was already flashing images of him pinned against her as he kissed her senseless. His face must be red if the rise in his body temperature was an indication. If you're with the right person, the kiss should be natural. A kiss with her would be enjoyable. He just knew it. As if sensing his awkwardness, she switched the topic. I'm just glad you were adopted into a good family and had a better childhood. Your family, too. I know. Her eyes glowed. We've never talked about what your first year with Regina and Kyle was like. That was quite the year of transition. After I left my uncle's, I was taken to counseling. I couldn't talk to the counselor for two weeks, until Regina filled in the next two weeks. The first day she looked at him with those golden eyes so tender, it was like she could see his pain. A lump clogged his throat. It was around Christmas time. She gave me a remote control car. My first toy. And right then, I was compelled to show her the sores on my back. The sores. The healed burn stung his memory. He closed his eyes and swallowed hard. Uncle's girlfriend had just taken off, after they'd had a harsh exchange of words. When I walked in from school, Uncle asked if I'd found my coat, which I'd lost two days ago. When I said no, Uncle swung the hot pan from the stove, and all the contents flew out as he whacked my back. The heat pierced my thin shirt. His throat constricted. A day later, while Uncle was choking his girlfriend in a parking lot, someone called the police. Uncle's girlfriend told the police about the verbal and physical abuse of his nephew. Logan owed the woman his gratitude. Regina cried and pulled me into a hug. He could still hear her whispering, Oh, my sweet child, through her tears and feel her embracing him tightly. Her jasmine scent and warmth were forever seared into that day's memory. When she'd asked if he knew God loved him so much, he'd thought that if he'd had a mom like her, Maybe then he'd believe in God's love. When the original counselor returned and I refused to talk, they reassigned me to Regina. And the day she and Kyle adopted me, I believed there was a God who cared and loved me. Yet, so many times I was angry and rebellious. Whenever Uncle's words taunted him, Logan felt he didn't deserve a family. But my parents were always patient and hovered in my room until I told them what was bothering me. Especially Regina. Kyle's job as a research analyst meant he traveled out of state often, but the couple had taught Logan and his siblings the value of hard work, considering it a gift from God. The first year, when I didn't want to go to school, Regina hired a tutor. Mom had a spare room in her office. She would take me to work and the tutor would teach me there. Eric and Wade had already transitioned into the family. As more kids were adopted, they moved from Denver to the mountains. Iris was five when I joined the family. She was the bonus child, a surprise mom and dad didn't expect since they thought they were barren. 
While Logan hadn't been used to hugs, Iris wouldn't stop hugging him, despite his stiffness. A smile curved his mouth with the memory of her soft voice, drifting from the bedroom next to his. I love my new big brother, Mommy, she'd say while Regina tucked Iris into bed. She'd been the happiest little thing, a ray of sunshine that slowly melted his heart until he'd fully transitioned into being the big brother she cherished. Between Iris's wholehearted love and Regina's tender hugs, Logan didn't take long to get used to embraces. We loved her so much, still do, and tried to keep her from falling into any traps. We'd do anything in the world to spare her from pain. They made sure you guys had a good education. None of your siblings are financially unstable. Tears shone in Serafina's eyes, regret evident. Was it over his sad stories, or was she thinking of what life could have been like for her if her parents had straightened out? He shouldn't have ruined this night. He turned it into a Logan show. This is not the conversation you want to hear on your first date. And we've barely eaten. He nodded to all the food remaining untouched. Actually, she picked up her fork again. I want to start my date like this. I need to know what I'm getting into. Right. This session was a good reminder that he had childhood trauma. Serafina was looking for someone without a tragic background. He reached for the sparkling juice and raised his glass. Toast? She lifted hers and he stretched across the table to clink their glasses. What are we toasting to? To finding a man with no issues, a perfect spouse who fits your criteria. Oh. The word slipped out, her mouth rounding to match its sound. Then she frowned and opened and closed her mouth. I didn't mean for... You're fine, Sarah. He tipped his drink to his mouth and she did the same. Thanks for dinner. It had all my favorites. She flashed her kind smile. Even the lemonade. I can tell you ordered it from the stand. He'd paid extra to have the man deliver his lemonade to the penthouse. He'd also asked Heather to prepare most of Sarah's favorite foods. After dinner, I thought we'd make a chocolate mousse for our dessert. It was late for dessert, but he had to follow through with the plan intended for the evening. Why didn't you tell me to bring the recipe? They'd taken the class together with Heather two months ago. Heather has the recipe printed for us. I can't wait. Serafina's genuine smile was back in place. Making dessert together was another way they could get things back to normal. While he'd been sure of how tonight would end, revisiting his past had helped him know where and when to draw the line. Before you forget, we have dog training tomorrow. He knew, and he nodded. Don't forget, the gala next Saturday. She grimaced. You forgot? No, it's a black and white. It's high time I upgraded my wardrobe. Which was fine, but knowing her, she'd beat herself up all week to find a perfect outfit. Tonight was not the right night to discuss his intentions to solve the mystery of what to wear. He'd deal with that once the week started. However, the sooner his mind got the memo that Sarah was off limits, the better for their friendship. Next Saturday will be our third lesson, he said as the coaching expert he'd been assigned to be. What will the lesson be about? Getting to know you phase two. You've Chapter nine. Serafina stood in a massive dressing room brightened with recessed lighting and mirrors on every angle. She spun around trying to recognize the woman in the reflection. It was her, only she was glamorous in a long sleeve white ball gown that swept over her calves, the black sequined floral appliques sprinkling the left side of her waist to the v-neck complemented the shimmering white satin. Serafina laughed, feeling like she was wearing a combination of Audrey Hepburn's iconic ball gown from the movie Sabrina and her wedding gown and funny face. She could barely register Vanessa's words from the blue sofa where her friend sat studying the cream-colored shoe in her hand. This reminds me of a Cinderella story. Vanessa set down the shoe and slid it onto her foot. I hope Pax is taking me somewhere deserving of this dress. You can talk him into coming to the gala. Although tickets had been bought two weeks ago, Logan could put in a good word for Vanessa and Pax to join the event the day of. Hmm. Keep your phone handy in case we have a last-minute change of plans. Serafina stared back at her reflection, and her cheeks lifted at the detailed volume in her curls. Curls held some of her hair at the back, leaving the rest draped over her shoulders, and her hair perfectly framed her face. The hairstylist said every woman needed makeup, and since Serafina wasn't equipped in that department, she'd let him do his job. However, the tinted moisturizer on her lips and the subtle mascara made her look younger 
and now she felt taller in the shiny black heels. Confidence, shoulders high. Logan's words echoed in her mind, and she stood taller, feeling beautiful. I'm beautiful. She mumbled the words, confident to walk into any room with boldness. What did you just say? Vanessa spoke, and Serafina saw her friend's reflection. She was reaching for a glass of sparkling juice from the end table. Nothing. Serafina touched the tiny black pendant dangling from the sparkling diamond chain on her neck. With Logan's insistence to pretend like she was going on a second date, he'd sent a personal shopper with Kosal, asking Vanessa to go shopping with her if her friend was up for it. The personal shopper took them to a boutique with a variety of contemporary and retro fashions, so Logan must have told the woman about Serafina's preference for retro styles. Either way, it turned out to be a day of pampering when Kosal and the personal shopper took them to the hairstylist. Her heels clicked on the tile and the full satin skirt rustled against her legs as she walked to Vanessa, who was now scrolling through her phone. Vanessa glanced up, her eyes a delight as she looked Serafina up and down. Girl, every single man in the ballroom will be breaking their neck to look at you. Warmed by her compliment, Serafina tugged at her friend's teal dress. One look at you tonight and Pax will be proposing. Vanessa's chuckle echoed in the vast room. We are far from that. At least we better be. Serafina reached for her glass of sparkling juice, compliments of Logan. He was the only one who knew she loved sparkling juice. She wanted to ask why Vanessa wasn't in a hurry to commit, but her friend shifted the conversation. You never told me all the details about your date at Logan's house. Memories rushed back to Friday evening over a week ago, revisiting their childhood memories and him telling her things he'd never shared with her before had felt personal and different. The dinner display of her favorite meals, so many memories and familiarity of the man and friend who'd always cared for her, a friend she needed to cling to and never let go of. Logan was her constant, and in another world, they could be soulmates. Falling for him was not an option. Romantic entanglements would ruin everything they meant to each other. Making dessert together as they laughed and reminisced about how far they had come had felt sweet. Maybe it had all been in her head, but she sensed his gaze slipping to her lips whenever she spoke. His goodbye hug when he dropped her off had been tighter, longer. That could be because she'd been so aware of his intoxicating scent as her fingers itched to touch his beard when she kissed his cheek. If that hadn't been enough, she'd felt like running her fingers through his rumpled hair. She felt suddenly warm at the unexpected, wicked thoughts. Okay? Vanessa's voice drew her out of her thoughts. Her friend chuckled and clasped her hands, then patted the space next to her on the sofa. How about we talk about your dating life? Serafina sat next to Vanessa, too anxious to admit her growing attraction to Logan. Why aren't you in a hurry to progress your relationship with Pax? First, I don't know the man well enough to consider committing. Marriage is for life, you know, so there'd never be a reason to rush into it. Second, let's just say we lack chemistry. She set her phone on the sofa. I'm waiting for a spark to ignite, you know? No, but Serafina nodded to agree with whatever her friend meant. Her heart had leaped with excitement the day she met Greg, but things just progressed normally as they talked about their future. We're just taking it slow right now. Love came softly at times, but perhaps Vanessa was right to take things slow. Not Serafina, though. She'd already wasted too much time. Still, she said, good idea. Now your turn. Vanessa crisscrossed her ankles, her dress shifting slightly above the knee. What did you talk about in your first session? If she didn't say anything, Vanessa wasn't going to back down. Dinner was really good. Serafina's mind whirled again, trying not to think of how her heart squeezed when he'd been vulnerable as he talked about his mom. We talked about our childhood. Logan is a good coach. Vanessa nodded, questions dancing in her brown eyes. Whatever was on her mind, she didn't say it. I hope you learned something tonight. The way Vanessa said the statement had Serafina's mind at work. What was she going to learn tonight? That she couldn't fall for Logan? Or that she'd find a man there so she could avoid her best friend? Temptation. Anxiety turned into nerves as Serafina paced between her living room and the kitchen. The clock on the stove showed 6.50. The gala would be starting soon. As she lifted a hand closer to her face, her other hand itched to reach and scrape nail polish from her pinky in an attempt to calm her frazzled nerves. And she did. So much for getting nails professionally done. But unlike the other times when the polish came off easily, today was a struggle. Perhaps professional manicures were the way to go. As soon as Colesaw had dropped her and Vanessa at home, 
Serafina had taken Chewie to the dog sitter so she could be ready to go when Logan showed up. She reached for her new clutch purse on the counter and pulled out her phone. Did she even need to take a purse and phone? She'd be with Logan, and he'd have his phone if she needed to use it. The doorbell rang and she jolted, then walked around the counter, her heels clicking against the vinyl as she made her way to the door. Forgetting to glance through the peephole, she swung it open. Nerves danced deep in her stomach at the sight of Logan, and her brain swirled as his intoxicating eucalyptus scent enveloped her in an invisible hug. Just his familiar scent made her feel safe and secure, even though tonight, Logan didn't draw her into his usual hug or kiss her cheek. His perfectly fitted charcoal suit emphasized the broad span of his shoulders, and the matching bow tie offset his crisp white shirt. Her gaze dragged down to his dress shoes, then up to his face. The groom's stubble enhanced his square jaw, and his thick brown hair shone beneath the hallway lights. She swallowed, suddenly hot and thirsty. This was Logan, the scrawny boy she'd met hiding in the runoff pipe years ago. But he wasn't scrawny or a boy anymore. Instead, a handsome man and the CEO of a billion-dollar company stood before her. Uh, he curled an eyebrow. His Adam's apple bobbled as he swallowed while looking her up and down. The air swirled between them, and breathlessness left her woozy. With the need to say something, anything, to end the awkwardness from her wicked mind, she asked, Why did you knock? Uh-oh, she sounded breathless, as if she ran three flights of stairs in her heels. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Remember, I'm the guy you just met online, and this is our second date. Okay. She fanned herself to feign cool air. This dress... It's beautiful. You look stunning. You look nice, too. Which was an understatement. He was strikingly handsome. She'd accompanied him to events several times, and he was always dressed nice. The most handsome man in the room. But her mind hadn't seen him as a potential date. Not thinking twice, she stepped out and slammed the door behind her. Ready? In response, he leaned in to kiss her on the cheek, alarming her with tingles she'd never experienced from him before. Logan didn't appear affected when he tucked her hand into the crook of his arm as they walked down the three flights of stairs. Thanks for the makeover. Anytime. In their silence, she welcomed the noise from the different units, the sirens from the road and the scuffle from people climbing the metal stairs. When they arrived at the Grand Ballroom 20 minutes later, she felt like a prom queen as she strode into the venue with the most handsome boy in school holding her arm. Gleaming golden-tinted lights streamed onto well-polished floors and sparkled off the women's shimmering gowns. The flow of black-and-white dresses and tuxedos giving off a vibe as if she'd stepped into one of her favorite Art Deco movies. Serafina felt her shoulders rise, confident she walked in. She always fit in with Logan, and he treated her with respect despite their financial differences. Men and women greeted him, both investors and health professionals, who supported the hospitals Logan's brother built in San Francisco. Everyone in attendance was either a hospital employee, a volunteer, or a financial donor, or had been invited by either of the parties. They walked past two burly men, and Logan arched a brow and slapped one guy on the arm. What are you doing here with a blue tie, rather than a black one, Mike? The guy laughed as his fingers flicked to the tie, the only variation from the white shirts, black ties, and dark suits every other man wore. I spilled cologne on mine while I was dressing. It was either compromise with this or knock out everyone in the room. Serafina felt small when women craned their necks to look in their direction. Cameras flashed as photographers took their photos, then charged around to snap other people's photos. She tensed, tightening her hold on Logan while the women turned back and whispered to each other. They were looking at him and couldn't care less about his companion. Women had always ogled him, but she'd never minded until today. When they arrived at their designated table, Logan pulled out her chair and she wobbled into it. You're okay, he asked as he took the chair next to her. All the photographers. The last thing she needed was a rumor spreading about them. The San Francisco Times and all the Snoopy media knew them as friends. Come on, Sarah. His warm breath teased her ear when he leaned into her. This is not the first time you've been in the tabloids. Maybe not, but tonight was different. They were most likely to capture a photo of her eyeing him with affection by the end of the evening, if she wasn't careful. Nibbles and champagne were flowing at the drinks reception. Two servers appeared to ask them what they wanted. Water is good, she and Logan said at the same time. Then he gazed at her, amusement teasing his face as he spoke to the server without looking away from her. She'll have a sparkling juice.
When the server left, she addressed Logan. As if you didn't get me enough juice today. He reached for the water goblet in front of him. Gotta keep my date happy. There were three empty chairs at their table, all with water and silverware placements. One was intended for Danica before Logan had broken up with her. Danica was another sour topic. Logan got defensive whenever Serafina asked for details of their breakup. What are you thinking about? The ice danced as he set his goblet on the table. Instead of voicing her thoughts, she needed a diversion. He was her dating coach, after all. She could barely remember what she and Greg did the first month. Clearly, she needed some lessons before diving into dating again. She put her hands on her lap. What should I expect on a second date? He gave her a sideways glance. Digging deeper. It's the time you ask questions, and he asks questions about you. Is that when I pull out my list? He shook his head, keeping his gaze on her. On the second date, don't be afraid to look him in the eye, his face, or anything that catches your attention. Then compliment him. Like I like your tie? He adjusted his bow tie. That's not bad, but it's not him. Go for something about his physical appearance. Why are you attracted to him in the first place? It didn't even make sense. Logan must have noticed her confusion because he winked. For instance, you have golden specks in your eyes. Going quiet, he stared at her. If I were your admirer and I saw that, I might say, the golden specks in your eyes have a dazzling sparkle. Her cheeks flushed. When did he notice the specks in her eyes? She didn't even know she had specks. Okay. She spoke breathlessly. Let me try. She noticed the shades in his deep brown eyes when he stared at her in the mirror at both his house and hers. I like how your eyes have yellow pigments when they hit the light. A boyish grin split his face. You do now. Her neck heated with embarrassment and she gazed at the centerpiece. Pink tulips and cabbage roses and white lilies and dahlias rising from an ornate urn towering over the lit candles. She fiddled with her fingers, scratching the nails with her thumb. This is the time to mention your love for classics, Logan continued. Breakfast at Tiffany's, soap making, peanut butter and jelly. As he continued pointing out all the things she liked, she was awed and panicked by how much he knew her. When he tells you what he likes, you can both decide what to do for your third date, based on either his interests or yours. You both have to make a sacrifice to do what the other likes. How had Logan thought he didn't have what it took to be a coach? He was better at dating techniques than he knew. Dinner was served and another couple joined them. Speeches followed dinner, a couple of celebrities, the hospital chiefs of staff from the two stone hospitals in San Francisco, and then Logan. Without a trace of panic, he spoke and thanked the hospital staff, the volunteers, and the donors for believing in such a great cause, and supporting the hospital to serve and treat people in their community who couldn't afford medical care. When the live band played music and invited people to the dance floor, Logan pushed back his chair and put out his hand for her. Can I have this dance? Of course. She stood and he took her hand in his warm one. She tried to ignore the tingles that shot through her arm as they strolled to the dance floor. She never shied from dancing during the galas and events she went to with Logan. Two years ago, she fussed about being a terrible dancer when she'd gone to one of his fancy events, so he paid for lessons and had gone with her as her dance partner. After that, whether or not they both brought their plus ones along, she and Logan still danced to a couple of songs in between dancing with their dates. As they danced and swayed to an electro melody, Logan talked her through handling a dance on a second date. If he's not a good dancer, he spun her around and then pulled her toward him, securing her tight and curling his other hand around her waist. His breath dusted her neck. He should take dance lessons. Uh. Breathless again, she could scarcely see his eyes with the strobe lights changing colors over the dance floor, but she felt his intense stare. He then pushed her back slightly, changing their dance into swaying when he took both her hands in his. His mouth was moving as if he was saying something, so she shook her head. A terrible mistake she realized when he bent closer to whisper in her ear. His conditioner, although familiar, teased her nose and his cheek brushing against hers as he whispered in her ear awakened all the nerves in her body. You can dance on the second date as long as it's not to a slow song. Her heart was drumming against Logan's, louder than the music. What she needed to do was leave. Running to the bathroom would be a temporary solution to clear her mind. But they still had another hour of the event. Had he felt her heart thrumming when she'd been so close to him? As the song faded, she stepped away. She didn't trust herself to speak, so she didn't let him know she needed some air. Instead of walking to the bathroom, she walked past it, stumbled into a brightly lit hallway, leaned against the wall, and touched her pounding heart 
as she drew out of breath. Her feet were weak and she felt tempted to take off her heels so she could stand on the tiled floor. That was close. At what point was her heart going to get the memo that Logan was off limits for more reasons than risking their friendship? She gazed at the abstract paintings on the wall, losing herself in the vivid splash of colors that let her imagination fill in what the artist intended. Then, as she calmed, a commotion had her whipping her head to the hallway's opposite side. Several yards away, a woman moved her hands all over a man's chest as he gripped her chin. I dare you. The man spoke through laughter. Hmm. She knew that voice. That oval face. Greg? Her hands were shaking. She squinted for a better look, terrified to invade a couple who had no idea she was there. Yes, the redhead from Soft Swirl was now collapsing her mouth on the man Serafina had hoped to marry within two years. Her heart sank and she felt dizzy. She pressed her fingers together, wishing she could magically disappear and not witness the rejection slapped in her face. She pulled away from the wall and turned to leave, holding her breath and struggling not to turn around for another glance. Music was still playing and people were still dancing, but her mind spun faster than the disco balls. Her feet fell weak as she wove past people, barely registering the activity around her. Her legs got off balance and she stumbled, expecting to land on the floor. But strong hands captured her from behind, scooping her up and turning her toward him, one hand bracing her back, another firm on her hip. Her hands gripped the man's shoulders to anchor herself before her feet could find their way back to the floor, or her eyes could find their way back into focus. Careful. A familiar voice sounded, and she was gazing into deep brown eyes that seared into hers with love and tenderness she'd never seen before. Logan was so attractive, more so now, the most handsome man she'd ever met. Her breathing altered and her heart raced. Strange muscles deep in her stomach clenched as she sensed an odd current between them, the way she'd felt lately in his presence. You were gone for so long, I had to come and find you. With his hand curled around her waist, anchoring her back, instead of standing up, she stayed there, numb while inhaling his familiar scent. Is everything okay? He whispered, clasping her to him, his eyes explored her face, and she melted into his burning gaze. Hmm? Did he say something? He touched her cheeks and the feel of his fingers tracing her skin ignited sparks of desire. Maybe it was the warmth from his mouth or something else entirely that had her gaze flicker to his mouth. But for the first time in their friendship, or the second, she couldn't even remember. She wanted him to kiss her, wanted to feel his mouth on hers. The building could be on fire and she wouldn't move. Not when Logan was breathing harder than usual, or was it all her imagination? What would it be like to run her fingers through his hair as she kissed him? They'd been friends for too long, and kissing him might be strange. Still, the way he was looking at her mouth compelled her to close her eyes, praying and waiting for his mouth to connect with hers. Why are you closing your eyes? The reality of his grave voice woke her from her daze. She pushed herself forward, jerking away and inhaling, afraid to look at him. Great. Can I leave now? She needed to go home and wallow in the embarrassment of rejection from her ex and her best friend. Give me a few minutes, okay? I need to get a... Mr. Stone! A man called his wife to his side as they shook Logan's hand, giving Serafina a chance to step away. Wait, Sarah! Logan called after her. She only waited because she'd left her purse at home. She didn't have a way to pay for a cab. Logan whispered something to the couple, sending them off, and returning to her within seconds. Can we stay for a few minutes? I need to find someone first. Her gaze flicked over the tables, half-filled with people who weren't dancing. If only she'd not left behind her purse. Logan! They both whipped their heads toward the voice. A familiar blonde international reporter came into view. Danica? Logan scowled. What are you doing here? Serafina could answer that. God sent Danica to remind Serafina she needed to get her act together. You invited me. That was before. I didn't intend to come, but I figured you'd be here and I... Danica stopped, then as if recognizing Serafina. You look well, Serafina. Hi, Danica. Serafina's high-pitched voice surprised her. She felt as if she was caught in the act of doing something wrong. She managed to smile, ignoring the jealousy creeping into her heart. Your dress, you look beautiful. That part Serafina meant, with her hair shimmering in waves and draped over the dark gown sweeping against her pumps. One of the models could have just stepped out of the modern fashion catalog Serafina had been browsing. I see you and Logan are still good friends. Of course we are, Serafina responded too quickly. Logan spoke calmly, 
Yes, Sarah is my friend. And actually, she... Because we... Serafina cut Logan off before he said anything related to their fake date. She bobbed a finger between her and Logan. He and I always go to these events together. Head tipped to the side and brows pinching, Danica stared at her. I know what you two mean to each other, and I shouldn't have given him an ultimatum. The pain in her tone made Serafina uncomfortable. She didn't want to be the one coming between them. Logan misses you so much. He's been talking about you and wanted to apologize, but I'll let you guys catch up. What else was she supposed to say? She started walking backward. Maybe now is a good time for you guys to reconcile. Hope brightened Danica's eyes. He was talking about me? Logan leveled Serafina with a deathly scowl. Catch up later. Serafina pivoted, hoping to spot Kosal close to the entryway. Stop! Logan snapped. His strong hand tugged at hers when he pulled her back to face him. And his hot breath hissed into her ear. Don't even think about leaving me here with her. He spoke through gritted teeth, and she peeked at Danica to make sure she didn't hear Logan through the music. Danica smiled, and Serafina half-smiled, then waved before turning to Logan and whispering, You make it sound like she's a stranger. What do you think you're doing? The ultimatum Danica had talked about. Was Serafina responsible for their breakup? Clearly, Danica didn't trust Serafina around Logan. Smart woman. Serafina didn't trust herself either. Not after what almost happened. Did you see how she looked at me? Ignoring her, Logan said, We can leave together. We came together. She shook her head. I'll call a cab if you give me some money. Not that he carried cash. His chiseled jaw clenched, yet no doubt furious at her. He spoke in resignation. I'll have Kosal take you home. He'll come back and get me. He blew out a breath. I still need to find one of the hospital's chief of staff. Either way, she hoped Danica didn't blame her for their breakup. Danica stuck with them as they found Kosal, who was chatting with one of the guards at the entrance. A cloud of sadness covered Serafina on the drive home. What if she just reunited Logan and Danica? She grunted, fisting her hands as her chest clenched just as tight. Was she seriously bothered about Logan's relationship for the first time in their friendship? When she got home and got chewy, she racked her mind to remember the code for her door, but couldn't. She punched the number in twice, paused, and blew out a breath. Chewy was heavy in the kennel. He was also better with instructions. The dog training class she and Logan had attended last Saturday had helped implement Chewy's regimen. The door creaked open behind her, and Vanessa's voice followed it. You're home early. Gone was her friend's formal dress, replaced with a red nightshirt and pajama shorts. That instant, Serafina remembered. Oh no. She turned, wincing under the hall light. Vanessa had requested her to keep her phone handy, in case she ended up changing her mind to attend the gala. I'm sorry, I forgot my phone at home. Did you try to call me? So you could blame me for ruining your party? Vanessa walked over and took the dog kennel from her. I'll let you open the door. I want to hear all about the grand ball. It would have been fun to talk about the dance and the experience if her night hadn't ended the way it did. You would have loved it. Serafina managed to unlock her door and flick on the light, then let Vanessa enter first. You know the details I'm talking about. Vanessa set the dog down while Serafina closed the door, then pulled Chewy out of the kennel. The pup leaped for her before she remembered her dress that probably cost a year's worth of her rent. She lifted the puppy off her dress and set him on the floor, then gathered the hem of her gown and tucked it between her legs. She bent and rubbed the dog's back while Chewy waggled his tail. Greg was there. No way! Vanessa settled on the sofa. How? He could have started working at one of the hospitals Stone Enterprises founded. He's a pediatrician? Small world? Was he with his, Vanessa made air quotes, girlfriend? Serafina nodded, her lips pressing as she fought the replay of the scene she'd witnessed. He didn't see me. Come to think of it, if he'd seen her, then she may not have made a fool of herself to Logan. I wish he saw me. Vanessa's shoulders slumped. You're still having a hard time letting go of Greg? When Serafina collapsed in Logan's arms and wanted him to kiss her, Greg had been far from her mind. She moved to the sofa next to Vanessa while Chewie wandered off to explore the rest of the house. Logan and I, we had a moment. Serious? Vanessa's eyes widened. What moment exactly? Vanessa's sudden wide grin wasn't consoling at all. Did you guys kiss? I wanted him to kiss me. Just talking about the heated encounter had Serafina's stomach flutter. I don't want to have feelings for him. Vanessa covered her mouth with her hand, 
barely hiding a grin. If you think that's funny, you'll feel sorry for me when I tell you his ex showed up. Vanessa gasped. Is that why Logan sent you home alone? Serafina told her friend all she could manage about her departure and Logan's hesitation to reconcile with Danica. If you still want him as your dating coach, reconciling him with his ex wasn't a smart move. Maybe I shouldn't do this fake dating thing anymore. Vanessa laughed. You and Logan have always been in love with each other, and you can't deny it. Not only does he take care of you, but I also see the way he smiles at you. It's just not one smile. It is a whole vocabulary. Vanessa didn't seem bothered at all by Serafina's concern. Wait a minute. Serafina crossed her arms. Why did you suggest Logan to be my dating coach? Vanessa waved her off. Would you rather have a strange, ugly man as your coach? This wasn't good, not at all. Serafina wanted to be upset with Vanessa, but deep down she was thrilled by the possibility of being more than friends with Logan. But oh, what have you done to me, Vanessa? If you tell me the highlight of your day isn't seeing Logan, then I'll... Serafina might have mentioned how she missed Logan during one of his trips abroad. You two make a great couple. Vanessa tucked her legs up beneath her on the couch. Why do you think I never talked you into setting me up with Logan? I don't know. Maybe because Logan is unstable? That wouldn't stop me if I wanted him. My job as his girlfriend would be to make sure he never looks at any woman the way he looks at me. Our friendship will be even better. You're the only constant woman in Logan's life. Besides his family, Vanessa's words continued crowding her mind as she voiced the reason Serafina and Logan belonged together. After Vanessa left, Serafina showered and changed into her pajamas. She then curled into her covers, keeping her nightlight on while she reflected on the day. When her phone chirped an incoming message, she leaped for it from the nightstand. Her stomach fluttered and her fingers shook as she tapped to read Logan's message. Logan, you're about to lose a dating coach. What was with the stunt you pulled with Danica? Serafina, I was only trying to help. Logan, if I remember, you're the one in need of a dating coach. Ouch. He was throwing that in her face? She should have known. Serafina, sorry to overstep. I've had enough sessions to reactivate my profile. Logan, enough with that stupid app. I hate when you lower your standards. Serafina, I'm an adult. She was confident in her own way. Yeah, right. Her phone rang and the screen displayed his name. Not ready to argue with him or hear about his reunion with Danica, Serafina pressed the power button and turned off her phone for the night. Totally adult of her, but she would show Logan she had what it took to find her own date. She closed her eyes. This one time, God, please let me find a decent man online. As soon as Logan quit calling and texting, she'd turn her phone on again and activate her profile. The two sessions with Logan should get her through a first date if she succeeded in finding one. Succeeded in Chapter 10 Ball slammed across the gym as Logan sat on the bleachers with the other sidelined players. It was down to Serafina to hit their opponent out and give their team the win, or get stuck and have them take the loss. He bounced his leg and cheered when Serafina threw the ball back at the opponent. It was just a game. If his nerves could get the memo and stop jittering, he might catch his breath. They'd worked as a team to eliminate the opposing team's all-star players and succeeded. But then a woman on the opposing team caught the ball and brought back their best player, the one Serafina was up against. That Serafina was the only one still on the court, while Logan and two others were eliminated, was a statement in itself. Her ponytail danced against their team's red t-shirt as she hurled the ball toward the muscular man. The game went back and forth with balls flying. She knew when to duck to avoid getting stuck, yet she was fast, too fast. Logan jumped when she caught the ball thrown at her. Everyone on the sideline cheered and they sent him in. He jogged over to the drawn rectangle and high-fived her. Great job. I learned from the best, she winked. Their conflict from four days ago had already been over at church the next day. The whistle blew and his adrenaline surged as they rushed toward the middle and grabbed the colorful balls alongside the center line marker. In the attack lines, she hurled balls at their opponent, and he did the same. You're going down. They'd eliminate the man in no time. Win or lose, something about dodgeball always made a bad day slip away, bit by bit, with every throw. As they got caught in a battle of balls, 
Everything happened so fast when their opponent whipped a ball right on Serafina's forehead. The whistle blew and the game was put on hold. Logan's heart rate kicked up as he tossed the ball to the floor and ran to her. She held her head, wincing and staggering. Are you okay? Her eyelids fluttered closed, so he slid his arm to her back and led her off the court. Everyone on their team and the opposing team sprinted over to check if she was okay, but he thanked them and requested they step back. She didn't need them crowding her and blocking out the fresh air. Go back and play, she said breathlessly as he helped her settle down on the exercise mat at the other side of the gym. Concussions could occur from a single or multiple blows to the head. However, Serafina hadn't been hit that many times. Still, he always had a medic on standby whenever they played, even on their practice days. I'm fine, she kept repeating as the man shone a low beam flashlight into her eyes. As soon as the medic confirmed she was fine after asking her questions, Logan asked her questions of his own, needing to make sure she was okay. When was the last time you danced? His cheeks flushed the moment the question rolled off his tongue. Serafina squeezed her eyes closed, clasping her fingers tight on her stomach. Can you just win the game for us? There's no point in celebrating the win when you're hurt. His desire to play vanished the moment he saw her reeling. What if she wasn't okay? Could the medic's basic examination have missed something? I should probably get you to the hospital. I just need a moment, just a little dizzy. Another reason he wasn't leaving her side. His knees were uncomfortable on the gym floor while he kneeled beside her. With her eyes closed, he couldn't help examining her. The sports shorts exposed plenty of skin on her long legs. He'd always seen her as just Serafina, his Sarah. Ever since he'd almost given into the temptation of kissing her at the gala, she wasn't just his friend Sarah. When he touched her smooth and soft, flawless face, his breath had hitched, and he'd fought the urge to pull her mouth to his. Instead, he had to come up with some reprieve to bring them to reality. Why are you closing your eyes? Good thing he didn't kiss her. He'd realize once he sighted Greg after she left. She must have encountered him and his girlfriend and been vulnerable. When she stumbled into Logan's arms. The longing in her eyes, begging to be kissed, sure had surprised him, but it made more sense knowing Greg was around. Still, Logan's heart was thumping as his gaze explored her fluttering lashes. He found himself smiling while he took in her full, slightly parted lips. She was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, and he told her countless times, as a friend, of course. He could see her pulse thrumming past the pulse points above the t shirt collar. Quit staring at me. Eyes still closed, she waved a hand before his face, her face scrunching with her teasing. His chest constricted and he couldn't help but lean down and kiss her forehead. How do you know I'm staring at you? Her chest rose, then fell. I, I just know. Guess we won. Roberto trotted over. The opponent hitting Serafina's face was an automatic disqualification. Serafina opened her eyes. Her soft smile had his stomach dipping with nerves. Getting hit wasn't bad after all. I'm glad you still have your humor. Roberto patted her shoulder. Anything I can do for you? I'm fine. She pushed up to sit, accentuating her point. When Roberto left, Logan addressed her. You're coming to my place. I need to keep an eye on you. I have plans. She couldn't be serious. He'd hoped she was joking about activating the dating app. Call your date and cancel. He could name a few reasons why he didn't want her dating, at least until they both figured out their sudden attraction and chemistry. Did getting back on the app have anything to do with the dance? I ran into Greg at the dance. That he knew. But tonight's date has nothing to do with the dance or Greg. I guess it has everything to do with me. It's not always about you, Logan. He huffed. Rebounding or not, Serafina had refused to disclose her supposed date. He couldn't run a background check this time. He stood, taking her hand with him. Don't take Chewie to the sitter. I'll come over and watch him. Then he could also make sure that she got home okay. 
Her eyebrow lifted. You're coming to take Chewie to your penthouse? I'll watch him at your place. He's more comfortable at your house. With that resolved, he and Kosal dropped Serafina off at her place. Then Logan went to his house to clean up before he returned to her apartment. Hours turned into eternity as Logan took Chewie for a walk, played with the dog, and returned to Serafina's apartment. He then loaded the dishes piled in the sink into the dishwasher, wiped down the counters, arranged the crowded corner on the counter, and separated the empty glass bottles from the ones she'd filled with liquid. He needed to do something besides checking his phone to see if she'd texted, needing a rescue plan from her horrible date. Her being out this late didn't sit well. Okay, it was past eight, a school night for her and work night for him. But he'd offered to stay and watch the dog, so he'd better stay put. Safety was one thing, but tonight, jealousy seethed in his chest. After the gala incident left him with fantasies of making out with her, things were different. When Bryce called two days ago to check how the fake dates were going, he'd gone into Logan's mental hang-ups that kept him from getting attached to any of the women he dated in the past. You're already attached to Serafina, Bryce had been blunt. You have no desire or reason to have another woman take her place in your life. Logan had reflected on his friend's words, then on his dating record. None of the women had come close to his heart like Serafina. None made him want to take care of them or hang out with them as Serafina did. As he settled on the sofa, sirens blaring outside the window, and Chewie's breaths pulsing from his dog bed added a gentle backbeat to the house. The poor pup must be wiped out after their jog. After the gala, Logan was certain Serafina had romantic feelings for him, so he reached for his phone on the coffee table to check once again. No missed calls or texts. He ground his teeth and hovered his thumb over her contact, tempted to text and ask if she needed his intervention. What if she went out with a reasonable man tonight, someone who met her criteria? He shivered, then ground his teeth. He must be a mess if he was stressing over Serafina finding her dream partner. He scrolled through his phone and Iris's name showed from the last text he'd received. Maybe calling his baby sister could distract him. He needed to follow up with her text about vendors for the reunion. Iris lived in Boston, but they talked often on the phone. Sometimes she visited San Francisco, or he made surprise visits to her office. She answered on the first ring. To what do I owe the honor of my big brother calling me, when he's usually in bed at this time? I'm pet-sitting. He'd better explain, after always giving her a hard time, whenever she texted or called him after eight. <laughs> she snorted. You're co-parenting? Sarah went on a date. Good grief, he sounded as if he was wallowing. You don't sound happy about that. Yep, nothing snuck past Iris. She passed out at dodgeball. I just want her to rest. Yeah, right. I'm guessing you offered to watch the dog to spy on what time she gets home? He grimaced as he peered at a moth flapping on the lamp. Iris had no idea about their fake dates and coaching sessions. That stinker was good, so he'd better have the right responses. Why would I want to spy on her? What will you do if her date walks her home and kisses her at the door? Unless he's a creep? Oops, he didn't intend to growl or tighten the grip on his phone. Who walks a girl to their door on the first date? Who says there are rules to dating? Her words faded in the background when activity sounded outside the door. We'll chat later. He turned off the phone and tossed it on the table. No way was the loser outside kissing his Sarah. Serafina's nervous chuckle sounded, and a deep voice erupted in laughter. Iris wasn't kidding. Logan's protective instincts flared, and he was at the door in no time, swinging it open. Serafina's smile vanished, her eyes widening under the hallway light. She was stunning in the purple dress she'd modeled during her fashion show. Hadn't she heard him say not to wear that dress for a first date? No wonder the buffy doofus was licking his chops as he checked her out. Hey! Logan said it as a courtesy, while taking in the guy's black shirt and khakis. Anger ignited like kerosene beneath the flick of a match. The guy might even have the green eyes to fit Serafina's list, but Logan didn't care. He crossed his arms, glaring at the man up and down. 
but the creep didn't appear intimidated. The guy moved closer to Serafina and put his hand on her lower back. At least Serafina scooted back, easing away from her date's touch. Creep? You can leave now. Logan pointed to the metal stairs, tempted to shove the man and send him tumbling down, so he never showed up again. He wouldn't do that, of course, but that didn't mean the temptation wasn't high. There was activity of someone walking past them to their designated apartment, but Logan didn't take his gaze off the stalker. The man looked at Serafina. Who's he? She cleared her throat. Um, I said leave, Logan growled. Is that a threat? What a nerve. Did it cross his mind that Logan could be Serafina's rightful boyfriend? Logan's chest rose with a burning sensation, his blood pressure rising by the second, and he walked into the man's space. He could smell the creep's onion breath. It's a promise. He clenched his fists, not caring if the man was stronger than he was. Kosal should be back from his break by now, and perhaps wasn't too far from the entrance, to have seen Serafina walk in with the creeper. Stay another second and see what happens. Logan's knuckles itched to connect with the man's chin. The man frowned, studying Logan. Why do you look so familiar? Can you please leave? Serafina whispered as she stepped between Logan and her date, but it was her date she was asking to leave, not Logan. I'll call you. The man's voice softened toward Serafina. Without thinking, Logan spat out a response. Don't even think about calling her. Until the creep had left and Logan had Serafina inside and the door closed, he held off on addressing her, needing to clarify the hit from dodgeball hadn't affected her brain in any way. Waving both arms, he glowered at her. You brought a man home on your first date? She tossed her handbag on the floor and whipped her head to face him. The burning sensation in his chest was reflected in her fiery eyes. Who do you think you are? Your protector. Friend and now crush. He shouldn't even have climbed the stairs, or come to your door, or driven her. He shouldn't know where you live. Please don't tell me he picked you up. We just, he was leaving. What if he's a stalker and now knows where you live? It's not like I keep my door unlocked. She stomped into the room and jammed a hand on her hip. A mass of shiny dark curls loosely danced along her shoulders. Stop treating me like I'm a child. Then don't act like one. He threaded his fingers through his hair and pulled his head back. He didn't mean it to sound like she was a child, but sometimes dealing with Serafina was infuriating. He needed to be in bed. Tomorrow was another day of one meeting after another. In person at the office and virtual for his textile companies in India and Bangladesh. He pinched the bridge of his nose and drew out a resigned breath. Then he walked toward the shoe bench, took off his slippers, and replaced them with his canvas runners. You can date whoever you want and join all sorts of dating apps for all I care. Or so he wanted to assure himself. He let himself out the door without uttering a good night. Serafina stayed quiet too, so yeah, they were both done dealing with each other for a while. Obviously he was relieved of his duty as the dating coach. While he should be glad he was off the hook, his heart was unsettled. He'd be tossing and churning the rest of the night if only Serafina hadn't started this stunt, rather Vanessa, enlisting him into the role of a dating coach. His perfect bubble wouldn't be almost popping. Chapter 11 It was the kind of day when Serafina's job got emotional and complicated, especially when the principal called her to the office right in the middle of her class. Late on Thursday, she'd shared her concerns with the principal. Today, Eason didn't show up at school. Social services took him last night. The principal folded her hands on the table, her expression gentle as she relayed the bruises they found on the boy's back and arms when they took him to the hospital. His mom and stepdad were under further questioning. Serafina was trembling, her throat tight, struggling to speak. She couldn't even voice one of all the questions assailing her. So she just stared at the bookshelf near the window, letting her tears fall. How had she failed to come to Eason's rescue sooner? What? She reached for the tissue from the desk and blew her nose. Tears traced a path down the principal's brown cheeks, too. 
Eason is the fifth child this year in the school to be assaulted. Can I go visit him? The woman shook her head. We don't get to see those kids when they go into foster care. It's highly unlikely he'll be coming back to Finley, unless he gets into a foster home in the neighborhood. Serafina's heart ached as she sniffled. What's going to happen to him? The principal pressed her lips together, shaking her head. Deflated, Serafina returned to her class and found the two A's scrambling with one of the kids who'd bit another. Just as Serafina knelt to intervene and settle the conflict, another child ran toward her to tell her she wanted to throw up. To the trash you- Her words died in her mouth when the girl gagged and a brown substance flew onto Serafina's face and her top and skirt. She grimaced, wincing at the warm, sticky goop. One of the teacher aides helped with the paper towels, while the other took her place to settle the kids down. Serafina couldn't open her mouth, afraid if she did any breathing or talking, she'd swallow the vomit. She kept a spare bag of clothes at school for such a day, so she showered in the dingy bathroom they had for teachers, perhaps for this purpose. As much as she hated to get rid of her outfit, she had no desire to wash out vomit, so she perched the clothes in the trash. By lunchtime, she'd lost her appetite, not only because of the vomit, but also because, for the first time that day, she sat at her desk with a moment to process everything she'd blocked out. Eason, with her heart torn to pieces, she buried her face in her hands to pray, asking God if she'd made a mistake reporting Eason. What if he ended up in an abusive foster home worse than where he'd been? Logan had been in foster homes since his mom died when he was two, until his uncle showed up when he was six and claimed guardianship because he wanted to get money from the government. Logan's experience in foster care wasn't good, but several kids in Serafina's class were in foster care and seemed to have decent homes. She snagged a tissue from the box on her desk and blew her nose. More tears burned her throat. How was she going to make it through the day? God, please help me. She cried as she prayed, thinking of calling Logan. No one else would understand, but she'd upset him last night. He seemed frustrated and done with interfering in her life. The date was awful, not worth fighting with her best friend. She'd been embarrassed when Logan almost hit the man. The man would have probably ended up filing a lawsuit so he could get money from Logan. The moment he'd started claiming he'd seen Logan somewhere had been her cue to send her date off. The Stones were well known and respected in San Francisco. Not only did they boost the economy by providing jobs, but they also supported more charities in and outside the state than the local hospitals they built. Trying to refocus on her prayers, she closed her eyes, but she couldn't bottle up her emotions. A knock interfered with her prayers. She blinked, swiped at her eyes, and tried to smile toward the doorway. Patty stood there, holding a massive bouquet of bright daffodils that warmed her almost instantly. Special delivery for you, Patty beamed. Serafina stood, met her halfway across the room, and took them. A massive yellow bow tickling her fingers. My favorite. Mr. Stone knows that, too. Her heart melted and she fought the tears. A note dangled from the decorative vase. I get carried away sometimes. Logan. A smile lifted her cheeks as she thanked Patty. Once Patty left, Serafina reached for her phone to call Logan. She had to apologize about last night, too. She scrolled past Vanessa's text she'd sent that morning, mentioning peeking through the peephole and witnessing Logan's protectiveness. Logan had probably reconciled with his girlfriend, since he hadn't offered to talk about it since the gala. But he left two messages apologizing about last night. Logan, I never meant to hurt you. I never mean to. But I end up doing so. Instead of texting him back, she called him. He answered on the third ring. Sarah. He was whispering. Odd that he'd taken his cell phone into a meeting. Did I call you at a bad time? Give me a second. Don't hang up. Silent seconds passed before he spoke again. I was in the boardroom with a couple of executives. No, go back. We'll talk later. Don't worry. I was hoping you'd call. He'd kept his phone close by. On her account? She swallowed. What's up? Thank you for my flowers. Emotion swelled in her throat and she slammed her eyes closed, overwhelmed. You're so... Hush now. His voice was gentle and sweet. Flowers always cheer you up. What happened? She couldn't start blubbering about Eason or anything related to the school while still at work. It's been a hard day. You want me to come over? Of course he'd drop anything to come to her rescue, but he had a business to run. No, your flowers, you're sweet. They were my apology, you know. You don't have to apologize. 
Last night, she'd intended to tell him about another loser looking for a roommate, but she got into defense mode when Logan started in on her with disapproving questions. Clearly, she still needed to learn a thing or two before she went back into dating. Let me know when you're up for giving me another dating lesson. He chuckled. (laughs) When you're having a bad day, it's not good to be talking about dates or having sessions. I'm pretty sure it will be a while before I go on another date. Do me a favor. What's that? As soon as you get home, take a bath and relax, okay? The bath sounded so good after being puked on. I'll come by and take you to dinner. I'm the one who owes you dinner. Don't even think about arguing with me today. His voice was light. Let's just enjoy the reconciliation for a while. Her chest bubbled with a soft chuckle. Feeling so much better, she hung up, and her afternoon wasn't nearly as crazy as the morning. When she got home, the dog wasn't with the sitter. Logan took him for a walk, Mary said. So Serafina headed upstairs, but when she entered the stairwell and walked up the stairs, Daffodil Puddles paved her path up all three flights right to her door. As she followed the yellow brick road, her heartbeat skittered. With her hands shaking, she had to set the vase on the floor before opening the door. The living room smelled of lemon disinfectant and the counter was straightened. A bouquet of daffodils was on the coffee table, another on the dining table, and a third on the counter. Excitement danced in her stomach as she set the vase on the counter to compete with the other. Hello? She called when she started down the hallway, following the trail of petals towards the closed bathroom. Just in case Logan decided to take a shower at her house, which was rare, she knocked, keeping her ear on the door, but it was quiet. When she swung open the door, steam filled the bathroom, and she breathed in the smell of roses. Rose essential oil was one of the most expensive therapeutic oils, but Logan bought it for her ever since she told him it was the perfect stress and anxiety reliever. LED candles flickered alongside the bathtub. Joy and gratitude clenched her chest muscles, pooling tears in her eyes. Logan Stone, she whispered as she walked to her bedroom to strip off her clothes and grabbed a clean towel and clothes to change into after her bath. Logan knew how to cheer her up. If he did this for her, how far did he go for his girlfriend? The tension evaporated as she soaked in the warm water. Every tight muscle loosened while the essential oil seeped deep into her skin. By the time she dried off and returned to the living room, Logan was sitting on the sofa. Chewy was sprawled on his lap and Logan's strong fingers rubbed the dog's back. His gray t-shirt stretched across his broad shoulders as he turned her way. Then he dimmed the sound of the NASCAR race he was watching and motioned for her to join him. Her stomach dipped and her heart raced. Whether she cared to admit it or not, she was in love with Logan Stone. How or when that ever happened, she had no idea. When she sat on the sofa, she stayed at the far end. Electricity crackled between them and she wasn't even comfortable folding her feet on the sofa like she usually did. Scared her knees would rub against his jeans. Do you feel better? She nodded. With evening light radiating through the open kitchen blinds, she motioned around the house. Thanks for the flowers, the bath. It felt really good. The dog sprang from the couch, off to whatever he could find. Logan scooted closer and took her hands in his. His hands were so warm, different from his cold feet. Kindness softened the firm lines of his face. What happened today? A kid threw up on me. She started with something to laugh about to ease the tension she felt. Logan screwed up his face, then scooted back, creating a distance between them. Ew. Tell me you tossed those clothes in the trash. I did. The bath was much needed. Should I start another for you? You might need a hot one to scold your skin. She scooted closer to him, rubbing her shoulder against him. Let me share some of my cooties. Sarah, no. His laughter rang out deep. He shoved her further down the sofa and she forced herself into his space until he pressed his fingers into her ribs, making her squeal as he tickled her. Stop, Logan! She wiggled on the sofa, throwing aimless punches in the air, since he knew how to duck. She couldn't keep her laughter under control long enough to look at him. Stop it! He paused, his fingers warm in her armpits as he gazed at her with a tenderness that stole her breath. You promise not to share your germs? Her throat was too parched to speak, breathless from the activity and longing she could only nod. Silence passed as they settled on the sofa again. After their laughter subsided, he asked about Eason. Did you ever talk to your principal? He must have assumed why she cried earlier. You were right. His stepdad was physically abusing him and his mom. 
Serafina told Logan everything the principal had shared. Do you know where he is? What's going to happen to him? Can we see him? His questions were similar to hers, and her face pinched into a frown as she told him the impossible. We can't do anything about it. He rubbed the bristles on his jaw, staring at the nearest bouquet, as lost in thought as she was. I'll do some research. He took her hand in his. In the meantime, let's go out. She squeezed his hand. How did you have the time to get to my place and get a bath drawn for me? If you mean sprinkling flowers on the stairs, the florist did that. They'll be back to clean up the mess tomorrow. I mean, getting the bath and taking Chewy for a walk? I took the rest of the day off after we hung up. He shrugged as if it wouldn't cost him hours in the office next week as he caught up. Nothing urgent that couldn't happen until Monday. She had no idea what to say. How could she as his mesmerizing gaze seeped into her? Still, she reached over and grasped his hand. For the record, I'm glad you were here last night. Is that so? His eyes crinkled at the corners, the yellow in them becoming brighter. I thought you hit it off with... He still lives with his mom. What's his excuse? He was looking for a roommate, but she couldn't share all the details. Rent is high? Which was true, but not what she needed to hear from a potential spouse. I felt like a loser when you saw through another dud of a date. Logan's disapproval was a luxury she couldn't afford. I'm assuming he forced his way to escort you to the door? I walked to the burger joint around the corner, where we'd agreed to meet. She hugged her arms across her chest. He tried that cheesy thing of feeding me his fries. Ew, Logan winced. Anyway, he insisted on walking me home, despite her telling him she didn't need an escort. It was kind of sweet. He wanted to make sure I made it safely to the door. I'll give him that. His words were stilted, but I don't like that he didn't respect you when you told him you didn't need him to escort you. Were you really going to hit him? She'd never seen him fisting his hands at anyone before. Lucky for him, he left seconds before I threw the punch. He winked and shook a finger at her. And don't laugh, because I'm not joking when I say I can throw a mean punch. I grew up with more brothers than most boys. So you can imagine the fistfights our parents had to break up. Being one of the youngest, I had to learn to defend myself. Done focusing on her pathetic dating life, she asked how things were going for him and Danica. She wants to get back together. Why would any woman let go of Logan? Unless they wanted a commitment, which he wasn't ready to offer. Are you back together? I'm done with that relationship, he said, not seeming bothered or regretful. Not that she wanted them to be together. Three weeks ago, she wanted him to commit to someone. But lately, she wasn't capable of giving him that blessing. But Danica's comment about ultimatums. Was I the reason you broke up? He scowled. It's not about you, Sarah. His tone playful, he used her words against her. We better get going. She hurried back to her room to change. When she returned, he insisted they leave Chewy in the house alone. We've been applying the training lessons on him. It's time to see if he's learned anything. Serafina hadn't expected their dinner to extend into an evening tour of the city in Stone Enterprise's corporate helicopter. In the back of the chopper, she sat across from Logan, the plush leather seat cradling her, and their shoes almost touched as they peered out the window, taking in the city sunset. All along, she thought Logan's penthouse had the best view of the city landmarks. But the Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge, Alcatraz, and Coit Tower, from up high, all were astonishing. This is so beautiful. I thought you'd like it. He pointed out his penthouse. Google offices are over there. Twitter over there. He continued to point out all the city landmarks. The helicopter hovered, passing by, his smile bright underneath the dim interior lighting. Could we fly by my neighborhood? Of course. Logan reached for the headphones on the empty seat next to him and put them on his head. Connor, take us to Hunter's Point, please. Yes, sir. Minutes later, she rubbed a hand on the seatbelt around her waist. From up here, the sun's golden rays radiating on the old buildings made them stand cleaner than they were in real life. Unable to see trash or littered bottles from up here, she viewed her neighborhood differently. Perhaps God had her there for a reason. She wouldn't have met Vanessa. This is so nice. The first offices. Logan pointed to where the first Stone Enterprises office used to be before they bought and rebuilt the massive building in the Bay Area. 
At the time, I was busy traveling the world and investing in companies that needed startups. I didn't expect 70% of them to take off. He then talked about the textile industry he'd started while visiting India and the one he began in Bangladesh. She always knew Logan had all sorts of investments in different countries, but she'd assume he invested in clothing and textile company rather than owned one. I didn't know you were into fashion. You came to mind when the opportunity landed on my lap. Wow, Logan Stone, you continue to amaze me. What's your company's name? She'd look it up online. Lobeek Textiles. He looked out the window. The sky was darkening and city lights were more visible now. A combination of my first name and your last name. She tore her gaze from the majestic scenery to him, but he was looking at the view too. Logan Stone. He was incredible. Knowing how he felt about praises, she kept her compliment basic. You're a sleek businessman. She wanted to say more about his business and him adding her name to it. But once again, her mind was in an uproar as she tried too hard to imagine the extent of what she meant to him. I can't be too safe in business. One crash in the stock market or some instability in a country could bring everything to a halt. Risk defined his career, especially with businesses in other countries. He stifled a yawn and covered his mouth. You had a long day. How long was their helicopter tour going to last? It seemed they were now going in circles. He looked at her and then, I didn't sleep well. Why's that? She knew because she too had tossed and turned last night, stressing over their argument. My mind was far from work all day. Then you called me and were having a bad day. His chest rose and fell. I wasn't going to focus this afternoon. Warmed by his admission, she let his recent heartfelt words of assurance to her replay in her mind. I see a beautiful woman, kind and confident. She scooted forward, reaching for and taking his hand from his lap, and entwined their fingers. You turned my day around. Do you feel better? I felt better the moment we talked at lunch. Emotion welled in her throat. What a day. Eason, then her need to talk to Logan. Her voice cracked. I think... I think I was more sad because you were mad at me. Her heart started racing at the way he was looking at her with tenderness in his eyes. He unclasped their entwined hands and tucked tendrils of her hair behind her ears. Despite the casual top and skirt she'd worn, she'd kept her hair down, something she tried to do ever since Logan commented about her ponytail. I never meant to hurt you. I'm sorry for hurting you yesterday, today, and whenever I say things in the future. It's never intentional. Me too. His touch and proximity stole her breath. Like a wave in the ocean, desire rolled between them as they took each other in. He ran his thumb against her cheek. Tell me I'm not the only one feeling things, Sarah. His voice was romantic, not the casual tone he usually used with her. Tell me. If it's just me, then I'll work through my emotions. I don't know. She was on an emotional roller coaster, but staring into his deep brown eyes, then at the sharp contour of his bearded jaw and down to his chin, her gaze flicked up to his lips without her consent. Her mind screamed. I know I'm falling in love with you. She leaned closer. A shiver went down her spine as she envisioned him kissing her, or vice versa. Assuming you're the real deal, this makes it our third date. Is this when I expect? She kept her gaze down, her cheeks aflame. She was suddenly unsure how to approach the matter. She braved a glance up, knowing what a fool she must look. But Logan leaned even closer. Only if your date is willing. His voice was low, his lips almost touching hers his warm breath somehow sending goosebumps down her spine. Use your eyes to read the signals. When he leans in, his intoxicating scent consumed her nostrils. His breathing was as loud as hers. The moment his lips brushed against hers, her legs nearly buckled as she kissed his mouth with a simple brush of her lips. She felt his surprise in the pause, and she pulled back, sitting straight. He stared at her for a beat, the flicker of confusion on his face expressing how she now felt. But something magical had ignited in their brief kiss. Logan unbuckled his seatbelt and slid to her side, kneeling in front of her. Then his hands cradled her face. Sarah. She parted her mouth to respond, but her tongue was stuck. He didn't wait for her to get her speech back. Instead, his hand snaked around the back of her neck, pulling her closer. She didn't need an invitation to unbuckle and connect her mouth to his. 
His lips moved against hers in a way she felt to the core, a way she'd never felt before. She barely suppressed a moan when his fingers raked through her hair. She drifted her hand into the hair at his nape. It feathered softly against her fingers before they traveled to his neck, to his jaw. His bristled beard scraped the tender flesh of her palm. This was Logan, her best friend. And even as her brain roared in panicked protest, her mouth clung to him, her hands melding to his shoulders. Everything felt right. She felt electricity, sparks, or chemistry, whatever Vanessa called it. When they tore apart, they were both breathless, their rapid breaths louder than the muffled helicopter blades. Logan's face had a shade of pink, his expression as his eyes searched hers betrayed his wonder. Like her, he seemed to be at a loss for words, when he scooted back to his seat, shaking his head and grinning. With her heart beating furiously, she drew out a breath. Then she lifted her fingers to her cheeks, still feeling the warmth of his lips, the slight brush of his beard against her cheek. Kissing was one thing, but that kiss wasn't just any kiss. What just happened? She needed to know if Logan felt the same zap she'd experienced. We kissed. His chest rose and fell beneath his t-shirt. Log. Breathless, she couldn't go on. This kiss might be the beginning to the end of their friendship. Logan didn't do long-term relationships. Was she like the girl he'd shared his first kiss with? The teen had wanted more while he wanted to keep things steady. But now he was looking at her with a heated gaze, as if he wanted a do-over. But then it could be that he was regretting the kiss. What's going to happen to us? She whispered, clenching her hands in her lap. Nothing. He spoke simply. But why should she be surprised by his response? Especially when he clarified, We're still going to be friends. Nothing is going to mess that up. Not even their kiss. Made sense. They were friends who just kissed passionately. The whole thing was a disaster. Their friendship wasn't going to be the same. How was she supposed to look at him the same way after that kiss? We probably shouldn't have. I have no regrets. His lips thinned. But you've made it clear I'm not your type. No hurt feelings, though. We'll always be friends. Why did he sound sad? And why did he seem like he was saying goodbye? He just admitted nothing was going to happen between them. He reached for the headphones and summoned Connor to land whenever he was ready. After putting the headphones down, Logan said, By the way, your mom is coming on Tuesday. She blinked at his sudden statement. So he shrugged. If I told you before, you'd have talked me out of having her come. It's the second to last week of school, and I have a field day, and... Take your mom with you. I don't know what to talk about with her. Your students will be glad to meet your mom. Logan was all business now, as if they hadn't just made out in the back of a helicopter. Plus, you could always use volunteers. Great. Kiss and passion forgotten. Now Serafina's chest ached with a sunken heart. Feeling as if the helicopter blade sliced her into tiny pieces, she struggled to breathe past her shredded lungs. What was wrong with her anyway? A normal person would be excited about seeing her mom. A normal person wouldn't be kissing her best friend. A guy as far from her criteria as Alcatraz from Petraeo Hill. Her lack of interest in mom's visit and her passionate kiss with Logan double confirmed how far she'd slid from achieving a normal life. If she wasn't careful, she'd abandon her goals and let herself be driven by irrational emotions, like her parents had been. Throwing away all hopes and plans of a perfect or even normal life. Chapter 12 That kiss with Serafina was seared deep into Logan's mind and lingered on his mouth for the entire weekend. Never once to desire home church, he opted for one on Sunday, afraid he couldn't look at Serafina the same way. He'd kiss women several times, but he hadn't expected his heart to explode with fireworks. He'd never experienced that with anyone before. Had he ever even been in love before? His friend Serafina had him wondering. Her doubtful expression and her questioning why she'd kissed him had been the rude awakening to his temporary fantasy. They were friends, and the sooner he got his mind wrapped around it, the less awkward things would get. He texted her on Saturday night, giving the excuse he needed to attend an online church in preparation for his upcoming trip on Tuesday. The trip was true. He had to fly to Dubai for a meeting with shareholders and foreign investors for their travel and tourism companies. Logan had also learned on Saturday that his brother Rohan would be in Dubai next week, tending to a merger with a property company. On the bright side, Logan would get to see his brother. With Serafina's mom in town and him traveling, 
Maybe he'd be able to ease back into his normal self with his friend. Monday was chaotic as usual. Since he had to catch up with meetings, he'd had Emma reschedule after Serafina's call on Friday. He'd clung to his phone that day, keeping it on vibrate in his coat when he'd gone for the meetings. And he'd been relieved when she called. But hearing her sadness had been his undoing. Logan wouldn't have settled down and gone through the afternoon knowing she was disheartened. She consumed him more than he cared to admit, and after their kiss, he was starting to understand that he and Serafina might be internally bound by friendship and love. Around 2 p.m. on Monday, he had the chance to sit and email Serafina. He ignored the foreboding clawing at his spine as he copied and pasted the two dating websites Doma, one of his security agents, had emailed him. He could text Serafina, but email was best. She may not read it until the end of the day. Then she'd have time to sleep on the idea of starting another online dating profile. As soon as he sent the email, the desk phone speaker sounded with Emma's voice. Logan pressed the phone. Yes, Emma? Doma is on the line? Let him through. He preferred to speak to his security advisor without the speaker, so he picked up the phone and lifted it to his ear. What's up, Doma? I found some interesting information about Ezen. Logan pushed the phone tight on his ear. You know what foster organization he is with? Or a group home. Poor child. His biological dad is a driver for waste management. Any criminal records? No, actually. I'm going to email you the case background. Logan's chest rose and fell beneath a weight he hadn't known he was carrying for the little boy. He thanked Doma, hung up, and swiveled his chair to the nearest computer, then clicked the email. He was leaving for Dubai tomorrow, then to Singapore the next day, and India later in the week. But today, he had the afternoon to contact social services to clarify Ezen's whereabouts, then compile a to-do list for his assistant, besides confirming if Emma had questions about vendors for Finley Elementary's field day. Vanessa thought she could prepare food for the kids and teachers on field day. Logan would always hire her, but she shied away from large orders. However, he still had to text her to confirm she was planning on catering for Serafina and her mom, Hilda. What he hadn't discussed with Serafina was that her mom was staying until Saturday, almost four days. Hilda's conversations lately tugged at his heart. Her hoarse voice always trembled through the phone as she poured out her regrets and wished she could go back in time. Logan reminded her that no one in the entire world was perfect, except for God. But her heartache was evident in her desire to reconnect with her daughter. Logan hadn't had the chance to connect with his mom since she died in his earliest years. Too young to remember, he couldn't even grasp what his birth mom looked like. Knowing a mother was longing to connect with her child wasn't something he took lightly. So he promised Hilda he'd have his pilot fetch her to surprise her daughter. He made it sound like Serafina would be thrilled to see her, but as much as Sarah dreaded her mom's visit, he intended to pray. With God, perhaps by the end of the week, Serafina and her mom would be at peace and fully reconciled. Serafina woke up Tuesday morning to a text that startled her awake. Logan, I'm at the airport. Kosal is on his way to take you to work. She yawned, squinting at the phone's brightness through her dark room. It was five. She could drive herself, and if Kosal was coming over, she didn't want him waiting on her until seven, when she usually left her house. She flopped on her stomach and typed her response. Serafina, I have a car. Remember? Logan, I didn't realize you have a car. In that case, Kosal will be bringing your mom to work and he will take you both home. Despite Logan's sarcasm, she smiled through her yawn. She was aware of mom's visit. Still, his reminder had her tossing the covers aside and sitting up. Serafina, I thought she arrived at the end of the day. Logan, she'll be there at three. Kosal has passes to various attractions in case you need them. Logan was so out of this world, the kind of man for a girl in search of fun and adventure, since he didn't want a long-term or marriage. Still, she was grateful he took on the responsibility to engage with mom. Serafina, I want to like you, but right now I don't like you. She loved him so much it would sting if any girl were to have him. 
She suddenly wanted to be his girl. If only he was looking for a wife. Logan, it's a good thing we both can't stand each other. He added a gritting emoji before another sentence. Logan, see you Friday. Friday was field day, and he usually planned it into his schedule. Ever since she started teaching at Finley, he'd never missed the kids' field day. He missed a few concerts, but he attended the ones he could whenever he was in town. Serafina, safe travels. Logan, have fun with your mom. Serafina, thanks. She hoped they'd be in touch while he was gone. After the searing kiss she longed to repeat, which was less likely to happen, they were back to being friends again. He'd missed church on Sunday, but surely it wasn't because he was avoiding her. He'd emailed her the dating websites yesterday, sealing their chance to kiss again. He'd even typed in the email, You don't need dating lessons anymore. I have no doubt you'll find Mr. Wright soon. Logan. She'd read and reread that, wishing he'd written something different, or asked her to talk about their heated moment on Friday. Anything to give her hope he wanted something more than friendship. So he knew about her list and the criteria. But if she was learning anything from her dating lessons lately, she was learning to put aside her list. For now, she and Logan were friends, and he made that clear. She stumbled out of bed, turned on the lights, and started her day with prayer. She needed prayer to get through the work week as her mind worked on what to say to her mom for the night or two nights. Wait, how many nights was mom staying? Serafina had been caught off guard when he told her about mom's visit. She hadn't even asked how long she was staying. As Logan had messaged, Kosal picked her up and took her to school. By the end of the day, when she walked into the parking lot, the black Escalade was parked there. Kosal darted out of the car when he saw her approach and swung open the back door. Good afternoon, Serafina. She responded, and through the corner of her eyes, she sighted the outline of the woman in the back seat. Thank you so much for bringing my mom. Kosal smiled shyly, bowing with a curt nod. It was my pleasure. Things got awkward when Serafina slid into the back seat, and he started driving. With her handbag between her feet, she kept the middle seat space between her and mom as she glanced at her wondering whether to shake hands or attempt a side hug. Mom's shoulders were stiff as she fidgeted with her fingers on her lap. There was no doubt as to how Serafina got her fidgeting habit with her nails. But she certainly hadn't gotten her mom's pale blonde hair or her long, thin nose and face. She smiled to ease some tension. Hi, Mom. It was her turn to fidget with her fingernails. Hello, sweetheart. Her voice rasped the way Serafina remembered. But as Mother held Serafina's gaze, the black circles under those amber eyes were worse than Serafina saw her last summer. With Mom's black blouse hanging loosely on her, Serafina's chest clenched as concern softened her. Compelled to do her best, she swallowed, then asked, How was your trip? It was fast. Mom glanced back as they left the school. It was nice to see where you work. Serafina kept her hands on her lap, tinkering with her nails. You'll be coming with me tomorrow. The kids will enjoy meeting someone new. It feels like spring here. We had snow two days ago. At Mom's wonder, Serafina smiled, remembering the unpredictable springs in Colorado. It was June next week, and they just had a blizzard. The ten-minute drive passed pleasantly as they talked about the San Francisco scenery and weather, which wasn't a bad topic given the circumstances. When they got home and Kosal set Mom's luggage into the house, Serafina asked him to stay for dinner just to have someone as a distraction. I have plans. He rubbed the back of his neck as he kept one foot in the door. But thanks for the invite. Of course he had plans now that Logan was gone. This was his week off. Text me if you decide to go anywhere. She shrugged. We'll be fine. She could drive them if they decided to visit the Museum of Modern Art or use any of the other mini passes to attractions Kosal had left on her counter. Serafina took Mom downstairs to get Chewy from Mary, and Mom's eyes shone as she carried the dog into Serafina's apartment. Mom lowered herself to open the kennel, and Chewy leaped for Mom's blue beaded necklace that dangled almost to her waist with her bent over. You always wanted a dog. I did? Serafina didn't even remember. On your seventh birthday. 
Speaking about her birthday wasn't a good conversation to ease their already awkward transition. Can I get you some water or a soda? She'd bought cases of Sprite and Coke, not knowing what mom liked. Anything is fine. Mom continued rubbing the dog's ears. Clearly she had a good touch, since Chewie rolled to his side and she delighted the dog with belly rubs. While mom drank a Sprite, Serafina gave her a tour of her place. Chewie followed them. This is where you'll stay. She set mom's travel bag beside the bed with a gray comforter tucked in. Mom pointed her soda can to the sewing machine beyond the bed. You sew? Not as much as I would like, but yeah. Wow. Like soda fizz, the word bubbled from mom, full of fizzles of awe or delight. When did you learn all that? How many times had she shared her dream of being a fashion designer? Had mom ever heard her? If so, she probably didn't remember. I'm still learning. Serafina pointed to the chest of drawers. You can use that to store your clothes, except the lower drawer. She'd cluttered it with the t-shirts and shorts Logan left last time he stayed the night. She turned off the lights when they left the room, then she led Mom to her room. Mom stood by Serafina's window, fiddling with the lemon print trim on her orange curtains. You've sure made this a cheery place to live. But how do you like the neighborhood? No doubt Mom had noticed the graffiti decorating the building and the trash littering the parking lot. Had it reminded her, too, of some of the communities where they'd lived in Denver? I wanted to be somewhere where it reminded me of my roots. Serafina hadn't meant to sound sarcastic, but that seemed like the right answer. As they returned to the kitchen, she noticed the looseness of Mom's pants. She didn't smell cigarettes like she used to, so why was Mom so skinny? How could Serafina even ask? What are all these? Mom crossed to the bottles and supplies on her counter. Good thing Logan had organized the counter so it was easy to tell the supplies from the empty bottles. The daffodils he'd brought were still vibrant throughout the house. I make gifts for the teachers at the end of the year. I'll be glad to help. Mom reached for the jar of shea butter. What do you intend to make with this? Lip balm. I also plan to make sugar scrubs and body sprays. I didn't realize my child had so many talents. Her compliment was so genuine. Despite herself, Serafina smiled. Thank you. Mom kept assessing the supplies on her counter, one at a time, and asking what ingredient was needed for each task. By the time Vanessa knocked on the door with dinner, Mom had grouped the ingredients into three sections, organizing them for the three crafts Serafina had been procrastinating to make. Dinner time! Vanessa beamed, jostling her way in with a bag full of food. Juicy flavors followed her as she set it on the counter. Hi, Vanessa! Serafina hugged her friend, then stepped back and waved toward her mother. This is... Before she or mom could say a word, Vanessa walked around the counter and wrapped her arms around mom. So wonderful to meet you, Mrs. Bianchi! Mom stood there with her arms stiff at her sides, hesitant to embrace Vanessa, but Serafina's friend didn't give Mom a choice. Hugs weren't something they'd practiced in their house, but Vanessa didn't know that. Vanessa scooted back, still holding Mom at arm's length. What do you think of San Francisco so far? I haven't seen much. Mom dipped her head, smoothed wispy blonde hair back into her ponytail, then peeped up. Her expression softened as she met Serafina's gaze across the counter. But I like being here. Serafina wanted her mom, and she was going to do her best to force the connection. Perhaps this summer they'd be close so they could go places together, do their nails and hair at a salon. Mom could use a hairdo. Vanessa moved back to the counter, unzipped the food bag, and pulled out clear rectangular containers of her brisket. When she texted Serafina to let her know Logan had hired her to provide dinners that week, Serafina had requested a brisket since it was one of the meals Vanessa not only liked to make, but also to eat. Having Vanessa stay for dinner helped because her friend had the right questions to move their conversations along. All questions mom answered, which let Serafina ask more questions and get a hint of where mom liked to eat, her newfound love for cooking, and the spinning classes she talked about on the phone. 
The following day, Mom went with her to school and read to the kids during story time. She even helped at recess and lunch duty. After school, Serafina took Mom to the Museum of Modern Art. Last night's conversations revealed Mom's love of art. The next day, Mom came to school with her again and seemed to enjoy interacting with Serafina's students, even with the challenging kids. Then they made body sprays and sugar scrubs. Serafina hovered as Mom mixed the sugar scrub, her feelings for Logan swirling through her. Logan had long since blended into a part of her, like the honey blending with the coconut oil, until the two of them were inseparable. But these new feelings? She wasn't sure how to separate or store them. What was it like with Dad? Mom stirring slowed. She tipped her face at Serafina over her shoulder, one brow arching. What do you mean? I mean, your love life with Dad. Was that what she meant? What made you decide to get married? Your dad and I, we were so in love that he'd do anything for me. Mom's whole posture softened. She twirled the spoon through the mixture. He was a good man, Serafina. I probably shouldn't have agreed to marry him. I brought him down. I'm the one who introduced him to gambling and other habits he didn't have when we met. If he'd married someone else, his daughter might have grown up in a stable home. I'm sorry about that. Mom opened the sugar jar and measured some in, then laughed. Oh my, but we had good times. He took me on so many adventures. Of course that dwindled when we started. Serafina rubbed her mom's arm, conveying her understanding about mom's regrets. As they tied ribbons on the containers the next night, evening light streamed through the kitchen windows, and mom raved about Logan and his financial support. She touched Serafina's hand. Of course, your King Scooper gift cards are always handy. Thank you. Serafina turned her hand to return Mom's squeeze, then smoothed out an orange ribbon with yellow polka dots on the sugar scrub for Patty. It's been interesting this year. I can't express how grateful I am for the sponsor in my gambling class and the accountability partners in my accountability class. Knowing they are there for me, knowing that they've been through what I'm dealing with, well, it makes a huge difference but I still have so many sleepless nights, caused by past guilt. As her words whisked away the last of Serafina's doubts, she buried Mom's hand under hers. We all have regrets, Mom. No wonder Mom had black circles under her eyes. After Dad died, I had so many regrets for not staying in touch. Serafina closed her eyes. How would she have moved on if it weren't for God's and Logan's continual reminders not to dwell on the past? She inhaled and pushed out words. Without God? I've been reading the Bible. She blinked. You have? Logan always prays for me on the phone. Once, he told me I can try to fix everything, but without God, it would be meaningless. I've been going to church and made some special friends with the ladies there. Her smile wobbled and her head dipped again. They know about me but they don't act like they do, you know? Like I'm no different from them, like we're all sinners. Serafina shuddered and gasped as her tears blurred her vision. Whenever mom called Logan, he spoke to her like a son and prayed for her, telling her about God while Serafina was always ready to hang up before mom even started talking. I know Logan helps me because of you. Serafina braced a hand on the table to balance herself, her mind spinning once again. How did she get so lucky to have such a friend? I didn't mean to make you cry. Mom reached across the little bistro table and took Serafina's hand in her calloused ones. One of the bottles tipped over. Please tell me you and Logan are more than just friends. Serafina jerked, her cheeks heating up. Are you more? No. Mom's amber eyes shone in the evening light. He's one in a million. I know. Then why aren't you two together? As the memory of their kiss bombarded her and blood rushed through her, Serafina freed her hands, then hugged her arms across the sudden hollowness in her chest, a space Logan could fill so easily. It's just, he's, we have different goals. Mom eyed her, undoubtedly noticing her flushed cheeks. Then mom leaned back against the chair, her shoulders slumping. You spent your whole childhood trying to be an adult. Huh. Seemed she was still doing that, still chasing a dream of being the perfect adult, 
having the perfect life, giving children the perfect childhood. Don't let time slip away by searching for something that doesn't exist. Did Logan tell mom about her list for a husband? Sometimes what you're looking for is right in front of you. Mom's words weighed heavily on Serafina's heart. The next day after school, Serafina used some of the vouchers Logan had left them and took mom on the Volkswagen bus tour. They took selfies as Serafina told mom about her favorite spots in the city. I like to watch classic movies when they stream them at Golden Gate Park. It took her back in time to the one movie in the park she and Logan had managed to watch when they'd snuck out of their homes one evening. Mom's eyes widened under the dim bus lights. I didn't know you loved classic movies. Your dad loved classics when I met him. I don't think we ever watched them with you, though. By then... Serafina rubbed Mom's arm, wordlessly letting her know she didn't need to say anything more. That night, she took Mom to the salon, and they both got their hair and nails done. Luckily, Manny Petties and hair were affordable in her neighborhood. The more time Serafina spent with her mom, the less foreign she was becoming, and the week was going fast. Their growing relationship and mom's precious words of encouragement, saying how proud she was of her, made Serafina regret the time they'd missed. Before they went to bed Thursday, she promised to visit mom in Denver as soon as school was out in June. Perhaps she and mom could check out some of the Denver landmarks and her favorite places in Colorado while they caught up. Friday rolled in, and her anticipation turned to adrenaline as she made the lemonade and ginger tea mix to put into the thermos. Field day always excited her, but today, the anticipation was more about Logan coming. Although she'd been tempted to email him, he hadn't emailed her, so she let him focus on his work while he was abroad. Besides, she'd been busy with mom. The day offered a clear blue sky, the perfect mid-morning for the kids' events when she stood with her mom and several teachers at their stations. The children's squeals rang out from the playground as they waited for the event. The events would be two classes at a time, rather than have the entire school swarm the small field. A beanbag toss should be fun for all the kids to manage, music boon from the white tent across the field, and one of the tents beside that, Vanessa was setting up her food with several helpers she hired for the day. All thanks to Logan. For the vendors he'd hired, including Vanessa to cater the event, the graffiti track with two big machines would no doubt be the kids' favorite stop. Slushies and smoothies would be refreshing on a sunny day. Serafina craned her neck to the left, toward the parking lot where a few kids trickled toward the field. Where was Logan? She patted her shorts pockets to get her phone in case he texted. When does the event start? Mom's voice had Serafina churning. She checked the time on her phone. 10.20. In 10 minutes. You might want to grab a seat. Mom had been frail, although she hadn't complained about being sick. Serafina pointed to the cluster of chairs set up in the shade. I brought that yellow and orange striped camp chair. For you, Mom. I'm fine. Mom shaded her eyes from the sun's glare, turning her back to Serafina. Don't fret about me. Logan hadn't texted yet. Maybe he hadn't come back from Dubai, or whatever other cities he'd visited. Serafina set her phone in the cup holder in Mom's chair and popped her knuckles as she peered across the field. Then she saw him, and her heart galloped. The patchy yellow grass was a stark contrast to his handsome face that basked in the mid-morning sunshine. Dressed in cargo shorts with a black ball cap, black sunglasses, and a black t-shirt stretched taut across his shoulders and chest. He looked ready for the day, and killer handsome. Logan's here. She turned to her mom, who shaded her hand over her eyes, and peered through the people on the lawn. Where? His presence hit Serafina all at once. He wasn't here just for the kids, but for her too. Everything he did for the people in her life, including her school and its staff, Vanessa and the homeless at their apartment building, Mom, Serafina fought the tears now, welling up in her eyes. I'll go get him. She didn't wait for Mom's response, but sprinted. Dry grass crunching beneath her Converse All-Stars. Despite how they'd left things before his trip, Logan was here, keeping his engagement as promised. She would take him in any form, friends or more, as long as he was still in her life. Before he could notice, she squealed and lunged at him, throwing her arms around his neck. Whoa! He almost stumbled, then his hands wrapped around her waist and he lifted her and swung her in a circle, before setting her down. Someone is happy to see me. 
I missed you. She hugged him tight, inhaling the clean and fancy scent of him, feeling whole and complete. Am I late? He asked when she stepped back. A half grin split his face as he slid his sunglasses up to the top of his head. She clasped her hands in front of her, breathless. Just in time. He patted his pockets, retrieved two stones, and handed them to her. Dubai and India. Thank you. She wanted to throw herself at him again. The urge to kiss him was high, but they decided where the relationship stood. Still, her face was beginning to ache from the ridiculous grin her wonder plastered across it. I brought you some lemonade. She shoved the rocks in her shorts pockets, intending to assess them later. You brought it here? He gave her a sideways glance as they crossed the field. It's in the thermos in the cooler. He reached out for her hand, his thumb rubbing over hers before he entwined their hands. Good thing I came then. He squeezed her hand. I see Hilda's here. How did it go? It was wonderful. Serafina's stomach did a slow roll when she looked into his eyes, and she struggled to put into words how much his push to bring mom had meant. I'll tell you all about it soon. They swung their arms as if they were the only ones on the field. Her colleagues knew they were just friends, so holding hands shouldn't be foreign to anyone. When they joined mom, she beamed at him. Hilda. Logan unclasped Serafina's hand and sped toward mom. When mom stood, Logan pulled her into an embrace. Mom wasn't as stiff as she'd been when Vanessa hugged her. Maybe she was getting used to the hugs. Serafina might hug her when she said goodbye tomorrow. The festivities started, and Logan cheered on the kids as he worked beside Serafina to hand them beanbags. This would be a good activity to add to the reunion games, for the kids' sake, he said. My little nieces and nephews could probably do this. Cheer filled the entire field, and the air vibrated with kids' laughter. Serafina's heart warmed at the kids' toothless grins as they held colorful snow cones. Too bad Eason wasn't here, the only student who'd left before the school year ended. Although busy in her own life, she'd kept Eason in her heart in prayers. Surely God was watching over him. It's the last Friday of the month. Logan stopped between her and Mom. Isn't Casablanca playing at Golden Gate Park? You remembered. She told him in April, when the May movie in the park schedule came through. You already watched breakfast at Tiffany's with me this month. He winked at Mom. It would be nice for Hilda to see some of your favorites. Serafina moved to where she could see Mom and tipped her head. I think Mom would love Joseph in the amazing Technicolor coat, too. One of Logan's favorite movies. Mom beamed. Is that the musical with Donny Osmond? Logan nodded, but you guys don't have to. At your house tonight. Serafina cut Logan off before he backed out. Logan has a theater in his penthouse. She raised her chin, daring anyone to argue. And I'm making dinner. Logan shook his head and his mouth parted to object. Don't you dare argue with me, Logan Stone. Mom chuckled, drawing Serafina's gaze. You two are so funny. Logan raised his hands and surrendered. She wins this time. His gaze flicked to her, and he arched a brow. What are you cooking? Her heart raced at the way he was staring down at her, and the air left her lungs. She didn't cook a lot of things, but she'd mastered all his favorite meals. Chicken parmesan. And he beamed. Chapter 13 Wednesday afternoon, Logan sat across from a tan-skinned man with an unkept beard. Wrinkles and made him appear older than his 29 years. No doubt his work as a garbage truck driver wasn't easy. After Doma forwarded the name of Eason's biological father and the details of why Gonzalo wasn't involved in Eason's life, Logan had called the man, summoning him for a meeting. Gonzalo's presence in Logan's office was proof he loved his son and wanted to know what Logan had to say. How do you know Eason again? Gonzalo's Hispanic accent was as thick as the man's eyebrows, yet tenderness softened his scruffy appearance. My girlfriend. What did I just call Serafina? Logan had to peer through the window at the skyscrapers, needing to correct his statement, but Gonzalo didn't need to know about Logan's dilemma with Serafina. They were sort of back to the friend zone, only worse now, that they'd exchanged heated glances and carefully articulated their sentences. 
both afraid to say the wrong thing. It had been a relief to hear Hilda laugh with Serafina as they cooked dinner in his kitchen. While they ate the chicken parm, Hilda talked about having made her peace with God two months ago. His heart expanded and he could barely focus on his favorite musical when they watched it in the theater. Joseph was the first movie he'd watched in Regina and Kyle's house, A Warm Home. The movie had become his favorite since then. On Saturday, he didn't see Serafina since he'd wanted to let her spend time with her mom before she returned to Denver that night. He'd seen her at church on Sunday, and they'd had an early lunch together. He'd also seen her last night at the kindergarten graduation. He met the man's awaiting gaze. She used to be your son's teacher. Is my son going to be okay? He's not sick. The man's concerned voice tugged at Logan's heart. Besides what Logan had learned about Gonzalo, he wanted to hear from the man himself. Why are you not a part of your child's life? Gonzalo let out a mirthless laugh before he retrieved his wallet from the chest pocket of his overly worn brown shirt. He flipped open the wallet, showing a photo of an 8-10 to month old baby with a broad smile. This is Ethan. Logan leaned forward to study the photo, then looked up to Gonzalo for any resemblance, besides the dark hair. The baby's flat nose resembled Gonzalo's, but what pierced through Logan's chest was the little guy's innocence and happiness. That was robbed the moment his mom married the wrong man. That was the last time I saw him. Gonzalo's voice cracked as he relayed what Logan already knew from the man's background check. I fought to be in his life. Judges tend to favor moms. Gonzalo expressed his pain and longing for his son. His tearful eyes confirmed the man's words, and Logan fought the emotion clogging his own throat. Then he told Gonzalo about Ezen's current situation. If you want to claim your son, I can help you. You can? Gonzalo's head jerked up, his eyes widening. Logan would have to keep tabs on Gonzalo to make sure Ezen wasn't in the hands of another abuser. Background checks didn't specify people's personalities unless they'd been in jail before. Having started several orphanages throughout the world, Stone Enterprises also supported foster homes in San Francisco and extra charities, so Logan could contact the right people as far as Ezen was concerned. He's in a temporary foster home. Why are you helping me? He didn't need to tell Gonzalo about his childhood. Because every child deserves to be loved. That summed it up. Gonzalo lived in a trailer home with his married brother. Obviously, he couldn't afford to pay rent, but Logan had to pretend he didn't know Gonzalo's career. Having a steady job will put you in good standing with the judge and prove you can take care of your son. Driving a garbage truck doesn't pay much. Do you enjoy being a trash driver? Gonzalo shrugged. Hard to find work when you didn't go to school. Logan would ensure Ezen didn't have to worry about his well-being, but he'd start by befriending Gonzalo. He and Serafina, especially Serafina, could then stay connected with Ezen. The kid might need some constants as he adjusted to his new life. If you'd like a job with my company, let me know and I'll have my HR manager get back to you. Me? Gonzalo glanced down at his shirt, then peered around Logan's office. You'd hire me? They always had entry-level positions, though Logan had no idea which one in particular. HR would know, but even a janitor at Stone Enterprises offices had employee benefits Gonzalo didn't have at his current job. Gonzalo thanked him over and over again, but Logan struggled with the man's gratitude. He glanced at his watch, 1245. He was doing this for Ezen to have a stable childhood. It was the right thing to do, yet deep down, he questioned his motives. Okay, it had nothing to do with his uncle's disdaining words or proving him wrong. It was about Ezen and Logan rescuing the boy from men like his uncle. After Logan said goodbye with a promise to connect with social services, the man beamed as Logan walked him out. Logan shook the man's calloused hand one more time before Gonzalo strode toward the elevator. Logan returned to his office, his heart light that he'd accomplished something. Ready for your lunch, Mr. Stone? Emma asked from the reception desk. Logan walked toward his assistant and rested his hands on her white sandstone desk. 
Emma's blue eyes sparkled in the natural light, streaming through the windows by the seating area behind her. The twenty-something seemingly boundless energy sometimes made him feel old and tired. Lunch, huh? He wasn't even hungry, too happy with the way things had gone. You should eat on time today. She knew his afternoon schedule better than he did. Unless I have an engagement soon. Not for another two hours. Perfect. Order something different from my usual lunch salad. Just surprise me. They had a cafe in the building, and free lunches were one of Stone Enterprise's employee perks. But he had no idea what else they had on the menu, since he usually ate the same meal. I know what you'll like. Emma stuffed the edge of her blouse into her pencil skirt. Anything to drink besides water? Just water. And thanks, Emma. Logan waved before returning to his office. He needed to text Serafina an update about Gonzalo. When he sat and reached for his phone, a grin split across his face. He pressed her name and brought up the photo she texted him of the students having breakfast that morning with a text message. Serafina, one more day with these cuties. Fighting the urge to call her, he touched the teary emoji she added. But she was busy, this being her last day of school. He pictured her crying as she hugged the students one by one in their line after recess. Just like she'd done last night at the kids' graduation party, as she handed them gift bags with lip balms and interactive photos of each student she'd taken throughout the school year to capture a fun memory. Was there any woman besides his mom who gave selflessly without expecting a reward? In two days, they'd be celebrating with friends in honor of Serafina finishing the school year. Then she'd be gone for two weeks to visit her mom. With the effort Serafina, Emma, and Iris put in, the reunion was set to go, as long as the vendor showed up come mid-July. Logan's phone rang, and he startled, the phone sliding and thudding on the table before he saw the caller. His heart leaped, anticipating hearing Serafina's sweet voice. Huh. Just an unknown caller. So he ignored the call. Seconds later, Emma's voice sounded through the speaker on the desk phone. Your lunch is on its way, but you also have a call from Denver Health? Hmm. Why? They said it's urgent. Let it through. He had family in Colorado, and Serafina's only family member, but he hadn't expected to speak to a doctor he'd never met. You're one of the two emergency contacts listed for Hilda Bianchi? His heart started pounding. Yes, I know Hilda. She was brought by ambulance this morning. She had a brain hemorrhage and other... Had, as in past tense. We did our best, but the chronic obstructive pulmonary... No, no, no. Logan shouted over the doctor's words. Then he stood, furiously raking his fingers through his hair. Serafina. Her daughter? How was he going to tell Sarah? We tried to reach her, but her phone went to voicemail. How long have you been aware of her illness? Are you her doctor? Are you sure she's dead? He needed to ask so many questions, but his mind was whirling, too scattered to grasp the doctor's response on the other end. Bottom line, Hilda was dead. Call me back so we can work out the details. The man must have sensed Logan's instability and promised he'd call Logan's assistant and leave his cell number in case Logan had any more questions. Logan was hot, then cold. He tossed the phone down and yanked his shirt from his pants. He paced around his office as he took in the hazy skyline, or so it appeared with his vision blurring. Serafina. His Sarah had lost the only family she had. Of course she'd always have Logan and his family, but... He stilled, sucked in a breath, and slammed his eyes shut. God, please be with Sarah. She was going to be devastated, no doubt blaming herself once again for not being a good daughter. He opened his eyes and crossed to the corner. Then he flopped onto the sofa and forked his fingers through his hair, tugging at the roots again. He would wait until Serafina was out of school to let her know. While he waited, he needed to make arrangements for Denver arrangements for the funeral. He'd paid for a plot to bury Serafina's father and a space beside it, 
since he'd assumed someday Hilda would want to be buried next to her husband. A knock tapped on the door, and Emma appeared with a tray of food. I don't need lunch. The tray wobbled as she jerked back a step. Are you okay? He stayed on the sofa and suppressed a shudder. Clear my schedule from now for the next full week. Emma set the tray on the table, then moved closer to the sofa. Is your family okay? No, Sarah's mom. Emma frowned, her expression crumpling. Is there anything I can do? Just the schedule. I'm so sorry. So was he. Just like that, a life was snatched from Logan's family. Sarah was family, and anything taken from her was taken from him too. After informing the pilot to be on standby for a flight to Denver that night, Logan went to pack a duffel bag before heading to Serafina's apartment and paying Mary to stay with Chewy for a few days. He'd called Mom. She and Dad offered to make arrangements with a funeral home as soon as Logan updated them with Serafina's input. Just take care of Serafina. Mom said. We'll handle the rest. Being ready to go meant he could take care of Serafina and help her pack. No doubt that would be the last thing on her mind. With her house straightened and the two plates in her sink cleaned, he dried his hands on a paper towel and tossed it in the trash can under the sink. When the front door clicked open, he stepped out of the kitchen and jogged around the counter, reaching the door as she closed it behind her. Logan! She gasped and the open box in her hand shook. I thought you were at work. How could he tell her this? With his chest heavy, he stared into her wide brown eyes. If she was surprised now, wait until she heard the shock. He took the box of supplies from her, knickknacks she kept at school but brought home at the end of the school year. I gotta go back and get more things from the car. Can we sit for a bit? She was going to need it. She tossed her purse on the floor, then scowled at him. Why are you acting all weird? Sarah. He put his hands on her shoulders. His chest rose and fell, and his eyes burned. It's your mom. What? She jerked out of his touch and bent to unzip her purse, retrieving her phone. Why are you crying? What's wrong with my mom? Her thumb scrolled through the phone. I have missed calls. Is Ma- Is Mom okay? She's dead, Sarah. No! She tossed the phone on the floor. No! I'm going to see her next week! She circled the small living room. Both hands flew to her hair, and the agony in her face pierced his heart. He moved to her side, pulling her in his arms. I should have! Sob shook her body her tears seeping through his t-shirt. He slammed his eyes shut, sending two tears plunging as he inhaled the subtle scent in her hair. Please tell me it's not true. We're going to get through this, sweetheart. He had no idea how long it would take to overcome such a tragedy. He rubbed her back, hoping to loosen the tight muscles. After several minutes, he eased out of the embrace and took her hand, leading her to the sofa. She rested her head on his chest and cried until her wails turned to soft whimpers. As soon as light streamed through the window, he stared at the wilted flowers on the coffee table and the kitchen counter, flowers from almost two weeks ago. Once vibrant, now withered and ready for the trash, they'd be forgotten as if they hadn't brightened Serafina's day when she needed it most. Today was dark, a day flowers weren't enough to cheer him or her up. That was just the nature of life. It brought to mind the words Eric always quoted from the Bible as he dealt with tragic events in his life. Humans blossomed like flowers and then withered like a passing shadow, quickly disappearing. Chapter 14 Serafina sat in the chapel with about 60 people, all gathered to honor her mom. Vanessa sat on her left, a box of tissues in hand, ready for whenever Serafina needed one. Logan at her right, now and then rubbed her back, warmth from his comforting and strong hand seeping through her black dress. They'd landed in Denver two nights ago, and he'd stayed by her side since then. She'd wanted to stay at Mom's two-bedroom townhouse, 
hoping for a sense of closure. After the landlord let them in, Serafina found Mom's photos in a box on the nightstand. She and Logan had gone through them on the sofa. Most photos displayed special moments of Serafina's life, as well as the annual school portraits and the few she'd sent Mom after Dad died. Knowing Mom kept her photos next to her bed had stirred a sharp pain in her chest. And as her tears welled up, Logan snugged her in his arms. Comforted by his familiar eucalyptus scent, she'd eventually drifted off to sleep. The next day on Thursday, after an entire day with Logan's family helping with the funeral arrangements, Serafina slept in Mom's room, and Vanessa had flown in. Vanessa stayed in the spare room while Logan slept on the sofa, even after Serafina told him she'd be fine with Vanessa being there. There's a time for everything. The pastor's words pulled her back to the present. His bald head shone under the altar lights above him. A time to be born and a time to die. She sniffled and wiped her nose with the scrunched tissue in her hand. The subtle scent of roses sweetened the air. Leave it to Logan and his family to help. And they went above and beyond. Flowers overflowed the altar all the way to the mahogany casket. The image of Mom's lifeless body was seared in her brain, and she didn't need to look into the casket to know she was pale. Not the way she'd looked when she left San Francisco over a week ago. With tears blinding her vision, Serafina twisted her neck and took in the congregation, dressed formally, mostly in black. Half of the chapel was Logan's family, friends of his and hers, and some of her colleagues from her previous school in Finley Elementary. Like a heaven-sent spotlight, sunlight streamed through the stained glass behind the altar to cast a celestial path onto the coffin, as if confirming the pastor saying angels were rejoicing for Mom's arrival in heaven. Everything seemed surreal. She'd said goodbye to mom, and four days later, mom had been attacked by an intense headache that caused her brain to bleed. The diagnosis had been confirmed, brain hemorrhage, caused by other diseases, including a stroke. If mom hadn't abused her body with all sorts of smoke inhalation and alcohol, would she still maybe be alive? Either way, had mom sensed her days on earth were coming to an end? It still didn't make sense that her doctor didn't see the signs earlier since Logan paid for mom's insurance so she could have her annual doctor visits. That was if mom took her health seriously. If Logan hadn't insisted on flying mom to San Francisco when he did, Serafina would be drowning in more regrets. She still carried the guilt from her failure to connect with dad, but regrets were becoming the story of her life. No one knows the day or the hour. She refocused on the pastor's words before he finished and asked everyone to stand. The singer came to the stage beside the coffin. The dark-skinned woman reminded them to look at the obituary, where the words of the hymn had been printed out. Serafina had chosen the song, It Is Well With My Soul. After Mom shared her newfound faith, Serafina took comfort in knowing she'd see her again someday. Mom wouldn't have to suffer anymore. After the service, they gathered in the reception room across from the chapel, and she stood at the door greeting and thanking people for coming. Hello again. The pastor shook her hand, enveloping her fingers in his gentle clasp and her person in his kind gaze. I'm so sorry for your loss. She squeezed his hand back. Thank you for leading Mom's homecoming service. And for your call Thursday morning, I was... No, I am... So grateful to have met you, and to know Mom had you as her pastor. Knowing he'd been a part of Mom's life added so much more meaning to the service. Her throat closed over. Dad died without finding peace with God. We're blessed to have Hilda safely in our fold. The pastor patted her hand once more, then walked on, letting her greet more people, including some new friends Mom connected with through her church and her support group. Vanessa has fixed you a plate. Logan's breath was warm in her ear. Serafina stopped short of greeting the next person in line and turned to Logan. He looked handsome in his dark suit. I'm not hungry. Genuine concern darkened his gaze, the same way she'd seen the last few days. You have to eat something. The least she could do was try for his sake. He'd gone above and beyond. I'll be there in a few. She finished greeting everyone who shared personal reminiscences about her mom, and she reflected on the one thing they had in common. 
They all said how mom talked about Serafina with fondness. Her heart clutched, yet she couldn't erase what had happened. The rest of the reception went smoothly. Logan's family moved from table to table and interacted with the guests. They'd really stepped up, and Serafina had no doubt she still had a family with Logan and his family. His parents and friends had traveled three hours to get to Denver, and his siblings flew from different areas to be here for her. How could she not consider them family? Soon, most people left except for Vanessa and Logan's family and Bryce, who stood chatting in the brightly lit room. She walked to Regina, who was talking to one of the workers she'd hired to cater lunch. Regina turned as Serafina approached, and sadness gleamed in her golden eyes. Hello, my darling. She stepped away from the person she was talking to and wrapped Serafina in a tight embrace. You should be off your feet. Serafina breathed in the scent of jasmine. Regina's black dress was soft against her cheek as she savored Regina's warm and motherly embrace. The act reminded her of the one time she'd hugged her mom at the airport when she said goodbye. She couldn't embrace mom again. Tears burned her eyes and she tightened her grip on Logan's mom. Thank you for coming. Oh, my darling. Regina pulled out of the embrace and wiped the tears from Serafina's face, kindness flowing through her words. Kyle and I will stay in Denver as long as you're in town. You've helped so much, Serafina sniffled. I'll probably head back to San Francisco soon. She hadn't asked Logan when he'd scheduled the jet to take them back. Kyle, a tall, nicely groomed man, dressed in a black suit like most of the men, slid next to his wife. He nodded toward Serafina. I hope you can come with us to the peak for a few days. Their mountain home would be a good place to think and unwind. Thanks for the invitation, but I need some time alone now. I'm looking forward to the reunion, though, which was less than a month away. All the stone siblings who were in attendance surrounded her now, as well as their parents. Logan's siblings and friend Bryce, Logan's sister-in-law Joy, and Bryce's wife Liberty, the latter two ladies both gentle, people with flawless brown skin. Iris squeezed between one of her sisters and Serafina, then threw her arms around Serafina, squishing her in a genuine sweet embrace. When Iris drew back, her eyes danced with kindness. She was the only biological child in the family, and it was visible in the way she had her mom's eyes and her dad's smile. I thought you could use another hug. Serafina needed it. Thank you. Just like that, everyone followed Iris and took turns embracing Serafina again. She could hear Logan behind her, telling his siblings not to stifle her. At some point, they walked out to the parking lot where Vanessa told her she needed to head to the airport. Everyone decided to leave then. Logan and Serafina intended to drive Vanessa to the airport after they left the cemetery. Her friend had to shop for supplies for her food truck tomorrow. Chatter and laughter rang on the sidewalk from Logan's family and friends as Serafina and Vanessa followed the big group. Do you have time to eat something before you go? Serafina checked her watch. Hmm, 420. We ate not long ago. Maybe only Serafina was hungry, since she'd just nibbled a few bites of her lunch. Taking a deep breath, she tipped her head up, taking in the gray sky day as well, so fitting for the sad day. At least being around Logan's big, loud family didn't feel as lonely. She stopped walking when Vanessa tugged her hand and then spoke in a hushed voice. Did Logan's parents purposely adopt handsome boys or what? Serafina would have agreed with Vanessa if she hadn't met Logan years ago and known the scrawny boy Regina adopted. Nice looking, yes, but nothing like the man he'd grown into, despite the confidence he'd put on at a young age. Logan's brothers are still single, except Eric. Eric is the founder of Stone Enterprises, right? Yes. Her friend sounded like she was crushing on one of Eric's brothers. What happened to Pax? We broke up not long after your gala. Why didn't you tell me anything? Your love life's been more interesting than mine. Pax and Vanessa seemed to have hit it off. What happened? Vanessa squished her face. Chemistry? I didn't want to waste his or my time, you know? Serafina understood a bit. She had her criteria after all. Except she hadn't thought about looking at her list ever since she kissed Logan. She checked out the dating websites Logan emailed her, 
But opening an account? Well, it didn't feel right when all she thought about was Logan. She'd never kiss anyone else, not after the best kiss of her life she'd had with her best friend. As if reading her mind, Vanessa nudged her. You and Logan resolve things after that kiss? By resolving things? Moving from the friend to dating zone? No, no. She wasn't going to talk about her feelings for Logan right now, when all she needed was a friend. She switched the conversation back to Vanessa. The Stone Brothers would be an interesting topic. The family had now arrived at the parking lot and stood in a loose circle by the flower garden. Logan had Nate in a headlock. Which one of the brothers sparked your interest? Vanessa lowered her voice. Nate? Serafina needed to clarify. No way Vanessa remembered all of the siblings' names when Serafina just introduced her earlier. The one wrestling with Logan? That jaw and those eyes? Vanessa spoke dreamily as she peeped at the guys through her long eyelashes. He's the wrong brother to be attracted to. That's what you said about Logan. Serafina couldn't argue about her feelings for Logan and whatever she thought of him. Nate always has a different model clutching his hand on the magazines. Or at least from the online rumors. It seemed he was dating or breaking up with someone new all the time. It could be rumors. He loves the spotlight. His hair was always perfectly coiffed, not a strand out of place, and his lightheartedness made him charming. But he had heartbreak written all over him. He races cars. She and Logan and his family were going to watch one of his races in the last week of June. I say you go for a different brother. Vanessa nodded, her chin rising. I shook hands with all of them, but I felt something with Nate. I guess love can make the impossible happen. Trust me, if I only have one date with him, I'd see to it that he never looks at those models again. Vanessa was more of a go-getter than Serafina. I can put in a word for you if you want me to. That would be desperate. Vanessa gave a dismissive wave. Maybe one of these days I'll tag along when you go to their house for a Christmas party or something. It's not too late to change your mind about the reunion. Nate will be there. July is my busiest month. Just keep me posted on future trips to the stone events. Long after everyone had left, Serafina and Logan dropped Vanessa off at the airport. Then he drove Serafina back to Mom's house. Serafina suggested he spend a night with his family at their hotel suite or go to Pleasant View, an hour away via the private jet. I took a week off. I'm here for you. He crossed his legs, leaning against the kitchen wall. You've been... She hugged her arms around herself, standing by the opposite wall, having no idea how to put it into words. Thank you. He'd been her rock through everything. I'd be lost without you. I'll give you some space. I'll be back tomorrow. His eyes so brown and tired searched hers. Be here at 11. I'm taking you somewhere. Her chest swelled in anticipation. Suddenly breathless, she tried not to think of their relationship beyond friendship. Night. He crossed over and leaned into her, pressing a feathery kiss on her cheek and leaving a trail of heat surging through her once again. She didn't move, her knees too weak. She could only stare as he walked to the door and closed it behind him. Chapter 15 With his hand warm in Serafina's, Logan weaved through various single-family homes built in the 1940s. There wasn't a path, but with each step through empty beer bottles and cans and other debris, the earth beneath their feet felt familiar. Oh, Logan, her voice cracked. Is this the place, I think? Her voice trailed to the same question she asked the moment he'd driven into their old neighborhood where they'd met years ago. The idea had occurred to him during the funeral. Perhaps they both needed to revisit their old neighborhood. He had sour memories and hoped visiting Memory Lane would help him appreciate God's goodness when he considered how far God had brought him. When he picked Serafina up at 11, she'd been waiting on the front porch as if she couldn't wait to leave the house. He'd taken her to a nearby restaurant for breakfast before driving here. With marijuana tinging the air, a slight breeze whisked past, the air cooler than what San Francisco would be this time of year, despite the sun shining high above. 
Music blasted through the windows, most with ripped curtains or stained blinds. New skyscrapers and tall apartments had been built in the nearby Denver neighborhoods. But this one was still the same as, if not worse than, years ago. A developer would have to buy the entire community and demolish the place. Then the people living here would have no place to go, nowhere they could afford at least. With her dressed in dark leggings and a t-shirt, and him in jeans and a black t-shirt, they blended into the neighborhood. His heart thundered, his palms moist, when his and Serafina's houses came into view. Coffee breath, smoke, and his uncle's scowl assaulted him all at once. Let's turn this way. Serafina, likely sensing his tension, tugged at his hand and turned them toward an alley that deposited them into the small open space. I don't want to go to that house. Thanks. Logan breathed, relieved she, too, had the same hesitation. She broke out into a jog as they neared a fallen tree. Careful! He pulled her toward him, and when her honey-brown eyes seared into him, a sense of awareness sizzled between them. While his heart had been racing earlier, he now battled an erratic heartbeat and nerves were tingling within him. Let's go! She whispered and spun back to their path. Their storm drain came into view. The two navy metal dumpsters weren't there years ago. When they reached the cement pipe, Serafina faced him, her eyes bright under the mid-afternoon sun as the breeze teased her ponytail. Can you believe this is the place we used to love? Yes. Still loved if she was standing in front of the opening. Her eyes held him captive. He moistened his lips and stared at her. Scarcely breathing while he savored the moment, the sight of her, the memories, the hopes, and the tension so intense he feared to move against it. He'd forever cherish this place, more because of this moment with the girl who was the center of his heart, a treasure from his past. Their special place, just the two of them knew, just the two of them here now. Overcome with an urge to kiss her, he flicked his gaze to her lips. Soft and tender, they'd moved on his own mouth so perfectly like they were meant to mesh together. She, too, had her gaze on his mouth. The city noise blurred into a distant drone as he narrowed the gap between them. He curled his hand behind her neck, then trailed his fingers along her flesh, to her cheek, so soft like spun silk. Her breath hitched, gasping. She closed her eyes as if to savor the moment. How he longed to kiss her again. His mouth was suddenly as dry as the parched ground they stood on. All he needed was to lean forward and his lips would be on hers. She would, no doubt, kiss him back, but then they'd go right back to her questioning his intentions. He wasn't the man she was looking for, especially now that she was vulnerable. Right now, she needed a friend, and the last thing he wanted was to distract her from her search for Mr. Wright. Her breathing was labored as her eyes closed, no doubt waiting for and expecting his kiss. He leaned in, his lips almost touching hers. Kiss her. Don't. Logic won when he whispered against her lips. I have somewhere else to take you. Her eyelids flew open and she swallowed, then shook her head. Her face fell and a thrill ran through him over her clear disappointment. Okay. The next stop wasn't the park where they used to lay in spot clouds. Once their leisurely sleuthing activity, This time, he drove her to Golden on the side of the mountain, where he sprawled a blanket and they lay on their backs, Serafina's shoulder brushing against his. The sky was a vivid blue, perfect for cloud spotting. Let's see if you can spot an airplane. She adjusted her sunglasses and peered into the sky. He'd bought them sunglasses at the hotel's gift shop when he joined his family last night. While I find the airplane, try the sailboat. She'd always spotted sailboats as she dreamed of sailing away from her house, while Logan had dreams to travel the world that didn't involve his uncle. Found it. That fast? I don't believe you. She took his hand in hers and guided his finger along with hers as she pointed at the spotted cloud. Do you see it? I think. He used to see all the shapes, but now he couldn't see what she was seeing. Perhaps they didn't see the same things as they used to, just like her expectations for a future spouse. He'd learned she was the one woman who sent his blood rushing in a way no one ever made him feel. 
Okay, his blood was more on Spike the moment he started imagining Serafina as more than a friend. Clouds forgotten, she set his hand down and turned to face him. Taking off her sunglasses, she then reached for his and tossed them to the side. He faced her, mirroring her pose as he rested an elbow on the blanket with his hand bracing his cheek. Their breathing was louder than the mountain breeze as they stared at each other. Logan, why are you perfect? That's not true, and you, of all people, know it. You're perfect in all the ways that count. What an odd statement from her. She continued, Everything you do for me? Nobody has come close to rescuing me like you. Canceling appointments and skipping work when I have a crisis? And you come and cheer me up. You're dating the wrong guys. She didn't get sidetracked by his comment when she said, You pay for the students' lunch every school year, the teachers' lunches, and you feed the homeless in my building? She then lifted her hand and made air quotes with two hands. You don't want them to break into our cars? I know you'd do the same, feeding the hungry. If she had the money. Her eyebrows rose. See what I mean? You're ignoring my praise. With her, he never hesitated to help her or anyone connected to her. But like with so many things he did, he wondered about the driving force behind his feeding the homeless or helping struggling companies thrive or offering investors an approach to build and manage their investments. The latter was his job, but they took on paid and pro bono clients. Do you ever get caught between doing the right thing and trying to prove somebody wrong? She frowned. What do you mean? With my uncle's words. Worthless loser. I still hear his voice sometimes. The man died years ago, having sadly succumbed to alcohol poisoning. When I'm doing the right thing, I wonder if I'm doing it to prove to my uncle that I'm a better man, or if I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Serafina pinned him with warm eyes, so sweet and familiar he'd never get tired of looking at them. You can't go wrong by doing right, her lips thinned. Whenever I doubt myself, you're always reminding me not to worry about what others think about me, that I'm a child of God. Her eyes held his gaze. Logan Stone, you are a child of God. You have a good heart, no matter what your uncle's voice screams in your head. She ran her free hand through his hair, remaining braced on the other arm. The moment God snatched you out of your uncle's clutches was the end of that life. Not only did God give you a new family on earth, but he also brought you into his family. You are a part of my family, Sarah. He wanted her to know she wasn't alone just because she'd lost both parents. My family will always be your family, too. Her eyes glistened. I know. She then tugged at his hair, jostling his head and catching him by surprise. Logan, why don't you want to commit to a relationship? She meant his romantic entanglements, and based on his recent thoughts, the response was automatic. Maybe because of you? Thanks to Bryce for bringing the matter to light. I think it's always been you, Sarah. Her long lashes fluttered as she blinked, her voice barely a whisper when she asked, What do you mean? With a tentative movement, he slipped his hand into her hair, needing to feel it against his fingers, pushing off the tie and sliding her hair from its ponytail. A shiny mass of dark brown fell in a curtain to her shoulders. With her dilated brown eyes, he had no doubt she felt just as attracted to him. Otherwise, she wouldn't have kissed him. Tell me you'd want us to be more than friends. Unless she found Mr. Wright on one of the apps he emailed her. Have you set up a new profile yet? I tried, but it felt wrong. Why's that? I kissed you, and... And what, Sarah? The subtle scent of her conditioner teased his senses. A silence passed as he waited for her response. He imagined a lifetime could pass with him waiting for her, hoping she'd say she was in love with him. You and I, we have different goals. You run away from serious relationships, and I run toward them. Too bad she knew his track record with women. Our goals might not be as different as you think. You don't want to get married. She probably knew already, still, 
he needed to make her understand all his fears and imperfections. I'm afraid to fail. I doubt I can ever have a perfect marriage like my parents. At times, he felt like his uncle whenever he broke up with a woman and didn't even feel sad about the lost relationship. I worry that I might end up like my uncle, who couldn't commit to anybody or anything except for his alcohol. There was one more thing. Do you ever feel like you're with somebody, but you don't want to spend the rest of your life with them? When she didn't answer, he continued. You're the one person who could infuriate me, and yet as soon as I walk away, my world shatters, and I panic, wanting to make things right with you that instant. The stock market could collapse, and he wouldn't care, as long as Serafina was in his life. She looked at him with misted eyes, shining in the afternoon light. Maybe his statement didn't make sense to her at all. He'd better clarify. I feel whole when I'm with you. She touched the side of his neck and awakened every bit of his skin. When her hand slid up on the side of his face over his ear, he swallowed, reminding himself to breathe. She hadn't answered his question of whether she wanted him or not, so he continued, keeping his gaze at the racing pulse point on her neck, afraid to look at her tempting lips. I could have the entire world as my friends, but without you, I'd feel lost and imp. Shut up, Logan. The rest of his words were lost against her mouth when her hand curled at the back of his neck and pulled him down to her. She spoke over his mouth. I've fallen in love with you too. Her words were the assurance he needed to slide his hands to her face. Then his lips moved against hers. He'd been wanting to do this again. He kissed her gently and carefully until she clenched his shirt in her hand, drawing him in. He groaned, relishing the feel of her against him. The taste of her lips, the softness of her skin, as his hand slid to her cheek and trailed through her hair. Everything about her seemed perfect. Everything about them together was just right. Somehow, he separated his lips from hers and peered into her face. Her lashes fluttered open, revealing beautifully dazed brown eyes. Sometimes, it's good to remember where we came from, she said breathlessly. He nodded sliding hair from her face and tucking it behind her ears. She was the most beautiful woman. Retracing their past might have opened their eyes and confirmed what he'd been thinking. He and Sarah were eternally bound by friendship and love. Even now, their hearts thundered in rhythm, beating together as if becoming one. Chapter 16 June was a mix of agony and joy for Serafina. The reality was that everyone, including her, would die at some point. Good thing Mom died in peace, but Serafina wished she'd spent more time with her. She'd planned to visit Mom as soon as school was out. Little had she known she'd be at Mom's funeral instead. After the funeral and cleaning out Mom's house, Serafina went with Logan to visit his parents for two days before they flew back to San Francisco. Besides playing volleyball with Logan in the co-ed league, she stayed busy putting Mom's photos in an album. She also assisted Vanessa at her food truck, which helped her transition to normalcy. Then a week after their return, Logan surprised her and took her to see Ezen. The little guy had clung to her when she embraced him. With Gonzalo's permission, Serafina spent the afternoon with Ezen at the aquarium and the zoo the following day. Gonzalo was on paid leave until September when the kids would return to school. He'd been hired in the facilitation and expedition of outcomes technically running office errands. He hadn't started working for Stone Enterprises, but Logan wanted him to connect with his son. The man didn't have full custody, but with social services stopping in to ensure Eason was doing well, he could keep his son. Besides getting therapy, Eason spent more time with his dad, and although the boy was still timid, the tight hug he'd given Serafina indicated he was on the mend. The month flew by as Serafina attended charity dinners and went on dates with Logan. Now mid-July was upon them, and today she was helping Vanessa at the food truck again near the bay. As the afternoon slowed after the lunch hour, they sat on the padded bench in the truck. Serafina peered through the open order window to the sprawling green grass. A couple sat on a blanket, munching potato chips. Beyond the grass, sunlight caught the metal flashing on a bank and two other buildings. Vanessa was reading aloud the headlines and articles from the tabloid magazines. 
San Francisco's eligible bachelor, Logan Stone, is off the market. Vanessa displayed the page of a full-blown photo of Serafina and Logan kissing on the San Francisco Bay Bridge. They'd taken a sunset walk three days ago when Logan asked her to become his girlfriend. Vanessa grinned, then rustled the magazine on her lap and continued reading. We've always seen these two childhood friends at galas, company parties. Their friendship has blossomed. Could it be that they'd been in love all along? If anyone asked Serafina that question three months ago, she'd call them insane. Here's another one. Vanessa reached for another magazine from the table next to the stack of paper plates. I can't believe you spent your money buying gossip magazines. It's not every day my friend's love life is exposed in a magazine. She lifted the page with Serafina and Logan dancing at the gala in May. They'd captured the moment Logan pulled her against him as he whispered in her ear. Serafina shivered at the vivid memory of his warm breath tickling her ear. Public displays of affection is something Logan and I will have to work on. You have no reason to if you're both in love. Vanessa stacked the magazine with the two others and crossed her legs. Serafina still needed to convince Vanessa to come to the reunion in a mere four days. Any chance you could come for two days? Vanessa lowered her gaze, shaking her head. Every truck event this summer counts. She then glanced at the framed photo of her mom hanging next to the paper menu on the board. The sooner I get mom's restaurant open, the better I can start chasing my own dream. Serafina nodded her understanding. It was so sweet how her friend sacrificed her dream to carry out her deceased mom's. Vanessa's eyes sparkled, her voice carrying intrigue. I looked up Nate Stone. No, you didn't. Gotta check out my competition. If she and Logan were dating, who was Serafina to say that Vanessa and Nate were an impossible dream? It may take Vanessa longer since she might not easily run into Nate without tracking him down at his childhood home. How long will it take for you to meet the goal? If only Serafina could help, besides volunteering her time in the summer. Thanks to Logan, who pays me twice my usual rate whenever he hires me. Vanessa's words drifted into the background as Serafina peered out the window and saw Logan strolling across the lawn. The sleeves of his blue shirt were rolled to his forearms, the afternoon sun glinting his hair with a golden hue. How could she have taken so long to realize he was the man for her? So much for lists and expectations. Her heart started pounding and she stood while talking to Vanessa and kept her gaze on her prize. He'd gotten off work early in preparation for their trip to Colorado tomorrow. Logan's here. Serafina rubbed her hands together, her palms moist, and when he looked at the truck and saw her, he smiled. She didn't think twice as she sprinted out of the truck. You're so in love, my friend. Vanessa's words bounced off her back. When Serafina met Logan halfway, he swept her in his arms, leaned in, and brushed his lips against hers. With a magnetic force drawing them even closer, he kissed her again, slow and deliberate. What happened to public displays of affection? Vanessa bellowed, and they both laughed as they separated their lips from each other. Logan smiled at her, then brushed the hair from her face. Another advantage of keeping her hair down? She got to experience Logan's touches. How was your day? He murmured the question. I've been counting down the minutes until I could see you. Is that so? His voice remained low and romantic. He curled an arm around her waist, and she rested her head against his shoulder while they walked back to the truck. Let's go get your hand back. She didn't have to ask what they were doing that evening. They'd be headed to some adventure since he knew all the right places she'd never been in San Francisco. Logan was on a mission to date her like she'd never experienced before. They arrived three days before the reunion at the peak since they were the planning organizers. Unsure how the dog would handle a crowd away from his own home, Serafina had left Chewy with Mary. After an appetizing dinner with Logan's parents and their chef Sebastian, Logan took Serafina's hand in his, entwining their fingers, his eyes vibrant under the pendant lights above the dining table. I'll let Sarah go through the schedule. He had that secret smile for her alone, and her stomach fluttered. She planned everything, after all. You helped, Serafina said, then glanced at Logan's parents across the table. 
Regina had a knowing smile as she rested her head on Kyle's shoulder. When they'd stopped by the peak, Logan had told his parents at dinner about the new level of relationship with her. Regina beamed, her eyes widening, when she said that she'd always hoped someday their friendship would blossom into something more. Likewise, Kyle had nodded, his lips spreading as he said he couldn't ask for a better woman for his son. Serafina had developed feelings for Logan, but she hoped she hadn't lured him into the relationship when she desperately wanted to kiss him the first few times and hadn't even tried hiding her feelings. The list? Regina lifted her brows, chuckling, probably noticing Serafina's absent-mindedness. It's on my phone, which is in the handbag in the guest room you set up for me. Serafina squeezed Logan's hand. I shared the list with you, though. Do you have your phone? He shook his head. I know we have karaoke one night. No one has ever hosted karaoke before. Kyle's voice was deep as he draped an arm over his wife's shoulder. Regina tilted her head to grin at him. We better start putting our music muscles to the test, honey. Logan was right about his parents having a perfect marriage. They were so in love even after almost 40 years together. Serafina's chest had constricted at Logan's genuine confession about his fears of commitment. Yet he wanted to try, and he loved her. We didn't plan anything for the first night. We wanted to give people time to settle in. Serafina finished Logan's sentence. The t-shirts. His eyes crinkled up, the tan skin such a perfect complement to his dark hair. Did they arrive? I have them in the storage closet, Sebastian said in a low voice, the way she remembered him. He always had few words. The carnival supplies for games will be delivered on Tuesday, and the vendors will show up whenever we need them. He reached for his water and took a sip. Iris said. Sebastian coughed out his water into the glass, then covered his mouth as he coughed again. Are you okay? Everyone at the table asked him simultaneously. Serafina tapped the man's shoulder since he was seated to her left. It's just... He then cleared his throat, refocusing. I have all the vendors Iris asked me to schedule. Even without a handy list, Serafina remembered as many things as possible from the schedule she intended to write on a whiteboard and keep it in the kitchen for everyone to see. Tomorrow was going to be a big day, setting up some family photos and coordinating with the tent company for the canvas on karaoke night and dining tent in case it rained. What do you think? Serafina looked between Kyle, Regina, and Sebastian. I'd say you've outdone all the reunions, Kyle said. Then he put his finger to his mouth. Don't tell your siblings I said that. Karaoke, t-shirt, and ethnic night are all new things we will enjoy. Regina gazed with motherly affection at Logan, then Serafina. You two work so well together. Logan moved his hand to Serafina's shoulder and pulled her to him. That we do. His warm breath feathered over her neck. Sarah did the hard work, of course. Serafina stared at the loving couple, and her words naturally rolled off her tongue. I can tell you and Kyle make a great team, too. Sometimes, Regina touched her husband's cheek. But I'll keep him. Kyle kissed the top of his wife's head. The next morning, Serafina awakened to a knock, and without thinking, she staggered to open the bedroom door. Morning, sleeping beauty. Logan's low voice rumbled, and her skin registered the vibrations with delightful tingles of awareness. Her lips curved upward before she ducked from his sizzling gaze and noticed the flowers in his hands. With dewdrops licking along the yellow petals, he must have picked the flowers on their property. Suddenly self-conscious, she crossed her arms over the pajama shirt she'd worn with long pants. Although it was July, Colorado nights in the mountains were cooler than in San Francisco. But with Logan staring at her mouth, she felt too warm. Fighting the urge to move into his space and kiss him, she parted her lips to let him know why she couldn't. I haven't brushed my teeth. His brow shot up and a mischievous grin split his face. Your thoughts are very unclean. He then leaned into her and brushed his lips tenderly against hers. Her knees were weak as he handed her the flowers. Get dressed. I'm taking you to breakfast before we tackle the day. Sebastian was making breakfast. Or so the chef had told them last night when he asked what they wanted to eat. I told him just to cook for dad and mom. 
Okay. Dew from the flowers sprinkled her hands. I'll meet you in the main house. He nodded before he left. Two hours later, they had breakfast in the quaint town, strolling the streets of old buildings and exploring shops with unique handmade items felt romantic. Logan spoiled her rotten by buying her handmade necklaces and earrings or lotions and sprays, all things she could make and she told him so. For once, have someone else make things for you. When they returned home, they didn't have to remind the tent and furniture vendors of their job. They were already at work and with Sebastian and Regina and Kyle's help setting displays in the house. They hung last year's family reunion photos on easels and strung banners of quotes about family Serafina had printed from the internet. Even with people around, Logan snatched her to the kitchen cleaning closet, pretending he needed help finding a broom, only to close the door and kiss her senseless. When they'd returned, his parents had left and Sebastian was wiping down the counter. He eyed them briefly, but with his shyness, she couldn't guess if he sensed they'd been up to no good. Toward the end of the day, she read the menu for him in the kitchen as he wrote it on the board. Salad bar? Iris! Logan's voice sounded from the garage hall entrance on the left. You got here early. When Serafina looked back at Sebastian, he was scrambling with the marker he dropped on the black granite counter, his eyes flicking to the hallway, then back to Serafina. Why were confusion and panic evident on the man's face? Everything okay? Um. He peered toward the hallway as Logan kissed his sister's cheek. Can I take a break for a second? Of course. He sped out of the kitchen and took the hallway to the right toward the guest rooms. Serafina! Iris lifted her hands in question, and when Serafina walked toward her and hugged her, Iris squealed and squeezed her tight. It's about time you two started dating. Mom couldn't help herself, of course, Logan said. As soon as she told me I had to come a day early, red highlights shimmered in Iris's brown hair, and she smelled like roses as she drew back and jostled Serafina. I'll be the first to know the details of your... Let's get you settled in. Logan gave his sister a gentle shove toward the living room and nodded to the winding staircase. Aren't the girls staying in the guest house? Iris asked. We've got so many coming, even the uncles and aunts. How many this year? Ninety-three people, Serafina answered, including kids and close family friends. Logan crossed to Serafina and kissed her lips. You'll need all the luck staying in a room next to my sisters. With his tone so tender and light, Serafina sensed that protectiveness and love for his baby sister. Afraid I'm going to spill all your dirty secrets? Iris's penciled brows arched, wagging them at Logan. Sarah knows all of my secrets. Iris shook a finger between Serafina and Logan. There's still a few she doesn't. Chapter 17 Cheers rang on the mountain property of Logan's childhood home on Tuesday afternoon as kids and adults competed in the day's relay races. Running in sacks was hard enough for adults, let alone kids, who preferred to be on Logan's team. From time to time, he clapped, cheering on his teammates. His cheeks hurt from grinning as Serafina ran beside his nine-year-old nephew, who kept tripping in the sack. Almost a hundred family members and close friends spread across the expansive meadow to the south of the three-story limestone house. Everyone was dressed in the blue reunion t-shirts. The photographer skittered between the six teams, snapping photos as fast as she could. Logan turned to Sebastian on his left, a tablet in hand, as he squinted at the screen. With the afternoon sun blaring, it had to be hard for him to see his notes. How are the Tigers doing? Logan asked, using the name one of his nephews had chosen for his team. In case you haven't noticed, your team is... I was hoping you'd throw us a bone. Kids and parents comprise half our team. That's the reward you get for being the best uncle. Eric's voice sounded from Logan's right side. How had his brother even heard him while he hoisted a fussy toddler on his hip? Logan reached out to touch his niece's cheek. The little one's lips quivered while she clutched her American Girl doll close to her heart. 
Gone was the cheerful child he'd played with three hours ago. I wish I could cheer you up, sweet princess. Logan was tempted to take the fussy toddler because of his brother's compliment for best uncle. Not only was Eric the oldest out of the ten, but he was also a leader and role model, a significant influence in Logan's life. She needs a nap. Eric kissed his daughter's forehead, the girl's amber skin a combination of Eric's light and Joy's brown skin colors. I'm going to see if I can track Joy down. Logan surveyed the activity on the field, scanning for Eric's wife. I saw her earlier with Bryce's wife. They were getting their toddlers safely out of the field before the wild game started. You want me to find her? I'd rather not take over your role. Of manning the activities. I see what you're doing. Logan crossed his arms. You don't want to witness our humiliation. You're the only one on the team who can't handle losing. Eric's hazel eyes held tenderness when he tipped his chin to Serafina, happily running across the field with one of Eric's sons. Being a kindergarten teacher, Serafina was a magnet for kids. Images flashed in Logan's mind, fast-forwarding to a future with Serafina, playing with their son or daughter, adopted or biological, whatever God had in mind for them. He'd never imagined himself as a father, until now, until Sarah. Last night, Eric threw a party to celebrate Logan and Serafina's new relationship. From friendship to more, Eric had said when he called a restaurant that wasn't busy and had room to accommodate their immediate family a group of twenty or so, on such short notice. Eric slapped Logan on the back, snapping him to the present. Meet you at the water station? Their next event. Logan then turned back to Sebastian to talk about the next event. You might win the water buckets. Sebastian smiled shyly, his tone lighthearted. That's if you have the kids carry their water in a cup rather than a bucket. Logan pictured the kids dumping all the water on themselves as they raced to fill it in the main bucket. When he lifted his chin to look at Sebastian, he was laughing, shoulders shaking as he hid his smile behind the tablet he brought up over his face. I didn't know you had a sense of humor. Good luck, Sebastian grinned. You're going to... Well, well, Logan. At Iris's voice, the tablet slid out of Sebastian's hands and landed on the grass. Iris picked it up to hand it back, but Sebastian's jaw was hanging as he stared at the tablet in her hands. Here, she said, waving it, and he blinked, finally snatching the tablet from her. Um, I think... He tripped over his words, wincing, but Iris turned to Logan and pointed the water bottle at him. I just noticed the schedule and see we have karaoke on Thursday. Please tell me it's a prank. Logan peered at his sister's forehead, tanned from the sun. Why didn't you use sunscreen? She smacked the water bottle on his shoulder. Ouch! He yanked the water bottle from her hand and tossed it on the grass behind them. That instant he had her in a headlock and she squealed, punching her hands in the air as she called Sebastian for help. Not that Sebastian did anything besides clearing his throat. What's with you and Sarah always punching me? He eyed his sister, but he didn't expect her to kick his shin with her tennis shoe. He released her, wincing at the pain. If you want me to change the schedule, hitting is not the best way to go about it. She shrugged, then planted a hand on her hip. Her fingers rested on the knot she tied on her t-shirt hem. You're picking on me. You know I don't sing. Logan smirked. He loved seeing his sister worked up over minor things. I'm losing today, and you don't hear me complaining. He then glanced at Sebastian to back him up, but the man seemed distressed as he fumbled with the tablet. Right, Sebastian? Sebastian shook his head, then nodded. He tapped on the tablet, clearly pretending to be taking notes. As Iris fussed about their siblings in the music and film industry who'd be winning karaoke, Logan studied Sebastian. He was flabbergasted by his sister, confirming the vague suspicion. Sebastian hurried away and disappeared through the group standing in the cluster of aspens. Sebastian was shy, but not to the extent of losing control. If I didn't know any better, Logan eyed his sister, I'd think our chef has a crush on you. Iris coughed, then whipped her head to where Sebastian had been. 
Lifting onto tiptoe, she shaded her eyes and scanned the area as if searching for him. Then she scowled. You mean Sebastian? How many chefs do we have? I can barely get a word out of him. That's the problem. He can talk, but he gets tongue-tied around you. Her face scrunched even as her mouth slid open. Apparently she had no clue about his crush. Sebastian was a good man, godly and all, but Logan wasn't ready for his baby sister to deal with relationship complexities. He'd warded off a couple of her boyfriends in the past, which could be why she may never tell him about her suitors unless things were serious. If there was any man Logan might trust with Iris, it would be Sebastian. The years he'd spent on the streets had shaped him into a man of integrity. Having been with the family since he started his career, he displayed the extent of his loyalty. Or maybe Logan clicked with Sebastian because he had a similar background as Logan and most of his siblings. After the races, everything ran smoothly, except for one small detail. Logan barely had three minutes with Serafina to himself, since his sibling showed up yesterday. The next day wasn't much different. After they had breakfast with the family, the girls took Serafina to get their hair and nails done, which didn't make sense with their plans to play Capture the Flag and Water Games that afternoon. Finally, Logan had Serafina to himself when they made dessert before dinner. Alone in the kitchen, he gathered her in his arms. As soon as he captured her mouth with his, giggles erupted from the stairs and one of his sister's voices sounded. You're supposed to make desserts, not be each other's dessert. Just don't burn down the kitchen, Iris teased. Serafina laughed over Logan's mouth before she scooted to the opposite side of the black granite island, biting her lower lip and ducking her head as color spread up her neck and cheeks. Logan peered at the stairs where two of his sisters were grinning as they waved enthusiastically as if they were on a skit show. Aren't you supposed to be at the bonfire? Like everyone else? There was plenty of things to do in the backyard. Go swimming! Or do anything to give him some space. Who needs to be outside when we have a live show here? Iris brushed him off with a wave. In other words, getting together with the family meant no privacy whatsoever. Things were the same as they'd been in previous reunions, but Logan and Serafina had been here as friends. While they talked, he'd had no urgency to have her to himself. The following day, throughout the festivities, his nephews and nieces kept running to Serafina to play catch or bubbles. During the scheduled free time, he and Serafina were making an escape, weaving through the path in the flower gardens when the triplet showed up with a football asking to play. It had been fun as he took advantage of tickling Serafina during the game until the nine-year-olds left. His sisters and sister-in-law showed up then, snatching Serafina away to plan a bonfire activity. Logan's brothers reeled him to the backyard to a three-on-three -three basketball game, then a tennis match, and you name it. While he had enough drama and issues of his own, some of his siblings made him their counselor when they asked his advice for their shaky relationships. You'd better ask Eric. He was the family man. He has eight kids and a wife. Nate bounced the ball on the rubber surface. I'm not an expert. Wade snaked the ball his way. You and Serafina are going steady. Makes you an expert. The carnival finally arrived on Friday when an afternoon of unplanned activities allowed everyone to play whatever game they chose. Kids' happy squeals sounded, no doubt on a sugar spike from the cotton candy. With endless acres of land, they didn't have to worry about disturbing the neighbors, except the deer and animals in the national forest to the east of the house. The smell of popcorn and greasy food hung thick in the air as Logan and Bryce took turns, tossing darts at the board nailed to a quaky aspen tree. So, Bryce juggled his handful of darts. What's the update about your relationship with Serafina? Logan hurled the dart toward the board, and it landed on number 20. I'm afraid I'll mess things up. This relationship had a whole new meaning. While he'd never been anxious in his previous relationships, he was terrified with Serafina. One mistake on his end, and he'd lose his friend for life. You'll be fine. Bryce's genuine voice had Logan pause and stare at his friend. Bryce's gray eyes bored into Logan's. Then he winked. After all, it won't be new when you argue or fight. As Bryce talked about the ups and downs in a relationship, Logan's heart raced, 
and his gaze flickered to the various booths run by vendors from the company they'd hired. As his family members ventured from one booth to another, engaging in the given games, he saw Serafina. His heart jolted, and a smile lifted his cheeks. She was blowing bubbles, and the three-year-olds were running to catch them in the air. As if aware she was being watched, she glanced up, gave him a breathtaking smile, and waved. Logan smiled and waved back. How did she know where he was standing, and if he was looking at her? How are my boys doing? At Mom's voice, Logan tore his gaze from Serafina. Bryce smirked at Logan. We were just talking about Serafina. Mom pressed her hands on her heart. You and Serafina did an incredible job. Bryce dropped his darts into the bucket. I already feel sorry for the person running next year's reunion. Logan eyed Bryce. This time, we're adding your name to the drawing. It was high time he led an event. Being an only child, Bryce had spent most of his childhood summers and holiday breaks with Logan's family. He'd even joined them several times for their family vacations. Logan's right. Mom smiled with tenderness, confirming Logan's statement. Your family. Bryce's smile was warm in the afternoon sun. I'd better go tell Liberty to start planning, just in case my name gets drawn. Speaking of which, he craned his neck to survey the nearby booths. I'd better track down my wife and help with the kids. I have a feeling one of these days we're going to be planning a wedding instead of a reunion. Mom's hopeful words caused an uproar of protest in Logan's mind. In case she didn't sense his fears, now was a good time to get some counseling. You and Dad have a perfect marriage. A high standard he couldn't reach. Your dad and I are making his famous pancakes tomorrow. Mom tapped his chest. Your statement might change if you listen to us while we cook. Logan laughed. Mom and Dad both assumed their recipe was the best. A minor bickering they usually had when they made the pancakes. Do you have any idea how minor an issue that is? Her brows drew in and she touched his cheek. As he peered into Regina's kind eyes, memories of all of the days she'd comforted him rushed in. You always strive for excellence. Always have. Since you were ten. When he'd just been adopted. Do you remember the countless Lego sets you tore apart and restarted because you couldn't build them in a set amount of time? He'd had several tantrums over things gone wrong. With you, either you had to think you'd get it perfect, or you wouldn't even try. Her hand was warm on his cheek, the kind of mother any terrified child should have. Don't be so hard on yourself, sweetheart. You've turned out just fine, the way God intended you to be. Once again, the familiar words of confidence. Words mom always breathed into him whenever he blamed himself for things gone wrong, soothed him. God has used those bad experiences in your life to help you appreciate the blessings in your life, my son. Why did his eyes feel gritty? There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Every relationship takes work. You and Serafina have been friends for a long time, so I'm sure you've had disagreements, but you always find your way back together. Your dad and I are the same way. We argue, but then we sort out our differences and move on. Logan arched a brow. He'd never heard his parents argue or seen them cross with each other. But Regina nodded. We even go to counseling, not because we need it, but because we want to prevent the unexpected. As mom slid her gaze from his eyes to look over his shoulder, a warm hand covered his eyes. Oh dear! Laughter cried in Mom's voice. Logan felt a grin split his face. While he could move the soft hand from his face, he loved the contact from its familiarity. Serafina's scent teased his nose, dominating the air and replacing the fried food and popcorn smells. Something fluffy dusted against his lips. Sarah! His chest jiggled with laughter. You know that I hate cotton candy. She spoke through giggles. Today is a good day to try again. He took her hand from his face and churned, pulling her into his arms. Her laugh was the lullaby he needed. He found himself laughing when the cotton candy slipped out of her hand and fell on the golden grass. He tucked loose strands of her hair from her face. Lately, she kept her hair down, 
which he loved since it was a good excuse for him to touch her face. You think it was funny to feed me? I'll leave you two lovebirds. Mom bent and picked up the cotton candy, then tossed it in the trash can on the other side of the aspen tree. Thanks, Mom. He kept his gaze on Serafina as they both subsided in laughter. Have you eaten any of the carnival food yet? She linked their hands. It would be a shame as organizers not to eat any. Being alone with her was almost a miracle. Before anyone could interfere with their solitude, instead of answering her question, he took her hand and led her along the path toward the house. They weaved through the gardens, stopping behind the wide red shrub. Finally separated from the crowd, he gathered her into his arms and leaned in to kiss her deep and hard, as if he'd been thinking about nothing else the entire day. Days. Serafina tipped her head and kissed him, her hands clasped at the back of his neck. I missed you, she whispered against his lips. That's an understatement. His hands locked at the base of her spine, and he kissed her forehead, each eye, the tip of her chin, then her mouth again. Sarah. What? Smiling, she ran the back of her hand across his jawline. Tangled up with the emotion he couldn't describe, he fell silent as her love-filled eyes bore into his. His heart was racing. I'm crazy about you. He always was, but not in a romantic way. I can't believe we're... Let's take a walk. He linked his arm with hers, and they continued along the sun-dappled path. The party noise and smell seemed distant now. The sound of birds and crickets and the smell of the manicured lawn and fresh-blooming flowers overtaking the air. Their new relationship was too good to be true. Even if he was all in, he'd be lying if he said her wish list didn't cross his mind. He barely met half the criteria of her dream husband, and she deserved to know his concerns. But if he shared them, would she jump to the conclusion he was doubting their relationship? Perhaps addressing his family that was constantly in her space was a good transitional topic. Logan, like his siblings, was modeled by their parents to throw themselves in each other's space. She may not like it as much. Sorry, my family is a bit much. She stopped walking where the path split in front of the gazebo. I love your family. With her eyes wide and her lips smiling, she squeezed his hand, leaving him no doubt she meant it. Then she resumed walking to the trail toward the creek. You have something else on your mind, though. That was the problem. She could see right through him, almost reading his thoughts. He cleared his throat. I... I don't have green eyes. Like she'd been looking for. I still struggle with childhood trauma. Not as much, but it came in waves, deflating him at times. The creek bubbled in the background, and movement sounded as Gritter scampered in the silence that passed between them. Let's take a seat. She nodded to the bank, and they walked over and sat on the grass, water trickling beyond their shoes. She bumped their shoulders, then drew out a breath. I've been complaining so much lately. She focused on the rippling water. I've also spent my life chasing unrealistic dreams. When she shuddered, he caressed her knuckles with his thumb encouraging her to keep talking. I wanted someone who couldn't argue with me, and I had that with Greg. But then we broke up abruptly. If we'd argued, maybe I might have seen the breakup coming. You still miss him? That could be another problem, if Logan was her rebound. I'm not sure I ever loved him. I know I loved the idea of him. A husband and family. A man who never fought with me a man I thought was stable, a man I believed would make a perfect father with no childhood issues. But I've been thinking, realizing, I checked off all those boxes on the list, asked all the pertinent questions, but never got to know the man, just the facts. I kind of put him into the box, you know? Her gaze bore into his, her forehead wrinkling until tears shone in her eyes. And when I was with him, I did the same with myself putting myself in a box that checked off all the things on his list. I was so careful not to say or do anything that would be outside what he was looking for that I never let him get to know me either. Neither one of us was ever real enough with the other to fight, and we never would have survived an argument. She rubbed between her eyes. 
It doesn't mean I want to argue with you, but you're the only person I can fight with one minute and still love at the same time. If that happened with somebody else, I don't know if we could get back to where we were in the first place. Logan felt the same. Serafina scooted closer and rested her head on his shoulder. I love you so much, but I'm scared I might lose you if we don't. Makes two of us. He closed his eyes and breathed in deeply to steady his shakiness. Then he leaned over and kissed the top of her head, burying his nose in her hair and inhaling her sweet scent. He was terrified, yet he wanted more than friendship with Sarah. The afternoon sun warmed their backs as they sat there, their feet dangling over the tranquil waters, and talked about their dreams and future as a couple. He understood now that she was the one, but he hadn't had time to process how or when to take further steps into their relationship. She had the same vision she'd always had to get married and start a family. She talked about her desire to go to Italy in hopes to get closure and discover her roots since her dad was born in Italy. That was something Logan could solve. After all, he'd bought the house in Tuscany on a whim during his visit to Italy in the spring. He'd been leaving from a meeting with investors. A flyer had fallen from one of the investors' folders. When Logan bent to pick it up, the photo of a house caught his attention, a home similar to the ones in Serafina's classic movies. The investor turned out to be a realtor and property manager. Upon virtually touring the fully furnished house and seeing the retro decor and furnishing Serafina would love, Logan had made an offer. His presence wasn't required to close, so he'd signed electronically for the closure of the house. He had security and direct access to his house to see how the live-in caretakers were managing it. But he didn't feel right spying on the couple. Is your passport still up to date? It expires next year. The following days of the reunion went fast, and on the final day, Iris's name was drawn to plan next year's family gathering. Logan felt his usual mixed sadness when he said goodbye to his family, but this year, anticipation surged through him. He was taking Serafina to Italy before her school year started. He had a lot to plan to make it special. Chapter 18 Almost two weeks after the reunion, Serafina braved Logan's trip to a place she thought she'd never be in person. Sitting in the back of the four-seater passenger Ferrari, she pressed her face against the window as she took in the charming medieval villages and rays of evening sun warmed the rolling hills with a golden hue. The expansive vineyard she'd read about and the enchanting landscape felt serene and captivating, much better than virtual tours. Logan's hand was warm on her leg as he chatted with the driver, Tommaso. Apparently, the man served as Logan's driver whenever Logan came to Italy. Since they left the airport, she couldn't help wondering what part of Italy her dad was born in. She could ask Logan to help track dad's family sometime, and he'd do it in a heartbeat. But she'd consider that in the future. As they drove onto another private road with mansions spread apart from each other, Serafina felt like she was transported back into some Regency setting. Although the homes were no doubt expensive, they weren't Logan's style. He was a modern guy, while she still daydreamed of olden times. Logan was responsible for where they'd stay for the next 14 days, and when he told her it was a house, she panicked, not trusting herself to sleep under the same roof with just the two of them. Noticing her panic, he patted her hand. Don't worry, we'll have other people living with us. Her body felt all sorts of things around him, a thrill of warmth she never felt before with anyone. The car drove toward one of the mansions, and the tall black gate split open so fast, she almost assumed they were automatic gates, until she saw the men on each side of the gate. They were both dressed in black suits and sported earpieces. She opened her mouth to ask, but the words wouldn't come out. Logan took her hand and squeezed it, a cheeky grin crinkling his beard. Were they in the president's home? Leave it to Logan to book their accommodations. He went all out, full-blown wealth. Tires bounced on the grand cobblestone driveway, sprinkled with yellow petals. Memories of the daffodils he'd brought to her apartment rushed back, and her chest constricted. Logan? She spun to look at him. The love expressed in his eyes radiated through her, and she could scarcely breathe. They were at this glorious and dreamy mansion for her. This is not where you would like to stay. 
He shrugged just as Tommaso parked and rushed to open Logan's door. Logan thanked him but stopped him from opening Serafina's door. He then turned to her. Stay there. He strode around the car to open her door, and she took in the flowers sweeping the sandstone steps that curved up to a grand portico before double front doors. He cleared his throat. This is my first time here. His voice was soft, his face blushing. I'm never impulsive, but this house sparked an impulse moment. The minute I saw it, I knew you'd like it. Let's stay here for two days. She slid her hand into the crook of his arm. Then we'll go somewhere you'll like. I bought the house. Serafina almost choked on her saliva. When? Why? For this vacation? Whether you're with me or not, this is your vacation home. We'll have your name. Logan. The tears choking her throat, she threw both arms around his waist, hugging him tight and he wrapped his strong arms around her. I love you so much, Sarah. The tremor in his voice held all the emotion, accentuating his statement. I... She forced out a breath, then inhaled the subtle scent of the fabric from the t-shirt he was wearing. Love you. He eased out of the embrace, placed a soft kiss on her hair, and wiped her tears with his thumb. As they walked to the doors with his hand on her back, the vibrant potted plants lining the stairs perfumed the air. Taking in the manicured gardens and the mature shade trees, she imagined a future with Logan and their kids giggling as they sat under a tree for a picnic. A lanky man with a hawkish nose held the door open. Welcome, Mr. Stone, and... Angelo, Logan shook the man's hand. This is my girlfriend, Sarah. Serafina reached to shake the man's hand. He let go of the door and leaned in to kiss her on one cheek, then the other. After Angelo's long greeting, he stepped back and folded his hands. I must apologize for my wife's absence. Her mom's sick, so she had to leave for a few days. Logan told him not to worry before he put his hand out for Serafina. Welcome to your vacation home, sweetheart. Our home. It wouldn't be enjoyable without him in it. Windows from the rooms on the right and left lent gentle light to the art in the foyer. Pieces she'd buy in a heartbeat. She spun to Logan. I love this art. He had a knowing grin. That's one of the reasons I bought this house. A song erupted as they walked into the living room, where ornate ceilings towered two stories above, and an expansive bookshelf caught her attention. Serafina walked over to read the spines of a few English books. Fashion and Sense and Sensibility, she read out loud. The History of the Victorian Era. The familiar melody of Somewhere Only We Know caused her to pay attention to the lyrics. Logan took her on a tour of the four-story house, pointing out her sewing room, a master suite, and a craft room for her essential oil projects. Serafina paused at the doorway, the lyrics to the song tugging at her heart. No doubt the artist had a similar story in their life. She and Logan had a special place, and he knew her, and understood her in a way no one else could. Do you love your craft room? He raised his hand in question, and Serafina crossed the polished wood floor, cupping his face and capturing his mouth with hers. He let out a moan as she kissed him, and he kissed her back. You really love this room? His lips hovered over hers when the kiss ended. I love you more. As much as she loved the house, she was okay without it as long as Logan was with her anywhere in this world. No matter what happens between us, I want this house to be our special place. I want us to come here once a year. Even if Logan had a wife and kids who weren't Serafina's, she'd be his kids' aunt because she loved him that much. He cupped her cheek so she could look at him, and light streamed through the big windows, brightening his eyes. It's always going to be you, Sarah. He spoke as if he sensed her thoughts. When he lifted her hand and kissed her fingers one at a time, she had no doubt he meant every word. The house was an amazing surprise to the trip, but having an Italian chef who made authentic food and their house manager who taught them a few Italian words made the experience even more extraordinary. While in Tuscany, Tommaso took Logan and Serafina to the west of Siena. The many twisting roads revealed old stone villages of just a few hundred people. Things seemed slower than other areas in Italy she'd seen so far. 
They were immersed in nature without the jostle of tourists, which she didn't mind because she was one. But the serenity, the smell of the sea, and the joy of having Logan with her made her forget her problems. She felt almost complete. They visited Monticiano, a town established in the late Middle Ages, not too far from Tuscany, and explored the Merce River, which curled through miles of forest. Serafina took photos, including pictures of Logan, and he snapped their selfie by the rocky patches on the riverbed from rushing waterfalls. They then dove into the cool, clear water. Being in a remote place where no one knew them led them to make out. After all, the few couples around seemed to be doing the same thing. On the western coast of Sicily the next day, they took a ferry to Favignana, a butterfly-shaped mass of land fringed by a jagged coastline interspersed with sandy beaches and secret coves. They sat in a yacht that glided along with sailing boats on the Tyrrhenian Sea's azure waters. After a day at sea with an endless amount of food and Italian soda and water with the most handsome man in the world, Serafina couldn't even remember what their relationship was like three months ago. She'd been single and searching. Now she was off the market without putting in the effort to search for a spouse. As they peered into the sea with Logan's hand on her shoulder, her chest expanded. She wanted to feel this way for the rest of her life. Fear and joy mingled, and she couldn't keep tears from plunging out of her eyes. Hey, Logan kissed her cheek. Don't cry. I feel like we're on a honeymoon. Yet they were far from having a permanent relationship. To celebrate the beginning of our relationship, he nudged her arm. You get to decide where we go for our honeymoon. I love that. He sounded so confident about their future, yet she fought a creeping doubt. If he flaked, she'd lose him as a friend and life partner. She set her doubts aside as they enjoyed the Chocolate Valley in Tuscany the next day. While Tuscany had plenty of sights, they'd have to check out Rome, and they stayed in a luxury suite, each in their respective rooms. There he gave her a tour of Stone Enterprises' offices and pointed out the banks affiliated with Stone Enterprises. While Logan could have worked, he said he was on vacation and spent each day with her as they toured the rest of Italy. Sampling delicacies at the charming cafes in the Piazza della Signoria, then riding jet skis at Lake Como, and investigating the Amalfi Coast to create memories she'd never forget. On their last evening, as they stood on the terrace of the infinite gardens of Villa Simprone, Logan drew her into his arms whispering the most beautiful words of hope and love before kissing her so tenderly. She could feel his heart thumping against hers. Taking in the magnificent coastal views and the villa's lush gardens couldn't have been a better place to end their trip, as they contemplated their future together while they gazed at the sea. She'd never seen a more beautiful place in the world, so only the man in her arms made her world perfect. It's just lunch. Serafina mumbled under her breath as she entered a Panera Bread swarming with a bustle of people on their lunch hour. Gripping her handbag with white-knuckle force, she stood at the end of two lines. One foot lingering in the doorway, she contemplated an escape if she gave into her conscience. Then Vanessa's and Logan's voices echoed in her head, sounding out of their logic to abort this engagement. But no, she wanted to hear Greg out. She and Logan returned from Italy two days ago and she would be starting school in less than two weeks. While she could have used her phone in Italy, since she didn't have any family left to worry about, she'd kept it on airplane mode to avoid distractions. After landing in San Francisco, Logan dropped her off at her apartment, then he joined her and Chewy for a walk to the park, giving the dog some attention after abandoning him for days. When he left and Vanessa returned from work, Serafina had dinner with her friend. She wasn't hungry, but she wanted to give Vanessa a souvenir. Plus, her friend wanted all the details of the trip. While they caught up, Vanessa told Serafina about Greg's sudden visit to their complex a week ago. A visit Serafina confirmed when she turned on her phone. The texts, missed calls, and his shaky voice messages begging her to call him back made her assume he had a long-term illness. But when she called him back, he'd insisted they meet. What I have to tell you, I can't say on the phone. Serafina agreed to lunch on instinct, but regretted it when she called Logan and he didn't like the idea of her meeting with her ex. He lost the privilege of having meetings with you, 
the moment he walked out of your life. He'd said before telling her to make the decision. Vanessa's response had been even more emphatic. No, he doesn't deserve your time. But Serafina still had what ifs looming. What if he was dying and the last thing Serafina told him was, don't bother me. If so, then her middle name was about to become regret. She couldn't handle another unresolved relationship ending in death. So, rather than repeat her previous mistake, she'd come. Planting her feet, she breathed in the scent of bread and spices, permeating the bakery. People shuffled forward as the line moved, skimming the crowd for a sun-kissed head of hair. She didn't see Greg. She'd shown up almost ten minutes late after nearly talking herself out of the engagement. If Greg wasn't here yet, then she could back out. At least she'd tried. Just as she turned her foot back to the door, someone shouted her name, and she spun around to the short lines. Greg emerged from the room on the left, prodding and stopping short from slamming his chest into the woman's tray of food. He raised his hand towards Serafina as if afraid she was taking off. Hey, Sarah. He lifted his arms to pull her into an embrace. She always loved his hugs, but she felt stiff in his grip. She edged out of his hold with a knee to set him straight. Logan calls me Sarah. Just Logan. I know. Greg tinkered with the collar of his striped shirt worn with black chinos. Where's your girlfriend? The last thing she needed was this to look like they were on a date. Isla? He pressed his lips together. Can we have a seat, please? As he led her to the room where he'd been sitting, he asked if she wanted anything besides the iced tea he'd already bought for her. I'm fine, thanks. Even if she was starving, having a meal with Greg felt strange. She'd slid into the booth he'd picked by the wall, then she folded her hands on the table, her back stiff. Please explain why you wanted this meeting. I need to help Vanessa at the food truck. Not today, but she'd make the trip so she didn't have to be lying. Isla and I broke up. Logan and I are dating, in case he hadn't heard. He rolled his eyes and slid his glass of iced tea below the light dangling over their table. Even if the whole of San Francisco didn't know about the billionaire dating his childhood friend, it's definitely the big talk at the stone-founded hospitals. I've transitioned to working for one of them, by the way. A great job. Good steady work that gives me a feeling of satisfaction. She'd already surmised as much after seeing him at the hospital charity gala, but she fought the urge to tell him she'd witnessed his makeout session with the redhead that night. It wasn't any of her business, after all. Now that they got the relationship status situated, she set her purse on the table and pushed closer to the brown-painted wall. Why did you almost explode my phone with text and voice messages? He reached across the table for her hands, which felt awkward, so she pulled them away. She snatched the napkin next to her tea and blew her nose, which didn't need to be blown. Her gaze flickered to the tea, a beverage she never drank. It was Greg's favorite drink. This was another reminder of how Logan went above and beyond for her. He'd go to the degrading stand to buy her favorite lemonade, while Greg couldn't remember she didn't drink iced tea. I made the mistake of ending things with you. She almost choked on her saliva. You're telling me this now? Once upon a time, Greg was her dream husband, until she started dating her best friend. Now she knew the difference between love and want. I don't want you and Logan to make the same mistake Isla and I made. You two are best friends, Serafina. If your relationship doesn't work out, your friendship with Logan will never be the same. Greg knew what Logan meant to her, and he'd always been flexible, tagging along when she dragged him to Logan's events. She let Greg's words sink in while he continued pointing out all the reasons she shouldn't be dating her best friend. Logan and I th thought this through. Her voice wobbled as she fumbled with her pinky. But I'm sorry you and Isla didn't work out. Greg shook his head, then narrowed his gaze. The point is, you and I have the same goals and dreams that I ended up ruining. We both love working with children and are so in sync on how we want to raise our kids. He uttered all the plans they'd made and what they meant to each other, 
how they'd never fought, and how he hadn't appreciated that until he'd hated how Isla argued with him. She doesn't get me like you do. Logan and I argue too, but we bounce right back the next day. Arguments were healthy in a relationship. You and I never argued, and when you ended things, it caught me off guard. Anger surged through her chest as memories of that evening in the Thai restaurant resurfaced. What happened to the whole spiel about not being ready for a serious relationship? Did you even go back to school? You don't like my retro tastes. What has changed since then? Her head was spinning as she fought the sting of rejection, the doubts and insecurities that resurfaced when he broke up with her for someone better. She stood and snagged her purse. Hold on, Serafina. His face fell, but she didn't care anymore. He wasn't dying after all. No regrets there. Logan is your friend. Could it be that he's dating you because he felt sorry for you when I broke up with you? Shut up! She startled herself and perhaps those around them when a couple behind their table bobbed their heads to her. She huffed, then looked down at her handbag he clung to. I need to go. Please, think about us. She snatched her arm away from him, intending to do the opposite of his request. Yet his words taunted her all afternoon as she browsed online shopping for her school teacher supplies. Everything with her and Logan had happened fast. Of course Logan felt sorry for her when she sounded pathetic about her online dating. He'd do anything for her, including fake dating her while sacrificing his own dating life. They talked about marriage and a future together, but while she was in a hurry, he wasn't. He could back out in less than a year. When he showed up at her apartment to pick her up for their volleyball practice, she told him she didn't feel like going to volleyball. He scowled before pulling her into his arms and stroking her hair, and she buried her face in his chest, sniffling and inhaling his familiar scent. Then he led her to the sofa. Does it have anything to do with your lunch meeting? He rubbed his hand up and down her back. The thought of talking about Greg's wise words consumed her with dread. She faced her best friend the man who'd stolen her heart and made her lose any desire for any other man. Did you start dating me because you felt sorry for me? Whoa. His hand stilled on her back, and when he took it off, she felt instantly cold. What exactly did Greg tell you? I was going to ask as we drove to volleyball, but it seems this is urgent. Chewie sauntered closer and sprawled on the rug before them, as if sensing the brewing storm. A silence passed as Greg's words danced in her mind. I don't want our friendship to be compromised by. What did Greg tell you, Sarah? Logan's voice was deep, his jaw clenched and his face serious. He wants us to get back together. His brow shot up. And? Why had she blurted that, of all things? She had no intention of getting back with Greg. That door was closed. He told me to think about it. In other words, you're thinking about it? I'm just, you and me, there's a lot to think about. Now who's running from a serious relationship? He stood, shaking his head. The hurt in his voice slashed into the room. The fact that you have to think about us makes me wonder if you'll ever change your opinion of me. He was everything to her. Her heart sank that he would think otherwise. Logue, you're the best thing. As a friend, I get it. He snapped, stormed to the window, then pivoted to face her. I was your rebound guy. I always had the feeling, but I ignored my gut. Your ex probably got dumped and then came crawling back into your life. Serafina stood, crossing her arms over her chest, as she ignored the reality and sting in Logan's words. Greg was dumped and now wanted Serafina as his backup. Why do you consider dating a man who wants you to be different? I love you for who you are, the whole you, Sarah. I didn't go out with you because I felt sorry for you, but because I love the person I can be when I'm with you. Truer words couldn't have been said. She too loved who she was when she was with him. Tears blinded her vision as Logan spoke words that sounded like goodbye. Your happiness is everything to me, and I'll not stand in the way. He pressed his lips into a flat line. 
I've been hovering in your space far too long, which makes it hard for you to think. The betrayal on his face sliced through her chest, and she felt the sharp pain as his last words were all in a blur. It's not a good summer for volleyball. They'd barely made it to volleyball this season, with Mom's passing and the reunion and the vacation. Logan walked to Chewy, lowered himself, and rubbed behind the dog's ears. It whimpered, licking Logan's arm. Bye, bud. As Logan stood and started for the door, she opened her mouth to stop him from leaving, to sort things out and make sure today wasn't the end of their friendship. The lump in her throat was too tight. She instead gasped out a sob just as the door closed behind her. Don't leave! Sorrow seeped into her heart, and she fisted her hands in her hair. Swept by melancholy too intense, she collapsed on the floor, sobbing as if someone she loved just died. Chewie hovered around her, swiping his tongue on her face. Dear God, what have I done? Of all the terrible decisions she'd made in life, having lunch with her ex set a new record. Chapter 19 You and me, there's a lot to think about. The words stuck in Logan's mind on repeat, as if they were on automatic replay. Two days ago, he'd walked out of Serafina's apartment, feeling more defeated and discouraged than he'd felt in years. Investors can toggle seamlessly through this new downloadable app. Logan blinked, redirecting his gaze to the smart board in the boardroom, where he and his three top executives were having their biannual meeting with Tim, the software developer, presenting an updated app convenient for investors. Regardless of Logan's temporary problems, Eric had trusted him to run the company, and people depended on him. He had to keep it together. He may have lost Serafina as a life partner, but they were friends after all. If he could get his head straight, he could take baby steps, back to where things had been before. Right here! Tim pointed out a line on the graph. The man's hair was always unkept, as if he had no time to deal with anything other than technology. At the press of the small remote in his hand, one graph after another displayed the trends from the last five years. This upgrade has automatic and intuitive shortcuts, pre-built markets, and advanced option tools. Logan didn't pretend he understood the technical side of things. All the more reason he trusted Tim, who'd been with the company 15 of the 24 years it had been in existence. Tim's data made it evident that each year technology changed, and they needed to stay current with trends. When Logan left the boardroom, Emma was on the phone, which was for the best. He wasn't up for her chirpy voice. Like the last two days, he told her he didn't need lunch. Heather's breakfast protein shakes held him throughout the day. He'd also told Emma not to turn on the diffuser in his office, hoping it would keep him from thinking about Serafina. But he was wrong. Serafina dominated each corner of his heart and his personal space, even if she was out of sight. When he sat on his chair, even without the diffuser being on, its aromatic scent still lingered. His cell phone chimed and he snagged it from the table, certain it wasn't Serafina. She'd stopped calling him after 24 hours of him not answering or texting her back. He swiped the screen and opened the message. Iris, now that you're back from Italy, I'll be in town tonight. Prepare for a Saturday hike. As much as he preferred to be alone, his sister's visit offered a welcome distraction. He didn't need to respond to tell her she could come or not. The doorman knew her, and she knew how to let herself into the place. She usually made surprise visits because she didn't want Logan to pick her up from the airport. But why would she visit after they'd just seen each other a few weeks ago? Would she want Serafina to join them? She'd better not, because this wasn't a topic he was ready to open up to his family. He started typing his response, his mind working a light reason not to include Serafina in this weekend's plans. Then a soft knock tapped on the frosted glass of his half-open door, and Emma peeked into the office. Her grin grated his skin. On almost any given day, his assistant's smile was refreshing, but not today, not for the last two days. The only smile he wanted to see was Sarah's. Would you like lunch today? I believe I'm capable of letting you know if I'm hungry. Um, 
at the woman's flushed cheeks and fallen face, his conscience seared him. It wasn't Emma's fault that he tampered with dating his friend. He knew better. He knew things would be a mess if they broke up, and he knew he always wrecked his relationships. Groaning inwardly, he set the phone down and ushered Emma into his office. His chest rose and fell beneath his button down. He leaned back and clasped his hands on the table. I'm sorry, it's not you. Emma nodded, understanding softening her half-smile. Is it Serafina? His brow shot up. Good guess. He'd been curt with her for the last few days, and he rarely got moody. He got irritated, but he never took it out on his employees if they weren't at fault. Just cancel tomorrow's golf. All Emma had to do was send a group text to his golf buddies to clear his schedule. She left without prying further. Too bad the entire city and parts of the country, and perhaps the world knew about his and Serafina's friendship blossoming into romance. He'd intended to announce their relationship officially to his staff at the company picnic in September. But God must be punishing him for all the girls he'd broken up with. He shook his head, buckling down to work. As promised, his sister would arrive late on Friday night and be ready for a Saturday morning hike to Angel Island in the Bay. He'd have to be ready for her. As they trekked to the top of the mountain on Saturday, with a few people on the trail, Logan welcomed the activity, even though the moderate six-mile hike allowed them to hold a conversation without running out of breath. Iris talked about the reunion she was in charge of planning next year, or so he'd thought, until she mentioned her plan to switch up things. We're having the reunion in December. As long as the family got together, that was the point. I'm assuming we'll be in Hawaii then? It would be a nice getaway at the island he and his siblings bought. She stopped walking as they approached the picnic tables. The breeze blew her cropped brown hair into her face, so she pushed it back with a hand. At the peak, this December the 15th. He gripped his backpack straps as Iris uttered one detail after another why their family should meet twice this year. To top your and Serafina's event, I had to change the season. She ambled toward a table and climbed up to sit on the tabletop, waiting while he followed her and sat across from her, resting his feet on the bench. That's why I came this weekend. His brows furrowed. She had that knowing look he should have seen coming. How does your event concern me? Of course he'd help her. It was already August. Christmas would be upon them in no time. I called Serafina to ask about the list of bands you guys brainstormed. Logan cringed. He'd wondered how long it would take before Iris brought up Serafina. She said you compiled the list, and then she danced around the issue of calling you to get the details. Iris's brown eyes searched his, and she leaned in and kissed his shoulder. What happened between you two? Logan stared at the distant sandy beaches. Just how could he explain to his baby sister how bad he was with romantic relationships? How can I help with the reunion? It was a safer topic, but Iris, well, not only was she a romantic, but also she took after mom when it came to nurturing and being somewhat pushy to hunt out information. She punched him on the arm. Ouch! He rubbed at the sore spot. I didn't come all the way from Boston to hike. She grasped his hand, linked their fingers, then braced their entwined hands over her yellow leggings. I came because you needed me. You needed family. His chest expanded. Everything was going to be okay. He had his family to boost him up. Who did Serafina have? He was her family. The one she turned to when things went wrong. And he'd assured her that would never change, no matter what happened between them. He needed to get a grip and reconnect with her as a friend. The upcoming three-day press conference in Vietnam would give him time to get his bearings. Then he'd be the friend Sarah needed. Sarah needs a friend. He squeezed Iris's hand. We are the only family she has. I'm guessing you had your first fight as a couple? Iris lifted her other hand to cover their clasped ones, then patted his with it. You and I argue and irritate each other all the time. He ruffled her already messy hair with his other hand. You're my baby sister. He chuckled as memories of their reconciliation projects came to mind. 
Last thing I need is mom to loop us into a project. The last project they'd done was cook at a homeless shelter in Denver. He was 16 and Iris 11. He could barely remember why they'd gotten into a huge argument on spring break, but he remembered how mom took them to Denver and put them under the supervision of one of her friends who ran the soup kitchen. The best way to resolve a conflict is working together. Mom had said before she left and picked them up at the end of the day, only to start over the next day. We got to stay in the fancy hotel at least. Iris said after a moment, as if also remembering the last time they'd had their big fight. You and Serafina are going to be okay. They had to be, because she was a part of his life, one way or the other. You're also an amazing big brother. She bumped their shoulders together, slumping to lean against him. Iris was always so genuine and sweet. She'd always been such an encouragement to him and all their siblings. God knew their family needed Iris, someone pure, who'd never been exposed to the ruthlessness in the world. May God continue to protect her. Logan loved her so much, and he'd always do his part to protect her in the best way he could. No doubt all his siblings would do the same. He tapped her nose, stood, then put out his hand for her. Gonna make it to the summit? We'd better. She grabbed his hand and hopped down from the table. We're having lunch at Tony's Pizza Napolitana. She shared the history of the pizza place she discovered while perusing the internet for things to do this weekend. While the coal-fired oven pizza sounded mouth-watering, the long wait wasn't something Logan was looking forward to. But he'd do anything if it kept him from thinking about Serafina. Chapter 20 Did Liz even matter? Who was better suited to spend her life with than someone she knew so well? That had been the question an answer Serafina had conceived after days of falling apart without Logan in her life. Seven days, eight today since she'd been checking the calendar with each passing day of not hearing from him. He trusted her with his heart, and she'd shredded it. He'd left her in a way no one, not even her parents, ever had. When he didn't show up at church on Sunday, she knew the extent of the damage she'd brought upon herself. The last few days had been long and painful. When Greg called her two days after Logan had walked out of her life, she snapped. I wish I'd never met you. She hung up, then sobbed as reality sank in. If Greg hadn't broken up with her, she'd still have Logan in her life. And if Greg hadn't staggered back into her life, as if she was the solution to his life, she wouldn't have met him for lunch. She and Logan were supposed to meet with their friends this weekend, to give them their souvenirs. She doubted that was going to happen. She'd also called and canceled volleyball, promising to join the group in two weeks, if she and Logan resolved their conflict. As she sat on her living room rug that night, she was determined to finish the project of photos she'd begun three days ago. She'd started the scrapbook a long time ago, but had gotten sidetracked and shoved the project aside. The cupboards opened and closed as Vanessa put things away, dishes from their dinner Serafina had told her not to worry about. Logan always did her dishes and cleaned her mess when he didn't have to. The first two days after he left, she'd fought an intense headache. She stayed in her apartment crying out to God to bring Logan back. She'd ignored all other calls or texts as she waited for him to call her back, but he didn't. Except for Greg, whom she'd felt the need to lash out at. She could have gone to Logan's penthouse, but she feared he wasn't ready to see her. On the third day, Vanessa texted her threatening to call the police to break into her apartment if Serafina didn't respond to Vanessa's texts, or open the door when she knocked. Then Vanessa took it upon herself to stop by Serafina's apartment every evening after work. She showed up with sandwiches and leftovers from her food truck so Serafina didn't starve. Chewy was on his own. The dog had grown so much since late April. Not just by body mass, but also by intelligence. Although he spent plenty of time with her, he seemed to sense something was different in their house. Like now, as he waited at the door as if expecting Logan to show up. Huh. Everything in her house, including her dog, had Logan's handprints. You need to get to bed at a decent time. Vanessa walked to the living room, then letting out a low whistle, she took in the photos strewn on the sofa, the paper cutouts and stickers, 
as well as the scissors and art pens on the table, and the handwritten quotes Serafina planned to add to the photo books now on the floor. You have to look presentable tomorrow. Vanessa bent and cleared the photos from the end of the rug where she sat. Drudd churned through Serafina. Logan might not want to see her. She lifted her chin to Vanessa, and the lamp from the corner cast a glow on her friend's face as she pressed her lips together, obviously having pity on Serafina like she'd been the last few days. What if photos aren't enough? You said you prayed. Serafina nodded, but she'd probably exhausted God's patience with her constant whining. In the middle of her little messes, she'd forgotten how blessed she was. You'll have to keep trying. Logan is worth fighting for. Vanessa reached for the album and lifted it towards Serafina, pointing to the word memories Serafina had put in white stickers on the black book. She'd also stuck three of her favorite photos of her and Logan on the cover. Regina had taken the first photo the day Serafina and Logan reunited. Serafina's heart twisted. They hadn't seen each other for five years, but the moment they'd reconnected, it felt like only a day had passed since they'd separated. In the photo, they sat on a boulder at the peak, their feet dangling below them. Serafina was laughing as she hurled her hand at Logan. He had his head back, laughing and looking so relaxed. The other early photo had caught them riding their bikes away from the photographer, likely also Regina, pedaling side by side, wearing their backpacks. They held hands while steering one-handed. In the last picture, an idyllic summer shot, they were walking barefoot on the meadow grass with broad smiles while each carried a watermelon slice. That's what I mean, Vanessa said, sensing Serafina's revisit to memory lane. Vanessa thumbed through the book as she commented about the photos and read aloud some of the quotes Serafina had added. You are my first friend, a childhood treasure that can't ever be replaced. Vanessa flipped open another page. No matter how far apart we are, you'll always be close to my heart. You're always there, even when it's not convenient. With each quote Vanessa read, Serafina knew what photo she'd put with it. Vanessa stayed until Serafina finished her second book, then they prayed together and called it a night. Serafina barely slept as she reflected on her own life and her unrealistic list. It proved how shallow her thinking had been. No one was perfect. She'd read one character after another in the Bible, and they were all a mess. Even King David, whom God had considered to be a man after God's own heart. Logan had everything he needed and before Serafina started school next week, she'd attempt to use the photos and their memories to help her in her pursuit. When she woke up to start her day, her mind was spinning with what she was going to tell Logan when she surprised him at the office. According to Emma's calendar, Logan should be back from Vietnam tonight and in the office tomorrow. Good thing Emma still kept his calendar synced to Serafina's. After their plans overlapped a few times, Logan decided to have his assistant sync his calendar to her, so she'd know his schedule before she made plans involving him. Serafina didn't do a good job updating her activities calendar, besides her school events, so at times Logan had Emma reschedule his events, which made her tremble with nervous energy when she walked into the tall glass building, carrying the two books and doubting Logan would be at work. The main floor receptionists were always pleasant, and once they checked her in, Serafina's heels clicked against the white marble as she walked to the elevator. She greeted Mars, the buffy man standing guard by the elevator door. While he gave her a curt nod, she didn't have to pat the man's dark suit to know he had a gun tucked in his pocket. As soon as the elevator deposited her on the 59th floor, two security men greeted her, both kind despite their intimidating appearances. Down the hall and into the lobby, Emma lifted her head from her computer. Serafina! Her smile was uplifting as she darted from the counter and met Serafina in an enthusiastic side hug. Hey, Emma! With her hands occupied, Serafina kissed Emma's cheek and felt more confident knowing Logan hadn't told his assistant to keep her from his office. Mr. Stone is in a meeting. I know. She'd seen the 10 o'clock meeting and hoped he hadn't rescheduled. Showing up 30 minutes early gave her time to calm her nerves. Emma had been so comforting after Mom's passing 
when she'd sent a condolence card and a basket of bath soaps, essential oils, and all sorts of pampering. Emma's bright-eyed gaze flicked to the albums in Serafina's hands. Then Emma glanced to the left side of the counter at the conference room. Let me get you something to drink. She ushered Serafina forward, and they walked toward the seating area behind the counter. Usually, Serafina would wait in Logan's office if she needed to, but she didn't want to surprise him. The building offered several conference rooms, but as she walked past the glass doors to one of them, her pulse pounded in her ears, especially when she peeked and saw the men and women sitting around the table. Her legs froze as a pair of eyes held hers. Logan sat at the head of a dark wood table in the room, framed by floor to ceiling windows. He might have been in the middle of a speech, or maybe not. She couldn't tell with his mouth open but not moving. Emma said something at the seating area where Serafina would be headed if her legs hadn't gotten stuck. Serafina's lacy butterfly swing dress was light and short sleeved, but that didn't stop her body from breaking into a cold sweat. Logan said something without taking his gaze off her. The rest of the group turned to look at her. While she should look away, she didn't want to, afraid she'd lose it if she even blinked. Warmth flowed in her veins at the tenderness in his eyes rather than anger, especially when he stood and walked through the door. His brows creased and his smile didn't meet his eyes, sending her stomach plummeting. Sarah? Her mouth opened, struggling to say something, but not even managing a high. Lean and handsome always, Logan looked as though he'd lost a few pounds. She was responsible if he'd skip meals on her account. She didn't deserve his forgiveness. Let's go to my office. He took the albums from her, and she realized how shaky she was as she struggled to keep up with his stride. Emma grinned and waved at Serafina, as if she knew a secret Serafina didn't. You don't look so good. Concern carried in Logan's voice when he set the albums on the table, closed the door, and faced her frowning. Her chest constricted at his genuine concern. Then he pulled her into his arms and she inhaled his fancy scent and the subtle detergent wafting through his button-down. She'd missed a memory she desired to cling to, the same way she squeezed her arms around his waist. I'm so sorry. Log, I miss you. He sucked in a breath, eased out of the embrace, then traced his thumb on her face, wiping away the tears she couldn't control. I was going to call you this week. You didn't have to. She sniffled, needing to say what she came to say. She trudged toward the table for support. When she faced him, she asked a question from their past. Do you know why I hated hide-and-seek? Thank goodness we're too adult to play that. God, help me make sense. I was looking everywhere for you and I couldn't find you. Her voice trembled as raw memories of an evening at that dingy place rushed back. I ran toward the houses, worried your uncle had seen you hiding, and stopped you from playing with me. Their hideout and the time they'd spent together had been a secret from his uncle, while her parents nine times out of ten didn't even notice she wasn't in her room. I remember being so relieved when I heard you saying, I'm right here, Sarah. He'd called from the tunnel opening, and she'd bolted to him and squeezed him so tight they fell and rolled onto the patchy grass as they clung to each other. Logan's lips curled up. He ambled toward her, moving to the table's other end and leaning against it. She doubted he remembered. Do you remember what you told me? You looked everywhere except for the tunnel. Which was right in front of me. Just like in reality, he'd always been in front of her. I'm completely crazy in love with you, Logan Stone. I know. You're the love of my life. She cut him off, holding his gaze with the urgency to make it clear they weren't just friends. Some of Mom's last words resonated with me. I spent my whole childhood trying to be an adult. Now that I'm older, I've been wasting this phase of my life too. Looking everywhere, yet you're right in front of me. You've been there all along. And it took me so long to realize. Sarah, we don't have. Please let me finish. She wasn't good with words if she couldn't convince Logan she wanted forever with him. This last week without you? I felt like that terrified eight-year-old. 
I don't want to lose my best friend or happily ever after with the only man who makes me smile. I'd rather spend my whole life fighting with you than not fighting with someone else. I trust you with my life. I trust you with who I really am. And at the end of the day, I know you're the one person who's not going to hurt me. Not on purpose, anyway. Logan was staring at the skyline, rubbing the bristles on his jaw as if lost in thought while she poured her heart out. Our friendship means everything to me. He spoke without looking at her. I'd rather we not venture into the unknown. Her last hope was to hand him the albums, so she approached him where he'd put them. Logan, come take a look. He moved, and as he picked up the first book, he noticed the one below it, the one with the word, Memories. A smile creased his face as his fingers traced every photo. Then he lifted his gaze to meet hers. You kept all these? I have way more photos than I will ever have time to put in a book. Between their annual photos they took on her birthday, his birthday, and all sorts of moments, it would take a lifetime. He flicked through the album, studying each photo, squinting as he read the quotes as if memorizing them word for word. Her gaze followed along as his eyes softened when he reread the line and looked at the photo of them hurling snowballs at each other. Snow from the snowball, he'd walloped her and dusted her hat. Next to the photo she'd written, At this point, I can't remember which one of us is a bad influence. He snagged her hand and pulled her toward him. His eyes narrowed into familiar determination. You are a very bad influence. Leaning in, he captured her mouth with his, kissing her with determination and fierceness that scarcely let her breathe. I love you so much, Sarah. A tremor shook his voice as he spoke over her mouth. I love you too. She tugged at his shirt collar and kissed him for all she was worth. Logan, her legitimate date, had taught her everything she learned about love, from God's love that he and his family expressed through their actions to the romantic love that he'd expressed toward her. The most important lesson she learned from Logan, a lesson she intended to share with her students from this year forward, was to be yourself and never change to gain someone's approval. Confidence started within and couldn't be obtained through winning approval and losing yourself. No relationship could be true if someone was faking who they were. So from now on, she'd live life as an original, not a copy, and she'd never try to put a frame that didn't fit on someone else. Epilogue Sebastian Diakos leaned against the slide, and the mid-afternoon sun warmed his back as he took in the activity around him. Finley Elementary's playground was bustling with excitement as teachers rearranged the chattering students in front of the colorful playground. The four classes were Serafina's students from the previous years and the current year at the recess time. His gaze flicked to the Stone family, all hovering close to Logan on the other side of the playground. He was adjusting the collar of his blue shirt as he paced on the pebbled grounds. Seeing Logan the confident CEO worked up with something new. If Logan was anxious to ask his best friend to marry him, then Sebastian would never have the nerve to share his feelings for Logan's sister, the gorgeous brunette now tugging at Logan's hand. He didn't have to hear what Iris Stone was saying to her brother to know she was assuring him that everything was going to be okay. Her internally sunny outlook on life was one of the many things that drew Sebastian. Where Iris was concerned, though, he'd best remain an observer. He knew her brown eyes turned golden when she smiled under the sun or light, just as he knew the way her full lips moved when she spoke or ate. Those were just some of the many things he'd observed working as the Stone family chef over the last 10 years. He'd harbored feelings for Iris from the first time he'd seen her. Despite her siblings teasing her about a boyfriend or two, she'd never brought one home, at least not to Pleasant View. Every summer and Christmas when she was coming home, Sebastian rehearsed the words over and over, determined to tell her how he felt. But when he had a moment or two with her alone in the kitchen, his tongue got tied up and he'd asked if she needed tea or her favorite water instead. You're so sweet she'd say, smiling and remaining oblivious to his feelings. There were 10,000 reasons why he should keep his feelings to himself. Iris was the youngest and the miracle child, the only stone by blood, with a sea of protective brothers and sisters 
ready to tear apart any man who came near their little sister. Besides, they came from different backgrounds. This is what you're going to do! One of the teachers called after Dion, a dark-haired boy from the back of the line, and asked him to stand at the front row and lift the decorative letter M to his chest. Maya! The woman with brown skin continued as she moved a short girl carrying the letter A and positioned her in the center next to Ezen. I'll have you stand. The teacher arranged the shortest kids in a pattern while the photographer snapped photos. Yellow petals were scattered in a path leading to the gold, cream, and teal balloon arch at the brick building's back door. That must be the door Serafina would be emerging from any minute. Another photographer stood by the balloons, snapping photos of the scenery, while above a helicopter hovered in the clear blue sky as it dangled a sign as golden as the sun, its shiny letters asking, Sarah, will you marry me? She's coming! Someone shouted, lifting out her phone to show a text no one but her could read. Strings of Somewhere Only We Know played through the speakers propped up on the building and facing the playground. The red metal door opened and Serafina stepped out. She looked to the right, then the left. A frown squeezed her face when she hesitated, before walking through the balloon arch and onto the flower-strewn golden grass. The students erupted in cheers over the music, and Serafina's floral dress swayed in rhythm with the hair that danced on her shoulders when she hastened her steps. Her gaze swept around the group and stopped, pinning on the one person who mattered to her more than anyone else on the playground. Her smile shone brighter than the sky. Her hand flew to her mouth and the other to her heart as she stilled. She wiped a hand at her face, her shiny eyes giving evidence of her tears. Logan jogged toward her, ducking beneath another balloon arch, the designated stage where he was supposed to walk the moment Serafina emerged. The kids forgot all the instructions they'd rehearsed as half of them broke out of the line and darted toward her. Serafina, look up! Iris and a few adults pointed to the helicopter, as if they feared Serafina hadn't figured out what was happening. The teachers managed to call the kids to the side, making them lift the now mismatched letters, and in the chaos, Logan dropped to one knee and presented the sparkling diamond to Serafina. She was nodding fiercely, tears springing down her cheeks, tears of joy by all means. Despite the popping balloons that kids bumped into, the wearing of the helicopter that tossed more balloons in the air, the music that reached its crescendo, and the deafening cheers, the couple was already kissing, forgetting their G-rated audience. Sebastian's chest constricted. He must have been grinning too long now, because his cheeks hurt. Without thinking, he let his eyes seek out his dream girl, a fantasy. Iris was standing next to the seesaw. Her eyes sparkled like the diamond studs in her ears as she clapped for her brother. Laughing, she tucked her phone beneath her elbow and jumped up and down jostling the black dress that fit her in all the right places. Of all the times he'd snuck secret glances at her, Sebastian had never been caught, so he swallowed hard when she stopped halfway from clapping and whipped her head his way, her gaze pinning him. He was so busted. His heart rate sped up and his pulse thrummed in his ears as he jerked his gaze away. As people mingled and approached the couple, he made his way back to the parking lot. He'd congratulate the couple at dinner when they met after Serafina got off work. His mind was spinning as he strode through the patchy golden grass. Now that he'd been caught staring, how was he going to sneak glances at her through the rearview mirror as he drove her and her two sisters back to Logan's penthouse, or wherever they were headed until dinner? He'd driven the girls while some of the guys rode in the Escalade with their parents. Sebastian! A voice sounded through the noise, and when he turned, Perspiration dusted his skin at the sight of Iris, hastening and almost tripping over her stilettos to catch up to him. On instinct, he strode to her and snatched the tote bag from her hand. Thank you, she said, her angelic face radiant in the California sunshine. He swallowed, his brain shouting to leave, but his feet refusing to cooperate. Do you think you can help me get the bag to the car? He could listen to that melodic voice all day and night. Sorry to bother you. She reached out as if to take the bag from him, but he moved it behind him. I just don't want to forget it here. He nodded, his tongue frozen. Tell her. No. Go ahead while it's just the two of you. 
His palms were sweating, especially when her brows drew together and her mouth parted, then closed. See you later. Don't go. Iris, he croaked out and stuffed his other hand in his jean pockets when she spun around. I will, uh, um, speak, you idiot. He'd wanted to tell her the moment her name was drawn and she dreaded the planning. But like all the other days, he talked himself out of talking to her. What's that, Sebastian? Even the way his name rolled off her tongue was romantic. I'll help you plan the reunion. The words flew out of his forced breaths. If he hadn't said the entire sentence at once, he'd have fainted trying to speak. Really? The heart-melting smile spreading across her face was worth his struggle to utter the sentence. He nodded again, too dumbstruck to speak anymore. She clapped, bouncing a bit. I can't wait! Before he made a fool of himself, he spun around and strode away, too afraid to turn back again or even say goodbye. Knowing Iris, she'd throw her arms around him in excitement, and he'd drown in her floral fragrance for days and months until he saw her again. She'd hugged him before, more than once, and each time, instead of embracing the moment, he'd been caught in the strangest place, running away from her and hiding in the kitchen, making her favorite food. While he was in over his head and the girl of his dreams, far from his reach, he'd finally taken one step in the right direction. Copyright by Rose Fresquez Production Copyright by Rose Fresquez Next in the Billionaire's Reunion A Sudden Romance She hates being defined by the wealth she was born into. He sees her for who she is. Can a guy from the wrong side of the tracks overcome his insecurities to offer an heiress his heart? Architect Iris Stone designs fabulous buildings but can't manage her love life. Even seemingly perfect dates end up collapsing. Her family insists she's trying to build castles in the sky without laying any foundation. But that doesn't stop them from choosing her to plan the next huge family event. Something she's not sure she can pull off solo. Painfully shy chef Sebastian Diakos is content working behind the scenes for the billionaire Stone family. Even if most of what he does has nothing to do with his culinary skills, they've been more than generous. But if he accepts their offer to buy him his own restaurant, he'd never see Iris again. Not that she has any idea of his feelings. When Sebastian overcomes his shyness to help her with the reunion, he shows her that love is found in unexpected places. Until another billionaire starts pursuing her. Now Iris is falling for the quiet chef, but not sure what to think. All the years in their house, he's never shown admiration for her. Could he be the real deal? Or is she building castles in the sky again? A Sudden Romance is book two in the standalone series. Fall in love with the Billionaire's Reunion Christian Romance series while catching up with the Big Stone family as they reunite in their scenic small town. There are several seasons of love and adventure in this spin-off series, following Eric Stone's siblings from the CEO's companion in the Caregiver series. With each family member taking a turn to coordinate a family gathering, there's plenty of laughter, tears, and happily ever afters. You don't need to have read the Caregiver series first to enjoy this series. This has been a legitimate date. A Friends to Lovers Contemporary Sweet Romance, The Billionaire's Reunion, Volume 1. Written by Rose Fresquez. Narrated by Rachel Berkwin. Copyright 2023 by Rose Fresquez. Production Copyright 2023 by Rose Fresquez.